Curse of the Flower Moon Prosper Woods Wolves, Book Two Written by Patricia Logan Narrated by John Solo Prologue Prosper Woods Chronicle, All the Advice Fit to Print Dear Crabby, the weather has been getting worse and my mother wants to move away from the forest since she's been assured by local hippies that our globe is warming and we're all doomed. They've got her convinced our home will soon be consumed by a massive ball of fire. I love our woods and the knowledge that we live in a gorgeous forest. Unfortunately, I can't afford rent on my own, but the very idea of going up in flames terrifies me. What should I do? Signed, Global Warming Blows Chunks and my hair's on fire. Dear Global Warming Blows Chunks and my hair's on fire, I'm sorry, but Krabby agrees with your mom, and I'm not even a hippie. Instead of nagging everyone about it, why don't you find some roommates to live with and let her move on? Maybe you can move in with those hippies you talk about. I'm sure they rarely bathe, causing an impossible stink, so by the time your woods do turn into a bonfire— You'll be ready to embrace the sweet lick of flames on your bum. Respectfully, Crabby. Edinburgh, Scotland. 11.56 p.m. Castor's Spy. I reached out and grabbed my companion's forearm, halting him in mid-step and motioning for him to press his back against a stone buttress. We held our breath, waiting for the guard to pass by above us, not daring to convey the danger telepathically, and hoping he wouldn't hear our heartbeats. The less chance we had of being overheard, the better. Getting past guards as we snuck into Alistair McCurdy's castle complex was tricky. They had the ability to pick up scents like an animal would, and it always came with its share of extreme danger. But I felt safe when I heard the guard's footsteps fade. We'd been right to take the pathway under the guard walk, where we were less likely to be scented or heard. Built at a time when soldiers patrolled the perimeter stone walls at height to protect the family and seat of power who lived within its four corners, this part of the compound was ancient. He blinked at me in the dark, and I nodded, determined to complete our mission. He turned his back and we moved, crouching as we ran to stay low and keeping to the shadows where there'd be less chance of getting spotted by powerful werewolf eyes which could see in the dark. We took the circuitous route to the servants' quarters and slipped inside to begin our search. We knew only that she'd been discovered and labeled a spy, but that there wasn't proof to be found on her person. Someone on McCurdy's staff had claimed to have read her thoughts, and they'd raised the alarm. Since she had vehemently denied the charges and had been summoned to appear before McCurdy's counselors in the morning, it was imperative she be rescued tonight. According to our intelligence, she was being held in the servants' quarters jail, and there would be only one guard on duty. At first, we'd been given a vague description of who we were looking for, but the moment Nima Shirazi, King Howard Zadeh's head of security in Tabriz, described the permanent red blemish located on the woman's left cheek, I knew who she was. The first time I'd seen her, I'd thought the wolf beautiful, a girl with the blush of youth still on her cheeks when she'd left with McCurdy's other servants. I remembered thinking how incredibly brave she was to join Lady Penelope's service and move so far away from us, wondering why on earth she'd chosen to leave Prosper Woods and travel to a strange land for adventure. Everyone knew how things had turned out when the prince had refused McCurdy's daughter and chosen to take a man to his bed instead. Why then had the girl chosen to leave us? It made no sense. When she had lost contact with us, and Nima had explained that she was one of our spies who had gone missing and possibly been found out, things had finally fallen into place for me. Now all I wanted to do was to get her home to America, where she'd be safe and I could protect her. Lord McCurdy had added a few servants during his trip overseas, and I supposed we'd need everyone we could get now that war was coming. I'd expected him to recruit soldiers, not maids in service to Lady Penelope. But I'd been wrong. The girl had gone as an addition to the lady's retinue, depriving me of the time I needed to get friendly with her. Unfortunately for both of us, romance and a shag, as they say here, hadn't been in the cards. In her case, spying and the potential for torture if she got caught apparently were. It was late, 
and though I wished for moonlight to aid in our search, the sky was moonless. Total darkness surrounded us as we crept silently down the corridor of rooms until we stopped at the outer door to the jail we'd been told of. Omen reached for the knob and turned it, and I thanked the heavens it made no sound as he twisted it silently. Not all mechanisms in this ancient pile were as cooperative. It was a damned miracle all the metal wasn't rusted in this fucking wet country. I couldn't wait to get the hell away from Scotland and back to my lovely Californian woods. I reached for Ahmed's sleeve, and he turned to me. With hand gestures, I indicated that I'd stay to keep a lookout while he went inside to knock out the guard and retrieve the girl. After a sharp nod, he slipped within, and I turned to watch the corridor, praying for silence while he made the grab. Seconds ticked by, and moments later, the door cracked wide. Omid stepped through, carrying the limp form of the young girl. I held up a hand, stopping him, and then reached out to touch a vein in her neck. I felt the steady beat of her heart and knew we'd nearly accomplished what we'd come for. Nima Shirazi had sent us off with a warning. He needed her talking, so she could tell of everything she'd learned of McCurdy's plans. That is, if she was still alive. I lifted my fingers from her pulse and nodded at Omid breathing out a quick sigh of relief as I turned to lead the way back down the corridor on silent feet. Omid followed, carrying our precious cargo. We kept to the shadows, hugging the wall on our way out, retracing our steps. We were only a hundred feet from the wall we'd scaled only fifteen minutes before, when all hell broke loose. A shout raised the alarm, and at the same time the hair on my back... The urge to shift was made impossible due to the addition of our prisoner, and I cursed as a bullet pinged on the stone walkway right behind me. They were shooting, which in the scheme of things was probably not the worst thing that could happen. Still, I was surprised by it. In werewolf form, we were deadly, and so were those chasing us. For some reason, the guards had chosen to use bullets rather than shift and run us down. I didn't spend more than a second to think about it before dropping back behind Omid and the girl to protect them with my own body. If I fell, I was replaceable. If she died carrying information Prince Castor and the king needed, our mission would most certainly fail. I wasn't ready to let that happen. More shouts and bullets came our way, and we charged for the wall where we'd left a climbing rope. I knew there was little chance to make it out alive if we were forced to climb. Omid, I shouted. Go for the gate! Get her out and away. I'll create a diversion. My companion looked over his shoulder, clutching the girl to him, blocking her with his body as the bullets continued coming at us. I watched him nod sharply as he veered off to our left the minute the gate was in sight. I knew it would no doubt be locked, but he should be able to break it. Werewolf strength was good for some things. Even locks made to keep humans out, not werewolves in. Most days. I watched Omid's back for only a second or two before charging toward a guard hut I'd clocked on the way in. It stood empty, and its occupants were no doubt looking for us at this very moment. I knew I had only a second, so when I crashed into the door, I did it at full speed as more bullets followed me. I still couldn't believe one of them hadn't made contact, but I didn't waste time counting my good fortune, and instead grabbed the first weapon I could find, a can marked turpentine. I unscrewed the top, tossing it away before reaching for the second weapon I could find, an abandoned handgun. I leaned out of the guard shack and tossed the can toward an impressive cadre of soldiers headed in my direction. As luck would have it, bales of hay with targets had been set up in the inner bailey and the turpentine sprayed across them in an almost perfect arc. If I'd planned for it, it couldn't have been better. I lifted the luger and fired into one of the hay bales, watching it burst into flames, almost instantly spreading to the others in one long row, effectively blocking them from following Omid's exit from the gate. I didn't wait to see if my tactics paid off, dropping the gun and charging out of the guard shack toward the wall we'd come over. I tore at my most restrictive clothing and jacket, dumping it on the ground and changing form mid-leap as the rest of my thin black clothing shredded when my wolf appeared. I charged over to the raised parapet and jumped, ignoring the climbing rope where we'd entered the compound. A second later, all four feet were flying over the top of the wall and hitting the ground on the other side. More shots rang out from guards on the top of the wall, but in their human forms, without a moon, I was instantly swallowed in darkness. Picking up Omid's scent, as well as the girls somewhere ahead, I tore up the ground to close the distance on them. 
I changed to my human form as I reached the edge of the water to join my companion, who now carried the girl in a fireman's carry. It was a miracle we'd gotten away thus far, and though we still had a dangerous journey out of the country and then back home, I was confident we'd make it with little incident, if we were smart about it. Once our cargo was tucked safely away in the motor boat that brought us down the river to the castle, we were able to slip away seamlessly. I glanced up at the sky as I breathed out a sigh of relief, glad we'd done our part in the war against Alastair McCurdy, but I swallowed hard trying to reconcile the evening's deeds, going up against werewolves who I'd always considered my brethren, with my overarching loyalty to the Prince Castor and the Crown. Chapter One Prosper Woods Chronicle All the Advice Fit to Print Dear Crabby, my granny likes to knit designs into her sweaters, and lately I've noticed her projects are becoming thematically dark. I don't know what it is. She's given up knitting puppies and kittens and switched to depictions of bloody knives and horses' heads. How normal is it to have to buy truckloads of red yarn in order to get ready for Christmas? Signed, A Loving Granddaughter Dear A Loving Granddaughter if you don't want the theme of this here's ugly sweater party to be the red wedding, you need to move fast. First, hide her bifocals. And if that doesn't work, strategically place her cat's hot, wet hairballs in the middle of the carpet on the way to her restroom. This will cause her to step on them, squeal, jump back, fall, and break her hip. And if you're lucky, the family just might escape those knitting needles alive after all. Respectfully, Crabby. Emery. I held on to Castor's hand as we drove to Vincent Lasco's house. I knew that the invite to lunch with him and his mate Rome was a pretext for a discussion of the changes coming to our small little town of Prosper Woods, but that didn't matter. I liked the Unicorn King and his mate, King of the Vampires, and I was determined to keep the meal conversation light. Things back home at the inn had been tense ever since my mate had rejected Alastair McCurdy's daughter, but honestly... As sorry as I felt for the girl, I couldn't deny how incredibly lucky I felt to be Castor's one and only, his faded mate. Where do they live? Castor turned my way and smiled. My heart squeezed in my chest every time he did that. When I'd first met the prince in the foyer of the inn, I'd been in awe of him. In most ways, I still was. My mate was big and powerfully built, a trait common to the werewolf aristocracy. In the past, I'd found all direwolf aristocrats to be haughty and full of themselves, with their foppish clothing and their snooty and entitled ways. My best friend Claudio and I had never found it difficult to mock them. Castor was entirely different from any aristocrat I'd ever met. At that first meeting, I realized he wasn't a happy person. The twin sense of despair and hopelessness practically cloaked him. Now I knew why. He'd been forced into an engagement with a female so that he would have sons to take over the throne. Thank God we discovered each other that day, and thank God we were still alive to talk about it. Lasco has a cabin not far from his antique store in town. I understand his mate was given a cabin as part of his employment with the sheriff's office when he first came to town. But at some point, Rome gave the use of the cabin to Alpha Greg Brown and Sam. Castor replied, I've never been inside, but I know where it is. You can smell the vampire from a mile away, love. I frowned just a little. Why did he do that? I don't have all the details, but when I first moved to town, Floyd Reardon, the former pack alpha, was the biggest troublemaker around. At some point he burned down Greg and Sam's cabin, so Rome moved them into his, and he simply took up residence with the vampire. He squeezed my hand, and I frowned just a little as he turned his eyes back to the road. Sweetheart, I said, you know you should call him Vincent, not the vampire. I made air quotes with my fingers. It makes you sound like you don't like him, and even though you pretend not to, you like both of them. Why all the pretense? Castor snorted, smirking, but not looking at me as he drove the black Range Rover down the road. <laughs> this is why I love you. You see me. 
It was my turn to snort out a laugh. Yes, I see you. Right now I see that you're trying to pretend you're not friends with the king of vampires and his mate. You didn't answer the question. Why do you pretend not to like him? Castor let out a deep sigh, sobering as he stared out the windshield. Back in the old country, we fought vampires. They were our mortal enemies. When I met this one, I was cautious as I should have been. When he turned out to be no threat and offered his hand in friendship, I took it. That doesn't mean it feels normal to be friends with a man who lives on blood and roams the night. He turned to look at me and sighed. But I admit, he's a good guy. Castor shrugged. What else is there to say? I'm friends with a fucking vampire. I laughed and leaned over to kiss his cheek. He kept his eyes on the road but bent so I could reach him over the center console where our Starbucks coffees were. Ever since the chain store coffee shop moved into town a month back, Castor had been making regular trips over to Main Street to pick up one for each of us at least once a day. Who knew werewolves love coffee so much? Back home, my mother had raised me on proper Persian chai, a fancy word for fragrant tea. It was delicious, and ever since Mrs. Douglas, the inn's head cook, learned of my desire for it, she made sure a pot was sent up every morning to start my day with Castor's coffee. I loved how she'd welcomed me to the inn. Castor, I know you're going to want to talk town business when you get there. Will you promise to keep it until after lunch? I just want one meal with our friends that doesn't turn into a conversation about how to assimilate an influx of wolves from Tabriz, and the vampires Vincent is welcome to town. Can you wait until the pudding course? Castor darted a glance toward me before looking back at the road. He nodded. Yes, my love, I can wait until after lunch to bring up town issues. A Shekatam sees him. I loved it when my mate told me he loved me in our native tongue. I sighed and relaxed back in the comfortable black leather seat. Thank you, Castor. I studied his handsome profile for a minute. My mate had very dark hair with lighter highlights. He was more than half a foot taller than my five-foot-eight-inch frame and built like a brick house. From head to foot, I adored him. The rest of the drive was made in silence, but it was a comfortable quiet which served to relax me. Of course, the fact that he never let go of my hand was a big reason why. Werewolves are tactile creatures. Besides our ability to smell nearly everything on a person, I quickly learned that faded mates had even more sensitive scent glands. Ever since our mating, I could pick up emotions on a person or another wolf. If they blocked me from reading their mind, I could still learn a lot about them because of my enhanced abilities. I kind of loved my new superpower. Castor slowed down and turned off the highway onto a narrow dirt road. We plunged deep into the forest, and as the darkness of the trees surrounded the car, the sense of several unfamiliar vampires hit my nostrils. I immediately looked at Castor and noted his deep frown, which hadn't been present a minute ago. Smell that? I asked. He turned to look at me. No matter what you do, don't let go of my hand. Do you understand, Emery? I need to know you're safe and close at all times. I nodded vigorously. Yes. Okay, my mate. When we pulled up to the cabin and parked on the drive, I noted several vehicles. One was a large van with a satellite dish on top. The logo on the side was for something called VNN, and I wondered what that was. On the porch, Romeo and Vincent stood speaking to another man while others rolled up long orange extension cords. Several people were packing up what looked like large cameras on tripods, and others took down a large screen which had been set up on the front lawn. Whatever had been going on here seemed to be finished, at least for the day. As we parked and got out, the smell of vampire became overwhelming to the point of distraction, especially when everyone, to a man, turned to look at us. Castor grabbed my hand as Vincent appeared in front of us. One second on the porch, the next standing beside us on the driveway. I blinked, noting how the motion was little more than a blur. Sorry, didn't mean to startle you, he apologized as Castor and I both let out warning growls. I thought they'd be gone before you arrived. Castor looked down his nose at Vincent, who was a few inches taller than I, but not as tall as my mate. 
you could have warned me. I wasn't expecting to roll up on a house full of vampires. He glanced around the yard before returning his gaze to Vincent's. Who are they? He looked up, and I followed his line of sight to the thick, dark clouds. When Castor looked back down, he was wearing a smirk. How is it that vampires can walk around during the day? Vincent smiled. The clouds. They can't stay out very long, but as long as we have dark cloud cover, they can move around. He gestured to the yard. I'm sorry, the timing's a little off. They're a camera crew from the old country. They're here to film me and introduce me to the rest of the vampire world via the Vampire News Network. Thiago felt that aside from the proclamations and laws I've been passing, the vampire public needs to put a face to the name of their king. As you will soon find out, restructuring a seat of power that has been in place for centuries is a serious and often fatiguing operation. Thank goodness Scott Templeton knows what he's doing at the antique store. I've been able to spend almost no time there since I dissolved the Conclave of Eight. Castor nodded. Yes, I can only imagine how difficult that is. So these folks are here from the Vampire News Network. VNN, yes, Vincent said. They were just leaving. And they know the town is full of werewolves? I asked. I had no idea who this Thiago person was, but he clearly was someone intimate with the vampire world, possibly a vampire whom Vincent trusted. Vincent turned my way and smiled, sketching a quick bow. Yes, they do, Emery. It's nice to see you here. They turned to look at the man standing on the porch with Rome. The vampire was looking in our direction. Vincent turned back to us. Let me go and wish them a good afternoon. I'm looking forward to sitting down to lunch, but that won't be happening unless Romeo gets the barbecue started soon. By all means, we'll wait right here. Vincent turned and was gone in the blink of an eye. A split second later, he stood on the porch holding out a hand to the stranger who seemed to be very young. He was a vampire, so I had no idea how old he was, though he looked to be no older than mid-twenties. He was dressed in an exceedingly flamboyant purple velvet suit with bell-bottoms and white frills that stuck out from between wide lapels and poked out below his cuffs. He wore high-heeled shoes with a rounded toe and glasses with thick black frames Oh, my God. If it hadn't been for the man's exceedingly long curly hair, I realized I was looking at Austin Powers, or a near-perfect look-alike. I frowned and turned to look up at Castor as he looked down at me. Is it possible? He began. <laughs> That's Austin Powers, I snorted. I watched as Vincent and the vampire laughed, and then all three men headed down the porch steps and began walking across the lawn at human speed. When Rome, Vincent, and the man stopped in front of us, I ignored the stranger and turned to the sheriff, holding out my hand. King Rome? I said, bowing a little. Please call me Rome, the sheriff said. How are you, Emery? I shook the unicorn king's hand. From the moment I'd first seen him in his shifted form playing Twister in the forest, I'd liked the man. I mean, how many kings out there actually thought it would be worth their time to play games with their mate, their son, and their son's guardians? King Rome and King Vincent really were special people, and I was glad we were on good terms with them. Not only were we going to war soon, but having the vampires and shifters in our camp was as important as having Alpha Brown's Frederick pack of werewolves at our side. We really were quite lucky. I'm good. Now that the McCurdy clan has gone home, things are better. That doesn't mean I'm complacent. I glanced at Castor when he squeezed my hand. He was the first to break our gaze as he looked at the stranger and held out his hand. How do you do? I'm Castor Howard. The Austin Powers lookalike took his hand, smiling and showing off a mouth full of massive teeth. I wondered how he squeezed a set of fangs in there among all the square choppers. Prince Castor! Oh yeah, baby, the vampire said with open admiration. If I hadn't just watched Austin Powers with Claudio, I would have been taken aback by the familiar way in which the vampire spoke to a prince of the first house. George DeLeo, publicist extraordinaire. Castor shook his hand, staring at him open-mouthed until the man let go of his hand and turned to me. So you're the little brown commoner who stole the prince's heart. 
What a story. You must let me tell it. I took the hand he thrust out in my direction, at a loss as to what I could possibly say to this strange vampire. I, uh, thank you, I muttered as he shook my hand and went on. I understand your mate gave that old Alistair McCurdy the boot. How I wish I could have been a fly on the wall when the Scot threatened royal werewolves with war. I understand you handled the threat as smoothly as jizz sliding off a dolphin's back. I, uh, what? Castor said, looking and sounding just as confused as I must have. What Mr. DeLeo is trying to say is that he has no shame saying whatever he wants to, Vincent said, frowning at the other vampire. DeLeo simply grinned, flashing those strangely large square teeth. Yes, well, I wouldn't be a proper journalist if I didn't speak my mind. I mean, my darling, who'd give me an interview? He turned my way when he spoke, but I thought it was very strange that he thought it was okay to call me darling. I don't— Mr. DeLeo was just leaving, weren't you, George? Vincent said, interrupting me. DeLeo instantly sobered as he bowed in Vincent's direction. Of course, my king. He turned to us and bowed deeply toward Castor. It was a great pleasure meeting you, Prince Castor. When he also turned and bowed to me, I nodded my head. I still found it so weird when someone acknowledged me in that way. I'd spent my entire working life as a servant, and nothing had prepared me for the way people would treat me once I became Castor's mate. The king's junior valets, Mosin and Amir, now looked sideways at me and did the whole bowing thing when I walked into the room. I found it thoroughly disconcerting to be treated so deferentially. It was such a pleasure to meet you, Emery. I do hope we will meet again soon. Until then, I'm off. George DeLeo made a grand sweeping gesture with one arm and then disappeared in the blink of an eye, reappearing at the side of the V&N van where he opened the door and climbed into the front passenger seat. The van started up, and I watched it back down the driveway, followed by the other vehicles with dark tinted windows carrying the vampire workers. When they were gone... Castor turned to our hosts for the afternoon. He's really an interesting vampire, Castor said. The man is a caricature, Vincent said with a half-smile playing around his full lips. Rome snorted. You can say that again. Please come inside. Vincent can get you a drink while I start the barbecue. He held out his hand toward the house, and we all headed across the lawn toward the cabin. Vincent's cabin was a clean, warm space decorated with several antique furnishings. Though I'd never been inside, Castor had told me Vincent owned an antique store in town. He clearly moved several pieces into his cabin. He made for a beautiful and upscale place. I noted the thick Persian rugs on the floor, but what I found most intriguing was the massive metal shield and huge broadsword hanging over the fireplace mantle on the far wall of the room. The six-foot long sword was longer than I was tall, and I couldn't imagine anyone being able to lift it, much less swing it in battle. I had no idea where Vincent had gotten it, but I knew there had to be a story behind it. Vincent is a knight of the realm, born more than seven hundred years ago, Castor told me telepathically. I glanced up sharply to find him staring down at me, watching my reaction as he read my mind. I can't believe I never knew that. Castor smiled at me, He's been around. What can I get everyone to drink? I turned to find Vincent watching us over the raised counter where bar stools separated the kitchen from the great room. The smile he wore on his handsome face was welcoming. I liked him from the first moment I met him. Do you have tea? I asked. I have whatever you'd like, he replied. I thought you might prefer something from the homeland, so I put some chai on. I glanced past him at the samovar he had set up on the six-burner stove before looking back at him with surprise. You know how to make Persian chai? I'll have that if you don't mind. Vincent nodded. Of course. He glanced over at my mate. Castor, I'll have the same. Thank you. Very well. I watched him pull several delicate blue glasses out of the cupboard. Persian tea was a very aromatic version of a tea resembling strong Earl Grey. Some people added a few drops of rose water. My mother preferred to prepare it in this manner, so I'd learned how to make it when I was just tall enough to see over the stove. 
Violet, my maid sister, had a large and beautifully crafted samovar set up in the parlor back home. It was plated with twenty-four karat gold over hand-carved pewter and was probably worth a fortune. I'd never seen one so beautiful, and if I had to guess, it was an antique. That type of samovar was found in wealthy homes throughout the Middle East and Russia. Vincent's utilitarian samovar on the stove consisted of stainless steel pots set one on top of the other, but they were highly polished and gleamed from the stove. I watched in fascination as Vincent prepared the hand-painted blue glass tea glasses and was charmed when he put them on a tray along with a dish of sugar lumps and thoughtfully tiny gold spoons. Silver burned we werewolves. When he added Zulbia, a small oval sweet cake soaked in honey syrup, to a dish of the same blue glass to the tray, my mouth started watering. Clearly either Vincent had been in a Persian home before, or he'd done some research to find out what we liked when tea time came around. Let's have a seat at the table where we can enjoy our tea and talk about what's going on, Rome said. Vincent put out some Persian snacks if you're hungry. He pointed to the dining room table, and I noticed the lazy Susan, which had two kinds of yogurt salads. One had cucumbers and mint and was called mastokiar, and another... Master Masir had shallots. Accompanying it was a selection of lavash, a flatbread, and pita bread. Shelled walnuts, feta cheese, fresh greens called sabsi, basically a selection of cilantro, basil, and other vegetables, rounded out the tray. I smiled as I took the chair caster pulled out for me, sliding into a chair upholstered with a smooth, dark chintz. I knew my fabrics from the days when my mother used to take in sewing for the rich aristocrats back home, she taught me so many things I'd tucked away in my adolescent memory, surprised that they'd turned out to be useful now that I lived in a beautiful home with my mate. I slept in a massive bed sitting on a raised platform, sliding around on silk sheets and draped with rich velvet curtains. Being Castor's mate definitely had its perks, aside from the fact that I loved him deeply and knew he was devoted to me. Castor immediately reached for my hand once he'd settled himself into the chair beside mine. I found it fascinating that he rarely, if ever, let me sit alone in a room. It was as if he always needed me by his side within touching distance. He stood close to me in a room, sat on the couch with our legs touching, or simply slung an arm around me whenever I was near. I adored how much he wanted me, and found every bit of it charming. I never denied my beloved anything. How could I? He was my fated mate, the one man Mother Nature had fashioned only for me. I still marveled at the miracle that we'd found each other when most wolves never found their mate. I was the luckiest man in the world. Well, why don't you tell us what's going on in this part of Prosper Woods? Castor said. Then we'll fill you in on what we know about the troubles we're facing from Alistair McCurdy and his clan. I immediately sobered wanting to know what Castor was planning when it came to the threat we faced from his former fiancé's father and the clan McCurdy in Scotland. I knew Castor's decision not to go through with his betrothal to Penelope McCurdy wasn't one he had relished making, not when the result promised to be war between our clan and the Scots. In the end, though, Castor told me that it had been the only decision he could make once he had met me. Vincent handed me a tea glass, and I smiled at him. He nodded at me, returning my smile as he held out a second glass to Castor. Once I got into the daily running of the vampire world, I realized that it's a complicated business. I think everyone thought things were running smoothly when the conclave of eight ran things. That hasn't turned out to be the case. Really? What's been going on? Castor asked. Well, a lot, really, Vincent said. The Conclave had the vampire world divided into eight geographical areas around the world. Each one of them was responsible to govern their given area, or territory, as they called it. What we found was that they basically taxed vampires to high heaven and didn't provide much return on their investment. Unwinding the graft of the officials in charge, the corruption and downright theft has been a bloody business, our friend said with a frown. I watched Rome reach over and take Benson's hand before looking back at us. What my mate means is that he's had to carry out some sweeps to weed out the corrupt individuals in charge and assert his power as king, Rome said. Rooting out the bad guys and dealing with them has been the greatest challenge. 
but he's done it well. It's taken some travel and time away from me, but now he's home, having cleaned out the last nest of corruption in Asia just last week. The way Rome gazed at his mate with pride made me swallow thickly. Sometimes Castor looked at me that way, and it never ceased to amaze me. I'm proud of him. Rome raised their clasped hands and kissed Vincent's knuckles. There was an awkward few seconds before Vincent cleared his throat and looked back at us. Yes, well, it was a mess, and I'm happy it's over and done with. I've appointed six new governors, leaving only two of the original in place to round out the eight geographical territories. I think those two might be salvageable, but they're under intense scrutiny by those I trust. They know what the consequences will be if they don't fall into line and enact the new laws, Vincent said. Let's just say it involves decapitation and rivers of blood. The vampire grinned, and I expected to see fangs. Thankfully, there weren't any present, most probably in deference to us. You've had to draw up new laws, Castor said, clearly disturbed by Vincent's troubles. I had a feeling he was going to have a sit-down with his own father about werewolf laws once we got back home. The very idea of what Vincent had to do to restructure the vampire world seemed daunting. I couldn't imagine what Castor would have to go through, and since politics in the werewolf world were totally foreign to me, I could only hope my mate didn't run into the same types of troubles once McCurdy and his clan were defeated. I really hoped the old king, Castor's father, had things well in hand— but I worried about him. He wasn't a well man, and if he'd let things slip as his illness weakened him, things might be worse than Castor imagined. There was always a possibility that Teo had been influencing him in a negative way. I had the impression King Howard Sade's former head of security had been instrumental in pushing him into hiring matchmaker Arliss to arrange his betrothal to Penelope McCurdy— I hadn't trusted Teo from the moment we'd met in the castle back home in Tabriz, and it had nothing to do with the way he'd been pressuring me into a sexual relationship with him. It just might have been my natural werewolf instincts telling me that the man was dangerous to the crown. I really hoped I was wrong, but Castor might have a bigger mess to clean up than he imagined. I reached out and took a hard sugar lump, tucking it into my cheek in the Persian fashion before sipping my tea— reveling in its delicious fragrance as it slid down the back of my throat, taking the sweetness of the melting sugar with it. Thank God I met a scholarly fellow who was willing and able to help, Vincent said, dragging me back to the topic at hand out of my wandering thoughts. You might have seen him the night the conclave put me on trial. He spoke on my behalf. Oh, the young vampire, Castor asked. I had no idea who or what he was talking about since all of this predated my time in Prosper Woods. Castor had explained that the Conclave of Eight were ancient vampires who'd ruled the vampire world for millennia. Apparently, some ancient books belonging to Vincent's sire revealed Vincent was their king, and afterward he had done away with the ancient and evil Conclave in a bloody fight taking place right here in Prosper Woods— I only knew about it because my mate admitted to having participated in the battle along with Violet and Alpha Greg. I'd gotten actual proof that my mate was a hero, but then again, I'd sensed bravery and valor in him from the moment we'd met. Vincent smiled. Well, Thiago isn't young. He looks like a child because he was a child when he'd been turned vampire. He's actually older than I am. Why would anyone turn a child vampire? Castor asked. I could hear the revulsion of the very idea of the practice in his thoughts, but was glad that he didn't voice them out loud. Vincent sighed. Thiago's mother had been turned vampire, and she couldn't bear the thought of being separated from him. She couldn't take the chance that she'd kill him in a hungry fit when his human blood called to her. So she turned her own son, Castor asked in horror. Vincent nodded. I'm afraid so, yes. My mouth dropped open. What a terrible choice she'd had. Vincent was the first and only vampire I'd ever met, not counting the ones I'd seen on the driveway when we'd come over today. Learning that he'd been a knight of the realm had been very interesting. I really wanted to know more about his history. Hearing about this child vampire was terrible, and I was suddenly anxious to meet him. 
I'd always loved to study, and reading about history fascinated me. Meeting vampires who'd lived for centuries might help fill in what history hadn't been recorded in books. More so than that, I wanted to learn more about our own werewolf history. And because I'd asked, Castor had promised he'd have Sir Guillory ship some of our ancient books to California, ahead of moving the whole library, which would occur when the war ended. Castor had written to the scholar and asked him to send a selection of tomes explaining our history, those same books I'd been dying to get my hands on before coming to America. They were supposed to arrive in the States in a week or so. I was very excited. What kind of trouble do you anticipate for Prosper Woods and Frederick? The sheriff asked. Castor frowned as he looked back at him with a serious expression on his face. He shook his head. I don't know yet, Rome, and that's the honest truth. I'm in the process of gathering intelligence from a couple of people I have positioned inside the McCurdy clan. You have spies inside McCurdy's people? Vincent asked. Yes. Castor replied with a smirk. A couple of wolves who once worked for us applied for jobs with their people, and they were hired. Fortunately for us, they've been able to hide their connection to our clan. This was news to me. I hadn't realized that my mate had spies amongst the enemy, but then again, I knew Castor was shrewd. I had to admit that it made sense that he'd sent someone in to act as a spy. In his case, it was too. I was very proud of him and determined to make sure our own security thoroughly investigated our staff as soon as we got back home. I promised myself I was going to see to it that no one working at the house was a danger to my mate or to Violet. It wasn't my place to question security, but it was my place to make sure our home ran like clockwork. I thought that included safety. As soon as I got home, I was going to talk to Clyde, our head of security. I am impressed, Castor. Vincent said once again, dragging me out of my wandering thoughts. It is amazing what we have to resort to in times of war. Castor squeezed my hand, glancing over at me before looking back at our vampire friend. Well, I just wanted to let you both know how much I appreciate your offers of support. If you don't mind helping me to plan out some strategies that you've had with people in other parts of the world, I'd greatly appreciate it, Vincent. Emery and I are in a bit of a frenzy getting things organized in Iran at the moment. But war is coming, and we have to be prepared for it. When you say war, what are we talking about? Rome asked. I'm a marine, but I'm positive I have no idea what a werewolf war looks like. Just as bloody, but without tanks and planes, Rome, Vincent said, frowning. Guns? Bombs? What are we looking at here? Rome asked, looking between Vincent and Castor. I held my breath. I'd not thought a lot about what the result of my mating with Castor could be, but now that we were speaking of war, the very thought of people we loved getting hurt made me tremble. Castor seemed to sense my worry as he squeezed my fingers tighter. Werewolves fight in wolf form, not with guns or bombs, Rome. Castor replied. He sighed, frowning deeply. And if McCurdy wants to get really nasty, he might attack the human civilian population to draw us out. Fuck me. This is going to get ugly, isn't it? Rome asked. I felt for him. He was the sheriff of not only this town, but also Frederick, the town Alpha Greg Brown's pack called home. That meant he was responsible for hundreds of lives, human, werewolf, and shifter combined. Now that there were vampires among us, though only a small few, McCurdy might try to use their presence here to stir up hatred of Castor's clan and the royal house of Howard's a day. Things looked exceptionally bleaker than they had when we gathered in Vincent's dining room, from where I sat. Castor nodded slowly. I'm afraid my mating with Emery and the rejection of Penelope McCurdy has put all of us in danger, Rome. I just don't know what to say. You don't have to say anything, my friend, Benson said. Whenever you tell me you're ready, I'll have a hundred vampires here to help fill your ranks. You just give me the word. The town shifters are ready to fight, too, Rome said, though I'd hope it wouldn't come to actual war. 
Castor nodded. I can't tell you what that means to me. I don't know if having a hundred vampires here with Greg's pack is a good idea, but I suppose it will address that and lay out the reasons why we should join ranks when the time comes, providing it's necessary at all. He turned to look at me, and for the first time all day I read hope in his eyes and heard it in his thoughts. Emery and I are more grateful than I can say, Castor said, turning to look back at Vincent and Rome. He held out a hand. Thank you. We're here when you need us, Rome said. Please just keep us in the loop, since getting Vincent's vampires here will take some time. I'll put the governors on alert and ask them for trustworthy souls who might want to volunteer. He suddenly grinned. Since vampires have no souls, I'm pretty certain the ones who do accept the challenge will be the real deal. Castor and I chuckled, and as the other two men took turns shaking our hands, the feeling of overwhelming dread bled away. Chapter Two Prosper Woods Chronicle, All the Advice Fit to Print Dear Krabby, I've been going to AA meetings for years and always tried my best to follow the rules. As a recovering addict of pain medication, my sponsor told me to never get into a relationship with another person in the program. I was warned, but I didn't follow advice. Now I'm helplessly in love with another addict. I love the girl. What do I do? Signed, I Took the Thirteenth Step. Dear, I took the thirteenth step. I feel your pain, killers. <laughs> In Krabby's misspent youth, she too went to AA meetings. I won't try to fool you by mixing metaphors because I see only one way out of your pickle. My advice is to drop the rock before you fall off the wagon. Remember, find your powerlessness before your higher power finds it for you. Oh, and dump the girlfriend. Respectfully, Crabby. Emery. By the time we returned to the inn, it was nearly past dinner time. All our talk of war with Vincent and Rome had soured our stomachs, so when Rome told us he was about to start a barbecue, we had respectfully declined. Now that we were home, though, our stomachs were growling. We decided to head directly for the kitchen, knowing Mrs. Douglas always left us plates when we were out. The elderly cook was very good about things like that. I nodded at Clyde, our head of security, where he stood on the front porch. He smiled and sketched a small bow as Castor stopped. I hesitated and shot a questioning glance at my mate. I'll be right in, my love. Why don't you go and heat us up some food? Of course. I let go of my mate's hand and gave Clyde one last glance before going into the house. It felt like Castor didn't want me to listen to his conversation with the large bodyguard, but I chalked it up to being concerned for my safety. I have such a thoughtful mate, but sometimes I think he tries almost too hard to protect me. The fact is, I am smaller. I'm still completely surprised whenever I think about how I'd killed Teo, my mate's father's former head of security. He'd outweigh me by close to two hundred pounds— but when he tried to kill Castor, I went crazy. A lot of it is still a blur to me, but it does serve to remind me that, at least in my estimation, my mate is being overprotective of me. I'd never be able to convince him otherwise. As I walked into the kitchen and scented Mrs. Douglas's delicious cooking, I deliberately pushed all thoughts of danger out of my head. The elderly cook stood at the stove right where I knew I'd find her. The moment I walked in, she looked up and smiled at me before beckoning me over. I grinned back and headed across the room. You're still here. I expected you to be off for the night by now. I put my arms around her shoulders and gave her a little squeeze. She was a tiny thing, shorter than me by close to a foot, but making up for her stature by being pleasingly plump. The starched white toque she wore on her head came only to my shoulder, and the kindness in her eyes as she looked up at me from her labors had me smiling right back. Princess Violet insisted I hold dinner until you two came home, Master Emery. I hope you and Prince Castor are hungry. Whatever you made smells delicious, I told her. Good. I made a lovely meal, and you're just in time, dear. Princess Violet just came down to the dining room with the king. She frowned a little as I let go of her shoulders. 
I stepped back, concerned by the clouds which suddenly filled her bright eyes. What's wrong, Mrs. Douglas? She slowly shook her head. I don't know. The king doesn't seem to be getting any better. I think he looks worse than when he came here for the wedding. His plates come back with very few bites missing, and from what I've observed, he seems to be losing weight. Between you and I, she lowered her voice to a whisper, I caught the princess crying in the parlor all by herself the other day. Poor girl. I think she's just as worried as can be about her papa. I know it's not my place to say, but maybe Prince Castor should make sure the doctor comes out as soon as possible. I nodded. I had many of the same concerns. The king's pallor was almost green most of the time. Coupled with the fact that I was constantly taking in his suits of clothes, I knew he was losing weight. Thank heavens my mother had passed her skill of sewing to me. After becoming Castor's mate, I'd refused to give up my duties as the king's valet. I wanted to make sure he was served in the best possible way. And just a few months since we'd been mated, he'd gotten sicker, sleeping more during the day and night. And I knew he hadn't had a shift or a run since we'd come here. Doc Baker is scheduled to come see him tomorrow morning. Violet isn't alone in her worries. Castor is sick with it, Mrs. Douglas. The doctor would have been out to see him sooner, but he was on holiday and has only just returned. Good, the elderly cook smiled, but it wasn't terribly convincing. Are you and the prince ready for a nice meal? I have a lovely Zeresh polo with saffron chicken and barberry rice. My stomach growled. I reached over and lifted the lid of a large pot, gazing down at the steamed white rice made with small succulent barberries. The tart and tangy berries came in dried form and were rehydrated in a frying pan using sugar to sweeten them. Afterward, they were layered with the rice before steaming it, and when paired with Mrs. Douglas's saffron chicken, the meal just happened to be one of my favorite traditional Persian dishes. As steam rose from the pot, I picked up the scent of potato tadig. I knew the bottom of the pot was lined with buttery, crisp potatoes that tasted like the world's best french fries. Oh my God, that smells delicious, Mrs. Douglas. I leaned over and looked into the roasting pan in front of her. She took a large spoon and began plating up the bright yellow chicken pieces before covering them with a sauce that smelled like heaven on earth. After garnishing the dish, she turned to me and held it out. Would you mind taking that to the table, Master Emery? We have only one footman working tonight, but I'll call another to help now that I know you'll be dining with the king. I wasn't sure when you and the prince would return. The princess told me she wasn't sure the king would come down at all, so she said to send the other servants off. I'll bring along the rice, Torshi, and Masto Kiar in a minute. Thank you. I smiled at her, gratefully accepting the dish. The pairing of rice and the accompaniments she'd mentioned, pickled vegetables and a salad made of yogurt with cucumbers and mint like the one we'd had at Vincent's, were perfect. I knew I'd be going to bed with a fully satisfied tummy, as well as a fully satisfied mate the moment he got his fill of this meal. Halfway to the dining room, I spotted Castor coming into the house. The look of worry on his face vanished the moment he saw me. I frowned as he plastered a false smile onto his face, probably hoping I hadn't caught his expression before he'd attempted to hide it. I stopped, still holding the platter of food as he came up to stand in front of me. What's the worry? Surely nothing happened, I asked. He was too quick to shake his head. Not sure. One of our people in McCurdy's entourage has missed their chicken. I'm sure it's nothing to worry about, but it's slightly concerning anyway. He deliberately looked away from me toward the dining room before looking back. Let's talk about it when we're alone. No reason to worry them unnecessarily, he said, cocking his head at the dining table where Violet and his father sat having a conversation. I nodded, and we turned, walking into the dining room. Two of my favorite people looked up at us as we entered. Hello, my darlings. How did it go with Roman Vincent? Violet asked as I set the platter on a sideboard and went to stand beside my mate at the table. He held out a chair for me, and I patted his hand as we took our seats at the large and elaborate table. The solitary footman in the room stepped forward holding a wine decanter. Castor looked up and nodded to him, and the man began filling our glasses. It was still strange to think that I wasn't a servant any longer. The few times Claudio had served me at this very table in his role as footman had been more than awkward. 
I was now considered a royal consort and mate of the prince who'd someday inherit the throne if everything went right. As a member of royalty, Castor, by law, could take a wife and a consort, even more than one consort, if he chose. We considered ourselves married, though we hadn't had a large wedding like the one planned for Castor and Penelope. Neither of us cared too terribly about having a mating ceremony either. We both knew who and what we were to each other. With regard to breeding, that wasn't an issue for us like it was for male-female pairs. Besides, it was a perfectly acceptable practice in werewolf culture, and in fact, considered good form for the nobility to breed with many wolves. Breeding with clans outside our own was encouraged even more, since wolves often suffered in strength that their bloodlines were diluted by too much inbreeding, thus the need for foul creatures like matchmaker Arliss. Of course, they're concerned about McCurdy's threats in the coming war, Castor said, returning my wandering thoughts to the current topic of conversation since Violet had asked. Rome doesn't want these woods filled with vicious werewolves tearing each other apart, not to mention the fact that the humans might notice a massive influx of wolves running about and howling at the full moon. If that happens, God knows what the consequences will be. What kind of political structure is there to the government here? The king asked. Prosper Woods is run like a typical small town in America. There is an elected mayor and a few city councilmen who meet once a month to discuss town business. In our case, the mayor is a piece of crap. Castor glanced at his father. Excuse me for my language, father, he said, apologizing to the king. In any case, we supernaturals stay out of town politics, even though Prosper Woods is filled with shifters, vampires, and werewolves. We do monitor those meetings, and there's something important to us ever came up in them. I'm sure we'd get more vocal. My mate continued. From what I understand, the last time supernaturals got involved was when bear traps were a thing here in the woods. Thanks to some animal rights activists helping our cause, the town outlawed them. We stick to ourselves for the most part. But the last thing we need is to have to worry about the city council reversing the law about setting them out. No one wants to lose a limb to a trap. Alpha Brown was caught in one laced with liquid silver, and he almost lost his life. Who would do such a thing? The king asked as my own stomach turned. We all looked up when Mrs. Douglas walked in carrying a large platter of rice, followed by a second footman carrying a bowl of pickled vegetables, and the delicious yogurt dish I adored. After setting them on the sideboard and backing out of the room, the footman began serving, stopping at the king's side with the first platter. Before you came to Prosper Woods, the former Alpha of the Frederick Pack was defeated by Greg Brown. Castor explained as the king helped himself to some of the rice. Floyd Reardon, the former Alpha, was always trouble, and he didn't take his defeat well. He teamed up with several vampires who'd come here to kill Vincent. They were all defeated in the battle we talked about before. One night, about a week after our mating, Castor and Violet sat down and told the king and I all about the many battles that had occurred before our arrival in town. It had been eye-opening, and had the king and I on the edge of our seats as we listened to them. I had no idea there were so many varieties of shifters in town. Rome's deputy was a hedgehog shifter, and his dispatcher was a poodle. Our town physician, Doc Baker, was a hummingbird shifter. And, of course, then there were Prince Hannibal's guardians. The prince was Rome's son and good friends with our beloved Oliver. The small unicorn prince had two scary guardians who could shift and do anything from a bear to a dragon, depending on what was needed at the moment. It all sounded terrifically scary to me, but I really looked forward to the day when... I could see the guardian shift into a dragon. Apparently there was even a carnival which came to town twice a year and was run by an owl shifter. Her carnival freaks consisted of several monster shifters, which included the chupacabra, the Jersey Devil, and Mothman. Even the king had laughed at that. And the traps? King Howard Zaday asked. They were set by either Reardon or the bad vampires. We're not sure. They were all killed in that big battle we talked about. In any case, Doc Baker called Vincent, who saved Greg's leg when he was poisoned by the liquid silver which laced the trap. 
Someone knew what they were doing. Vincent is who? McKing asked. The Vampire King, Castor replied. I watched my father-in-law's eyes widen in surprise. Do tell. How did he save him? Doc Baker apparently cut the wound open, washed it out, and then Vincent bled into it. Ah, yes. I've heard that vampire blood helps heal wounds even more rapidly than our own werewolf metabolism. I just never heard of a vampire who's willing to save a werewolf. This vampire king must be someone very interesting, the king said. I would like to meet this vampire, even though I hear they reek something terrible. The king wrinkled his nose, and I stifled a chuckle, stuffing a piece of the potato toddy into my mouth instead. I couldn't believe we were really having this conversation. Before coming to Prosper Woods, I wasn't even sure there were any living vampires. I'd thought them to be a myth, though my mate had met a few before meeting Vincent. According to Castor, those other meetings had never been on friendly terms. He hadn't gone into detail about those encounters, which just made the idea of them intriguing. I promised myself to ask him about them when I got the chance. He's a good friend, my mate replied. I watched the king's jaw drop open, but Castor held up his hand. I know it sounds ridiculous, and if you would have told me a year ago that I'd be friends with the vampire king, I would have laughed at you, father. The king smiled, and for only a second I recognized an expression I hadn't seen on him in quite some time— at least since he'd become so sick. I really hoped the town doctor would be able to help him. He was still a relatively young wolf. From what I'd read, dire wolves lived very long lives. He should have a few decades in him. I know Castor was hopeful that Doc Baker would get to the bottom of the king's troubles. The footman finished holding and passing the rice dish so we could all take portions before the second footman materialized and began helping him serve. In a matter of moments, they both set down the dishes and stepped back to leave us to our food, and for that, I was grateful. As always, Mrs. Douglas's cooking was without flaw of any kind, and soon we were stuffed. Castor sat back and patted his belly before looking over at me. He lifted his hand and put it on the back of my collar, stroking his thumb inside, brushing it ever so lightly on the back of my neck, making me shiver. I always seemed to tremble in my mate's presence, and when I looked up at him, I spotted the all-too-familiar look of a very different hunger in his gaze. When he sent me a very sexy smile, I decided then and there it was well past time to head up to bed. He abruptly broke our gaze and dropped his hand, looking back at his father and sister. We're going to head upstairs. Emery was telling me how tired he was right before he sat down at the table. Castor said, lying so brazenly I would have kicked him under the table, if I dared. Tired, Violet asked, smirking at her brother. Castor let out an unconvincing yawn before reaching for my hand as he stood up. I suppose I'm tired, too. Please excuse us, father. Of course, my son. Good night. Good night, highness, I said, bowing ever so slightly. Good night, Emery. Sweet dreams. I turned to Violet. Good night, princess. Call me Violet Emery. What a family now. I'll try. It's hard, I said, allowing Castor to tug me toward the doorway. See that you do, Violet said. Moments later, we were at the foot of the stairs, and Castor was practically dragging me up them. When we got to the landing on the third floor, he turned us toward our private wing of the building separated from the king's quarters as well as Violet and Oliver's suites in this same half of the house. Our guests stayed one floor down on the middle level of the large, old Victorian structure, but since the king was staying with us for an extended period, possibly permanently, we hadn't reopened for regular business. The moment we stepped inside the room, Castor slammed the door and turned me, shoving my back up against the strong oak door. I let out a small, just before his mouth came crashing down on mine. Almost instantly, my arms were around his neck, and my mouth was open as he played with my tongue. Castor tasted so good, and when he began growling in the back of his throat, I knew what was coming. 
He was always a passionate man, and besides being the most handsome man I'd ever seen in my life, he could always sense my needs. Almost before I knew what was happening, he had both hands under my bottom and he was lifting me. I instantly pushed off the door and wrapped both legs around his waist, digging my heels into his lower back. He turned me, carrying me across the room to our large raised platform bed, where he bent and laid me down on my back. I dropped my legs and scooted backward as I let go. He leaned up, pinning me with his heated gaze as he grabbed one of my feet and pulled off my boot. I let out a chuckle as I recognized my mate's desire to get inside me as quickly as possible. I yanked at my belt buckle, only stopping when he tossed my boots aside and leaned down, lifted my shirt and kissed my belly. He glanced up at me as he knelt on the floor, batting my hands away and smiling sexily. I gasped as he finished with my belt and unzipped my fly, then drew my boxer briefs down, letting my swollen dick pop free. The scent of my pre-cum filled the air as he grinned wolfishly and dropped his gaze to my cock only a second before surrounding the head with his lips. Caster! I reached down and grabbed his dark hair with both hands, sliding my fingers into it and tugging gently on the silky strands as he firmed his lips and slid slowly down until my entire length was in his mouth and throat. He swallowed around the head, before pulling back, drawing a gasp out of me as his cheeks hollowed, sucking hard and then sliding off with a wet pop. He growled, and before I could catch my breath, he had the head of my dick on his tongue and was sucking me back inside. He reached up and took hold of my balls, rolling them not so tenderly, in his fist. I adored the pressure and sharp sting more than I should. Over the last three months, Castor had been experimenting with my body and the responses he could drag out of me. As he learned my body, and I learned his, I realized he truly was made just for me. Everything he did to me seemed perfect, but when he was a little rough, it seemed to bring me off faster and it made our encounters just a little hotter. The way he had tonight, flipping me around and slamming my back against the bedroom door before his mouth came crashing down on mine, to borrow an American phrase, <laughs> oh, hell yeah, that's what I'm talking about. I squeezed my eyes tightly shut and relaxed, concentrating on my own breathing as much as I could. It wasn't an easy task. My mate was a professional when it came to blowjobs, Growing up at home in Tabriz, I had only imagined what it would feel like to have a man worshipping my body, but Castor more than fulfilled any dreams I'd ever had. All those sweaty nights spent dreaming about coming down a man's throat hadn't prepared me for the utterly divine reality of something even better, emptying myself in my mate's mouth. I panted hard, lifting my head to look down and see his dark head bobbing at my groin. It was so fucking sexy. He sucked me until I was close to orgasm and then pulled off, leaning back on his heels and grinning like a naughty cat as he squeezed the tops of my knees. He looked way too satisfied with himself. If the need to blow my load wasn't so profound, I might have tried returning the torture. Castor himself had admitted to how skilled I'd become in giving head, and I adored swallowing his hot load when it jetted onto my tongue. I think I'll use the cuffs tonight. How does that sound, my love? He asked, drawing me out of my reverie. I shivered and my breath caught. Castor never heard me, spanking me the way I'd seen in some of the naughty movies we'd watched together, I remembered feeling like he was trying to detect what I might enjoy the first time he showed me those kinds of movies. I'd been a virgin when I'd come to his bed, but my mate had patiently explained how sexuality was complex and proceeded to take my education uh, in hand. We'd watched everything from guys getting off by frauding to hardcore BDSM and everything in between. Castor explained that everyone wanted or was turned on by, something different. I hadn't been completely naive. From the time we first shifted, I'd been looking at the naked bodies of other wolves, and when I'd gotten older, I'd heard about wolves participating in orgies back home in the palace. 
As a servant, I'd never been invited to participate in such decadence. I thought I'd dodged a bullet with that one. What wolf would want to be passed around when they could have one person so beautiful focused solely on themselves? The idea of sharing my body with multiple others had never intrigued me. But as soon as Castor had pulled up a scene where a man was being fucked while helplessly restrained with handcuffs, my, uh, interest <laughs> perked up. My entire body felt like it was on fire by the time the bottom was finally brought to a shattering orgasm as his partner fucked him roughly. My mate sensed my response to the kinky scene immediately, and now, when he wanted me really horny, he whispered it in my ear. One night, we'd been at the town watering hole with Violet and our security guy, Clyde, when Castor cornered me in the bathroom hallway and proceeded to tell me, in graphic detail, how he planned on recreating that exact scene for me as soon as we got home. I smiled even now, remembering how I'd barely made it through the evening after that. You want the handcuffs, don't you, Emery? Castor growled in that low, sexy voice I loved so much. The way he was looking down at my cock as it bobbed up and down, leaking a stream of pre-cum onto my belly, simply stole my breath. My dick was hard and red, slick with my mate's saliva. Oh, God, I wanted him to take me in hand and jack me off desperately as the images came to mind. I stared into his beautiful eyes and nodded my head frantically. Yes, Castor, I want them. I said, hearing the almost feverish whimper in my shaking voice. Good. Take off your clothes and move into position. I did as he asked, watching him stand up to begin removing his own clothing until he was stark naked. Castor's body was cut with rippling muscle, as most werewolves were. He was much larger than I, and covered with lustrous blue-black hair in all the right places. I especially loved the hair on his chest, so different from the human models who bucked each other on screen. He told me they waxed their chests in even more tender areas, and I couldn't even imagine what that practice might look like or the pain it would entail. I kept the hair at my groin trimmed, but even contemplating wax made my stomach turn— I wasn't into pain, only the way Castor took total control in the bedroom. I scrambled out of my clothes and crawled to the middle of the bed on all fours, looking back over my shoulder at him. He walked to the dresser and pulled handcuffs out of the top drawer before strolling slowly back over to me with a sexy smirk on his face. Handcuffs dangled from one hand and the bottle of the lube we liked was clutched in the other. I always marveled that Castor was such a thoughtful lover. From the day of our first mating, he'd gone out of his way to see to my comfort and deepen my desire for him. I think the thought of how he nodded inside me each and every time worried him just a bit. That wasn't until I told him in no uncertain terms I'd come to crave it. Now that I'd become accustomed to his large knot, I enjoyed riding him as he came inside me. Certainly the initial stretch was painful, but feeling his hard knot roll down his shaft and along my insides, becoming lodged inside me as he emptied his cum for a full fifteen minutes, had become routine for us. Face to face there was nothing more exciting than watching my mate's face in the midst of a long climax, but when he took me from behind, God, our mating felt primal and very animal. I suppose that's what Mother Nature intended for us. We were animals, after all. The way Castor's hands changed to claws as he held onto my hips from behind was hotter than I could explain. And I know he loved it, because he had told me what it felt like to breed me that way. I did find it fascinating that in some of the movies he'd shown me, the bottoms sometimes begged to be bred. I hadn't been exactly sure what the term meant, but I did know this. When we were finished and sated and he finally slid out with a rush of hot fluids spilling out onto our sheets to puddle there, it was hot as hell. Castor tossed the lube on the bed and crawled over to me with his own cock bobbing as he came toward me. 
He looked positively decadent as he reached for the wrists I held out and fastened the handcuffs around them. He left them a little loose and smiled at me as he leaned in close and kissed me. This kiss was hot, and I opened my mouth, letting him suck on my tongue as long as he wanted to. When he finally broke the kiss, I was panting, my heart pounding wildly in my chest. He took the handcuffs and lifted them by the center link in the chain, fastening it to a hook which he had had installed at the top of the tall headboard. I'd given up blushing every time I thought of what the maids must have made of the gold hook which could only serve one purpose. I widened my knees on the bed as I felt Castor move in behind me. Only a moment later, I felt both of his hands on my arse cheeks, spreading them slowly apart. I blew out a sigh and waited as the seconds ticked by. This position robbed me of the last of my control. I had to tamp down my nervousness as I realized how vulnerable I truly was. This kind of bed play required total devotion and trust in one's partner. I felt myself begin to tremble, and then calmed as he leaned down and kissed one arse cheek. Let me look at that pretty, pretty hole. I'm going to give you what you need, Emery, he whispered. His words should have calmed me, but I knew he was looking at me. I felt a sweat break out all over me as I realized Castor was staring at such a private place. It excited me more than I could say. What do you think I need, Castor? I asked, hearing the tremor in my own words spoken just above a whisper. This. I gasped when Castor's tongue lapped at my opening. My entire body began shaking as he worked my arsehole, tonguing it and sucking on it until I knew it had to be puffy and red. I was gasping and breathless by the time he finally let go of my bottom cheeks and moved in even closer. I heard the snick of the lube bottle, and before I could breathe, I felt his hand sliding between my cheeks as he sought entrance. <sighs> oh, God, I growled as his finger traced over my tight hole, already slick with saliva from my mate's mouth. Castor chuckled. <laughs> I know what you need, Emery. You need me to fill you up. God, yes. I hung my head, staring at the bed, unable to move my arms and feeling the strain in both shoulders from the tug of the handcuffs. I felt them hard at my wrists and ignored the twinge. The anticipation of being totally helpless as Castor fucked me hard at a steady stream of pre-cum leaking from me. I could feel it sliding out of my slit and down the length of my rampant cock. Fuck me, Castor. I heard myself whimpering, but I wasn't ashamed of the needy sound. It generally served to turn my man on whenever he heard it. Sure enough, he shifted position behind me. You want that, don't you, Em? He whispered in one ear, leaning over my back. The sensation of hot breath washing across my ear was hot as hell. The feel of his erection poking into my back from how close he was to me was even hotter. Oh, God. He stroked at my hole, circling it with the warming lube he loved using on me. I found that the brand he had chosen for me numbed some of the sting when he nodded inside me and yet let me feel enough of the burn to enjoy riding him until he had me breathless and begging. Yes, he hissed. That's right. Push back on my finger, baby. I did as he asked and felt the digit pop inside. I let out a little gasp as he chuckled. I pushed farther back, and he deliberately pulled his finger out, depriving me of it. Fuck me, Castor. I said, hearing the unguarded plea in my voice. My entire body was covered with sweat as he pushed the finger back in, digging deeper this time as he fucked me with his long digit. I bit my lip to hold back my moan, convinced that he'd give me what I wanted only at his own pace and in his own time. I wanted to wail and beg, but this torture was a game my mate loved to play with me. There'd be plenty of begging soon enough. I gasped as he suddenly pulled his finger out, only to have it shoved back in with a companion. The lube began to warm my insides, 
and when he started slowly dragging his fingers along the inside of my channel, searching for the knot of nerves I knew were there, I gritted my teeth to keep from biting my tongue. There, baby, he said, leaning over me as he pressed his fingers deeper inside me. You like that? Yes, yes, I practically shouted. Give me more, Castor. He chuckled as I whimpered again. I knew how much he loved the tease, and there were times when I did too. Being restrained like this made everything hotter. I couldn't touch him. I couldn't reposition myself. I couldn't touch myself, which was probably a good thing. If I took myself in hand right now, two strokes would be all I'd need to get off, and then all of this would be over for a while. By the time he pulled out and began pushing in with a third finger, I could feel tears leaking from my eyes and running down my face. I was constantly rocking back and forth on my knees, pushing into him and pulling away as he full-on fucked me with all three fingers. Someday, I'd be brave enough to ask him to add a fourth. One of the movies he'd shown me included a practice called fisting. And though I thought it was extreme at the time, the very idea of it as he fucked me with three long fingers had me so hard I was ready to spray all over this bed. If you don't put your cock inside me, I'm going to come all over this bed and end your fun once and for all, Caster. I warned, so close, so damned close to orgasm I was taking all my strength and energy to keep it at bay. Caster chuckled again as he pulled all three fingers out and then took hold of my hips. A moment later, I felt even more lube sliding down my crack. He always prepared me like this. He never wanted to hurt me, and I loved how generous he was with the lubricant. The bottle suddenly landed on the bed beside me. I tugged at the handcuffs as I felt his claws suddenly digging into my arse cheeks, pulling them apart. My entire body was shaking with anticipation. Look at your beautiful stretched hole, Emery. I wish you could see how lovely you are inside and out. The wide head of his dick slowly slid in between my cheeks and bumped up against my pucker. Let me in, Castor said, digging his claws in as he breached me. I held my breath and did my best to relax as I felt the young cut mushroom head pop through. He paused just inside, and I felt a kiss on my shoulder before he pressed deeper. I let out the breath I'd been holding on a moan, feeling him slide deep in a single, long, slow thrust. God, him. Castor leaned his forehead between my shoulder blades, and I could feel his lips as he spoke the words. You're so fucking tight even after all this time. All the times I've taken you with my thick knot, and your body is still so fucking tight. I can't get over how perfect you are for me. He pulled out and then shoved in harder. When he bottomed out, burying every inch of his incredible cock deep inside me, I cried out. That's right. Take me him, Castor said. His voice was shaking and it couldn't have been hotter. I'm taking you, my prince. Fuck me harder, I chanted as he fucked in and out. His response was to tighten his claws, digging them deeper into my bottom until I smelled blood. I craved the sting, knowing any punctures would close the moment he let go of me, and still wanting the tiny bit of pain he inflicted as he fucked me. Maybe there was something wrong with me for needing this so badly. I had no idea. I yanked at the cuffs. I just knew I needed it. Castor fucked me harder, pulling out and then pushing in, Faster and faster as he began picking up the pace. Every time he pounded into me, I gasped and whimpered. I knew the sounds I made turned my mate on along with the sight of the mating scar where he closed his incisors in my shoulder, leaving a mark which would never fade. Every time I caught sight of it in the mirror, I reached up to touch it, remembering the time he had first thrust his massive cock into my body. Embory. Himari, Castor began to chant, and I knew what it meant. I held my breath as I felt the stretch begin. If I could see what was happening, I'd see his tennis 
ball size, not rolling up the shaft of his cock and stretching me. Oh, God, I cried before opening my mouth and letting out a howl as his knot popped inside. I felt it like a fist pushing deeper, running up the length of his shaft until we were suddenly tied together. We'd stay this way until Castor finished emptying his hot load inside me, and the very thought of it made my balls draw up as I began to spurt on the bed. I screamed as my climax hit, and to my utter relief, he reached around, taking me in hand. When his large hand brushed over my spurting crown, I screamed again, yanking hard at the handcuffs, impaled on the biggest knot I could imagine, and absolutely helpless to do anything about it. I was exactly where I wanted to be, and I'd do it all over again every day for the rest of my life. I was absolutely devoted to this wolf, and he was absolutely devoted to me. We needed each other more than life itself. Chapter 3 Prosper Woods Chronicle All the Advice Fit to Print Dear Krabby, I'm desperately in love with the gorgeous, intelligent, successful man I met at work. I know this sounds great, but there's one thing blocking our forever happiness. He's married and has two children about my age. I don't really know what to do since he says he can't leave his wife because she will kill herself if they get divorced. I just think he's a victim of her conniving, clingy nature. Should I confront her and tell her to let me have him? Signed, Just a Sad Side Piece. Dear Just a Sad Side Piece, You have got to be kidding. Sadly, you fall into a category I like to call stupid and young. Trust Krabby, my dear, you aren't his first and you won't be his last. He'll never willingly divorce her, and I seriously doubt she's the problem. You could, however, get proactive, immediately drop this loser and take up with his wife. Hopefully she'll have some sewing skills to help you get those side pieces right. And the bonus? When cut on a bias, the best side pieces work better than a corset to make your waist look very trim. Respectfully, Krabby Castor. I came awake to a persistent knocking, and as I felt Emery stir in my arms, I groaned. I rolled over and glanced at the bedside table clock, finding that it was already past nine. Somehow, I'd overslept. More often than not, I found that problem becoming more and more common due to nocturnal activities with my mate. I sighed as the knocking went on and rolled away from Emery. The morning was not starting out well. I snatched up a red silk robe from the chair, winding it around my body as I walked to the door. I smelled Violet when I got close and yanked the door open. She stood in the corridor looking upset, and I picked up on the scent of worry almost immediately as well. What is it? What's happened? May I come in, Castor? I don't want everyone in the house to know this, and you know how the staff gossips. No one was around but the maids and the kitchen staff delivering breakfast trays. However, they did gossip, and if she needed a closed door as an extra layer of protection, I wouldn't fault her for it. Of course. Come inside, Vi. I reached for her hand and drew her inside before shutting the door. Violet? What's wrong? Emery's sleepy voice called out from the vicinity of our bed. I could hear my mate stirring and his telepathic voice in my head telling me not to worry, even when he knew I'd do just that until we learned the purpose of my sister's early visit to our suite. When he came around the end of the bed wearing a plaid flannel robe and nothing more than a worried frown, I held out my arm. He walked up to my side, and I dropped my arm around his shoulders, pulling him close. He swept out a hand to the couch and upholstered chairs which sat in front of the fireplace. "'Please come and sit, Violet.' You must be cold, Emery said, before sliding out from under my arm and walking quickly across the room where he squatted before the fireplace. Our roaring fire of the night before had burned down nearly to small embers. I watched him drop a couple of fresh logs on the fire and poke the flaring coals beneath until the fire caught and began crackling. Violet and I walked over to the warmth as Emery stood to his full height and met me halfway. 
She accepted Emery's invitation and took one of the chairs while I sat beside my mate on the couch. I immediately took his hand in mine, and he leaned against me, turning all his attention to my sister. What's happening, sister? I called for the doctor. Papa was up all night long. I'm sure he got no sleep at all, Violet said. Wasn't Doc Baker scheduled to come out this morning anyway? Emery asked. This afternoon, yes. But I want him here as soon as possible. If it wasn't for the fact that we're werewolves, I would have woken you up earlier to drive him to the emergency room. I'd talked about opening a clinic for shifters and paranormals with the doctor when one of Greg's pack got sick and died because Doc Baker was out of town. He'd lamented the wolf's loss, and because he was nearing retirement age, he'd agreed with me that undertaking a search for a replacement should take top priority. In fact, the reason he'd gone out of town this time was because he'd been traveling the country looking for interns ready for a change. It wasn't like he could exactly put an ad up on Craig's list. The search for an appropriate replacement would take time, and he'd begun it just before our conversation months back. What's happening, Violet? I asked, very concerned. Clearly he was weak and pale all the time. His eyes had taken on an even stronger yellow cast that was unnatural in any wolf. It could be liver disease, an affliction almost unheard of in werewolves, but if it was, my father's own doctor in Tabriz had missed it entirely. He had already begun declining before coming to the U.S., and his current condition, aside from the winds of war blowing around, was the reason he still resided with us and hadn't gone home. He can barely get out of bed. Last night at dinner was the first time he'd come down all day, and he hasn't shifted since we've been here in the States. By the time I got him upstairs after the meal, he'd sweated right through his clothing. I don't know if you noticed, but he barely ate a thing, even though Mrs. Douglas made his favorite meal. Violet sighed, and I could smell the tears before they appeared in her eyes. I'm so worried about him. She abruptly stood. Anyway, darlings, I wanted to tell you Dr. Baker should be here soon, in case you wanted to make yourselves uh, presentable. Thank you, sis. We'll get dressed and come to Papa's suite. I stood up and pulled her into my arms, holding her close for a few moments. When she let go and stepped back, my robe was wet with her tears. I watched her nod before turning and walking to the door. When she'd gone, Emery took my hand and I drew him in close for a hug. He pulled away quickly and looked up at me. I'm going to get dressed and rush over there to help the king get settled. I should have been up and in his bedside to make him comfortable already. Emery looked positively guilty as he turned away and walked over to his dresser to begin pulling out clothing. You shouldn't feel guilty. He has those two assistant valets. Surely they can help him get ready and draw a bath when he wants one, Emery. My mate walked back to where I stood at my armoire, perusing my own clothing selections. I love you, I said, circling his back and hugging him close, resting my chin on top of his head. I still couldn't believe how lucky we were to have found each other. Most fated mates went their whole lives without finding each other. I love you too, Castor, but my junior valets are still teenagers. They need lots of direction and supervision, which is why I haven't given up my position. Taking the hands-on approach also means I'm close enough to see how well he's doing every day. You're right. Thank you, sweetheart. I kissed him quickly and released him, smacking his ass through the thin robe he wore. Now get dressed so that we can go and see my father. I don't want to miss a thing when the doctor gets here. He nodded and went into the bathroom as I began opening drawers and pulling out clothes of my own to wear. Five minutes later we were dressed and groomed and walking down the hall toward the king's quarters. We ran into Clyde who was coming toward us from the direction of my father's suite. Highness, my head of security said, bowing slightly to me. Master Emery. Hello, Clyde, Emery said the moment we walked up together. Clyde. I said, greeting the man's serious expression. Anything wrong? Wrong? No, Prince Castor, but if I could have a moment of your time when you've finished with the king, I would like to talk to you. Of course. Clyde gave me a bow of his head and then continued on, walking away from us. 
I went toward my father's suite, where a somewhat unfamiliar guard stood at attention outside the door. Hello, Bobbick, Emery said. I didn't know the wolf, but had seen him around. I remembered that he was with my father when he arrived from Tabriz. I looked briefly at my mate with a bit of surprise that he seemed to know the man, but then turned my attention to the handsome dark-haired wolf he'd called by name. He had the common sense to bow in my direction the moment he saw me, but I thought it extremely odd that he didn't return Emery's greeting when he'd clearly called him by name. Sire, the guard said, ignoring Emery. I frowned. My mate wished you a good morning, I said. It's not necessary, Castor. He doesn't know me. He's a friend of Claudio's, that's all. Emery said sotto voce. I don't care whose friend he is if he ignores my mate. The guard turned to me and bowed at the waist. Forgive me, Master Emery. When he looked back up, the expression in his brown eyes wasn't a nice one. Clearly, he didn't like being scolded, least of all by me. It occurred to me that Emery and I had never had the discussion about how the staff was treating him since our mating. Emery was my fated mate, but he was not a member of the aristocracy. As a member of the servant class, and a common brown wolf, I now wondered how many of our staff resented the fact that their prince was now mated to a commoner. He ate at the king's table, where he was waited on by my staff at meals. His clothing was handed to the laundry with mine to be washed by the staff, and the only reason he still worked as head valet to my father was because he wanted to. I had an entire cadre of construction workers building his mother a private home at the back of my land, because he planned on bringing her over from Iran to live close to us. I couldn't believe I hadn't thought to inquire about how people had been treating him. I felt like a total heel, and could have kicked myself when I caught the look in Bobak's eyes. Do you have a problem with my mate? I inquired, lowering my voice and deliberately infusing the question with as much threat as I could muster. No, sire. Forgive me, Bobak said. He had remained tight-lipped, staring at me with a deliberately blank expression on his face. Emery was tugging on my arm, and I finally broke this stare when my mate became a distraction. I looked at Emery. What? There's no problem, Castor. The king is waiting, Emery said, gazing up at me with a desperate plea in his eyes. Fine. But we're not done with this, Em. He blew out a relieved breath, and Bobak reached for the door to the suite, opening it so Emery and I could go in. As soon as we walked into the large reception room outside my father's bedroom, I stopped short. The room was filled with several people, some of which I didn't know at all. I spotted Violet and Doc Baker standing off to the side with their heads bowed, speaking to each other in quiet tones. As soon as we closed the door, they stopped their conversation and looked up. Violet beckoned us over with a simple gesture of her hand, and we headed over. Doc Baker was a small man, probably three or four inches shorter than my own mate. He was elderly and very small-boned, and I reminded myself that he was a hummingbird shifter who came with a long resume and an excellent reputation. As werewolves, we rarely got ill. There were diseases that appeared in wolves, such as cancer, but they were rare. Our metabolism, being what it was, generally cured any ailments we might happen to come down with only because we could shift back and forth quickly to heal tissue. The dire wolf nobility of our race were even heartier, which is why I couldn't imagine my father becoming so ill. I didn't like doctors as a general rule of thumb. When Oliver was diagnosed with the werewolf version of Down syndrome, a chromosomal abnormality, I cursed the heavens and my own genes. When the doctors told me that he'd most likely never shift, and that it might be possible that I'd passed it to him genetically, and worse, that his own child might inherit it, I'd just about gone crazy, and given up on all doctors, thinking of them as quacks. If they couldn't heal my son, what good were they? When I'd learned that Oliver could shift after all, and in fact had the power to heal my mate and save his life, I'd realized that I'd been right all along. Doctors didn't know what in the hell they were talking about. All I could do was pray that I was wrong about Doc Baker and that he would be able to save my father's life. Violet introduced the doctor to Emery, who'd never met him, and he shook hands with the small man. 
Prince Castor, it's nice to see you again. Doc Baker stuck out a hand to me, and I shook it. Thank you for coming, I said as he turned to my mate. And it's so nice to meet you, Emery, the doctor said. His voice was booming, strange in that it was coming out of such a small man. I've heard a lot about you. Emery smiled at this small doctor. Nice to meet you. I do hope you can work out what's ailing the king. I'll do my best, the doctor said. Princess Violet was just giving me an inventory of his symptoms and a timeline, so I'm off to examine him. He lifted his large doctor bag to show us. I'm going to draw blood and take a urine sample, so I'll be just a bit, if you have other business to do while I'm at it. I need to see my security man, I said before turning to Emery. I'll be right back. Okay, you know where to find me, Castor. I watched him take Violet's hand and was glad he was going to wait with her. He exchanged a glance with the doctor. I'll wait out here for Castor to return if that's okay with you. Oh, yes, fine. I leaned forward and kissed Emery before Violet and the doctor went into the bedroom, closing the door behind them. I turned and walked out of the suite and headed downstairs to find Clyde, leaving my father in the doctor's capable hands. As it turned out, my security man was waiting for me in his office. When I walked in, the four werewolves sitting in front of a long bank of computer monitors stood up and bowed to me. I acknowledged them with a nod before continuing on to Clyde's private office at the back. He stood as soon as I entered the room. Clyde was holding his cell phone to his ear and speaking Farsi into it. From what I could determine on his end of the conversation, someone was talking to him from the castle complex back home. I sat down in front of his desk as he retook his seat, continuing his conversation in clipped tones. I'm sorry, Your Highness, that was Nima, he said, ending the call quickly and hanging up. Nima Shirazi had been tail second in charge back home, responsible for my father's security in the castle compound. He remained our head of security back there. I knew the man, but I didn't know him as well as Clyde, the man I'd had providing security for the family here in America for the last several years. After Tail's treachery, I was relieved to find that Nima and Clyde had been working well together. Nima was in his early forties and also headed up training for our large retinue of bodyguards back home. But with war on the horizon, at my request he'd ceded the stateside operations fully to Clyde and sent some of his finest to supplement the king's forces over here. We had over fifty men on staff in California, as well as teen women. All were highly trained professionals. Though we rarely used weapons, preferring to fight in our animal forms, our finest sniper was a small female werewolf who also taught martial arts and hand-to-hand -hand combat to our security forces in human form. You never know it, but she was one of the most lethal werewolves anyone would ever meet. My father had always required us to train in both human and werewolf form, different from what we knew of McCurdy's forces. His fears had always been that some future form of warfare would have werewolves at a disadvantage if we were somehow unable to shift to fight. Therefore, we had to learn to fight in both forms. I'd spent my entire youth learning to fight as a man and grumbled my way through every single second of it. We were a better fighting force for our training, though. That I knew. With the royal family stateside now, Nima had his hands full into Breeze. With the coming war from the McCurdy clan, his primary job, and one he was the best at, was hiring and training troops to fight. He did this with the help of several generals who reported to us both. I'd become accustomed to being briefed on the state of our troops on a daily basis with Clyde at my side. I glanced at the wall clock and found that I was late to the party, and the briefing had most likely just ended. Sorry I'm late, Clyde. Did I miss the briefing? Yes, Highness, there's not much to report. The spy who didn't report in was rescued last night. You were right. She had been taken just as Nima thought. His wolves went in last night and retrieved her without much incident, but without much incident. What had they discovered? Not initially, sire. They were able to get into the castle complex, find the servant quarters, and then subsequently the jail. Then one stood guard while the other went in to grab her. He encountered only one guard and subdued him before bringing her out. It was on the way out of the castle complex where they were discovered. I frowned. 
None of their people were hurt, though. It wasn't that I cared one way or another, but in the future, if, heaven forbid, another of our spies was caught, they might be executed or tortured to death other than being held for a prisoner exchange or some such. Everything was dependent upon the way we negotiated certain waters. They were discovered on the way out of McCurdy's complex, sire, and none of their people were killed. Our folks were shot at but escaped and are on their way back to Tabriz. Good, I said. Nima's man was forced to knock the girl unconscious to keep her from crying out. She's in and out of consciousness, but they don't think it will be permanent once the swelling goes down. He just caught her on the wrong angle, Clyde said with a small sigh. She's obviously brave. I'll be proud to meet her when I get the chance. She's a sister of Mosin, King Howard Sade's junior valet. I think she was very brave to do what she did, and didn't really deserve to be knocked about during her rescue, Clyde said. Noted. Debrief her when she's able to talk, and please let me know of her condition. They're still en route from Edinburgh to Tabriz. They made it down to London last night by a combination of boat and overland. They hopped a plane to Tehran about four hours ago, so they should arrive soon. By then I'm sure she'll have come around, and we'll get the full story of how she was discovered, sire. I see. I would have liked to have left her under cover as long as possible, but hopefully she will have gotten some insight as to what they have planned. I mean, it has been a couple of months. Hopefully she learned something. Clyde nodded. Hopefully, sire. And they think she'll be okay. I didn't like to think of this young woman being put in danger like that. Yes, sire. Anything else? Nima wanted you to know that the generals report good morale. They're up to over 2,500 troops, sire. He says they apologize for the troop buildup going so slowly. We've had to call in clan members from all over the world, bring them all to Tabriz to have them train together in cohesive units under the generals, and that's what's taking time. I nodded. It wasn't like we had a large standing werewolf army as part of our clan. We were at a disadvantage there. I hadn't told Emery that one of the only reasons I'd chosen Penelope McCurdy over the alternate Italian girl matchmaker Arliss had offered was the fact that her father had such a large standing army. Alistair McCurdy's generals commanded nearly four thousand werewolf troops, and letting them loose among the folks of Prosper Woods would absolutely prove disastrous. No one in the paranormal community wanted us found out that way. Sheriff Rome Harmon and his mate Vincent Certainly wouldn't stand for it. All I could do was hope that the threat of bringing in the vampires and shifters to fight on our side would deter Alistair from doing something all of us would regret. I stood and held out a hand. Clyde clasped it. Thank you, Clyde. Please call me and give me an update if there is one. I'll be anxiously waiting to hear anything as soon as that girl is back among us. Clyde shook my hand and then sketched a small bow. I pivoted on the balls of my feet and headed back out of the security office, waving the guards back to their spots in front of the monitors. As I headed back to my father's side, I felt a combination of anxiousness and hopefulness that all the news of the day would be as upbeat as I'd heard here, and pretty sure I was going to be wrong about that. Chapter 4 Prosper Woods Chronicle all the advice fit to print. Dear Krabby, I need your advice. See, I'm thinking of suing my favorite restaurant, but I'm not sure about it. If I do, they'll never let me go back. I guess I should tell you why I want to sue. I was there yesterday having my favorite meal when suddenly an ant crawled out of my Caesar salad. What would you do? Signed, to sue or not to sue. That is the question. Dear to sue or not to sue, that is the question. I take things like this very seriously. Food safety is an important thing and not talked about enough in this country. If you want my honest opinion, I'd say sue. Personally, I'd be beyond horrified if one of my aunts crawled out of my salad, especially my Aunt Helen. I never liked that woman. She was a holy terror when my mother forced me to eat at her house every Sunday after church. Respectfully, Crabby. Emery. I watched Violet and Doc Baker come out of the king's bedroom and noticed the grim expression on both faces immediately. 
I glanced at the door leading out to the hallway, and Will cast her to return for probably the millionth time since he'd walked out. I knew it was very important to him to get the daily briefing from his security team, both back home and here in Prosper Woods, but his timing was crap. The last thing I needed in my life was to have to listen to Doc Baker deliver bad news without my mate by my side. I hoped they'd wait for him before sitting me down. And the moment I thought it, I chastised myself for being so conceited as to think I had any rights to that information at all. I sighed when the door didn't burst open, producing my mate just from my wishes. Instead, I turned back to Violet and the doctor to see them both staring at me. If it was good news, they'd be smiling, and my beloved sister-in-law wouldn't be trying so hard not to cry. I could see her lower lip shaking, and I immediately kicked myself for my train of thoughts. I walked over to her and took her hands when she reached out for me. The news isn't good. I stated in a quiet voice. She shook her head as her eyes flooded with tears. We'll wait for Castor. But no, he's not. I dragged her into my arms and held her thin body close. She was taller than I was, which always made our hugs awkward. I turned my face into her shoulder, then rubbed her back in a comforting gesture as she leaned her head on top of mine. It felt important just to stand here and be present for her. Nothing I could do would help, but I hoped I could ease a little of her pain and worry. It took me a few seconds to realize Violet was shaking, shaking and crying. Shit, I squeezed her tighter. She squeezed me back. It's going to be okay. We'll get through this together. Whatever it is, Violet. My words sounded empty, but at least they sounded sincere not like the lie they probably were. A million thoughts crossed my mind. It had to be cancer, but werewolves were so hardy. What else could it be? Then again, I'd only known of one wolf who'd gotten the C word, as it was known here in the States. He'd been a member of Greg's pack, which is why I knew. He'd told me about the history of Prosper Woods when we'd had them over for dinner one night. Apparently the poor man had been a victim of rogue vampires who'd come to kill Vincent... They'd preyed upon him because he was weak. Thinking about it now gave me the same revolting feeling I'd had the first time I'd heard about it. I was relieved as hell when the door to the king's suite suddenly opened and Castor stepped inside. He was panting hard, and I wondered whether he'd run all the way back here from his meeting with Clyde. I desperately hoped he'd gotten good news from the generals. It was awful that he had to deal with this fucking war on top of the king's illness. Sometimes, like right now, I felt so guilty. The Haaretzade clan wouldn't be at war if I'd never come here to Prosper Woods. If I'd never met Castor and found out that he was my fated mate, or if he'd sent me packing back to Iran as he should have, none of our people would be in this mess. People were going to die, and it was all my fault. Violet let go of me the moment Castor walked into the room. I saw his nostrils flare and knew that he was trying to suss out our emotions. He could read mine easily enough. We were sensitive to each other's feelings in particular because we were true mates, and even if she hadn't been crying, Violet's feelings would have been easy enough for Castor to work out. They were separated in birth by only a few minutes, and besides, the scent of her tears was all over the room. He walked right over to us and took my hand as he wrapped the opposite arm around Violet, drawing her close. I watched him turn his face into her dark hair, and when he pulled away, his expression looked so devastated it made me heartsick. Violet stepped away from him as he turned to Doc Baker. It's terrible news, isn't it? The small doctor frowned as he craned his neck to look up at my tall mate. It's not good, but it may be reversible. It's very difficult to tell until I run some tests, your highness. Call me Castor, my mate said. He held out a hand to a grouping of sofas and chairs in the suite's parlor area. Please, sit down and tell us what's going on. Castor held onto my hand as he led me to a sofa, and I took a seat beside him, not letting go of his hand, determined to be a good mate. I wasn't exactly sure what that meant at this moment, but I knew I'd be by his side as long as he needed me, a shoulder to lean on, should he want it. I could feel emotional pain coming off him in waves and was struck by the mixed emotions he had to be feeling. On the one hand, 
Castor had only been back home once after leaving Iran over ten years before. And when the king had insisted he marry a woman of the matchmaker's choosing, they'd had quite a row. They had been at odds from the moment his father had arrived. But on the other hand, Castor deeply loved his father. I realized after all was said and done, and Alistair McCurdy had gone back home to Scotland to prepare to go to war, Castor's deep affection for his father had come to the surface. We were silent, staring at each other for only a few seconds before the doctor began in his booming voice. Your father has a compromised liver, and I suspect other organs have begun to fail. Yes, I suspected his liver wasn't good when I saw the yellow cast in his eyes, Castor said. But how? What caused a healthy werewolf to suddenly become so ill? Doc Baker frowned. I suspect he's been poisoned. He smells of garlic, which tells me that, unless he's been eating an extraordinary amount of it, arson from arsenic is the culprit. He's been given so much that it's ruined his liver. What? Castor's shout startled me so much I jumped. Based on the size and hardness of his liver, I believe his poisoning has been going on for several months. If I'm right, he's ingested it. Ingested it? Violet asked. Doc Baker nodded. I believe so. Someone has been slipping it into his food or hot drinks, possibly. It's the only explanation. I immediately thought of our lovely cook, Mrs. Douglas. She was a plump and very pleasant woman whom I adored. I'd never gotten a feeling that she disliked the king in any way. She always seemed as though she was thrilled to be cooking for him now that he was staying with us indefinitely, and she'd been with Castor and Violet long before the king ever came to live with them. I couldn't imagine she was responsible. Most of the time we all ate together, so the very idea of her tainting the king's food seemed quite impossible. None of the rest of us showed any signs of illness. That's quite impossible, Violet said, echoing my thoughts and leaping immediately to her feet to pace away from our group on the couches. Mrs. Douglas has been with us forever. I hired her when I first came to Prosper Woods, and she's lovely. She's honored to be cooking for the king. I can't say how many times she's told me so. Doc Baker stood and held up both hands. Princess Violet, I'm not suggesting that the poisoning had to come from your cook's food or drink. In fact, I believe the poisoning began a while before he came to Prosper Woods. He's been here three months, correct? I watched as Violet returned to her seat, her eyes wide as she nodded. Yes. Doc Baker sat back down and Violet immediately leaned forward and took his hand. Well then, it had to have begun when he was still in Iran. The level of damage I can sense when palpating his belly tells me that it's been going on longer. You did say he didn't look good when he first arrived, right? Yes, he looked terrible, thin and weak. Castor said, but he's much worse now. Well, that explains things. He was poisoned beginning in Iran, and it's continued since he's been here, the doctor said. And I won't be able to confirm how much damage and if it's reversible until I run tests. He reached into his pocket and pulled out four vials of blood. I took some blood and I'll run tests on it, but I'll be back with a portable x-ray machine later today. I want to see his liver on screen. Once I get that, I believe an MRI is in order. He scratched his chin. What is it? Castor asked. Well, normally I'd take someone so ill into Stockton to have an MRI done in an imaging center run by a shifter I know, but he's too ill to move at the moment. I stared at my mate before looking back at the doctor. Is there a portable MRI? There's a bus, yes, but it's run by humans and is booked out months in advance. If it's run by humans, maybe Vincent can help us, I said. Vincent, Violet asked. Doc Baker suddenly grinned widely. Yes, my boy, excellent idea. What do you mean? Castor asked, eyeing me suspiciously. Compulsion. Vincent can use compulsion on the humans' minds to let the doctor take over their portable MRI bus until the test is done, I said, feeling proud of myself. Castor nodded, still frowning as he turned back to the doctor. Okay, well, that's something, Tin. We were all silent for a few seconds before Castor suddenly turned to look at me. I could see the fire blazing in his eyes, and it was startling. 
What do you know of it? This poisoning. What? I stammered, taken aback. He couldn't be asking me if I'd known his father was being poisoned before we arrived in the States. It seemed utterly impossible that my mate had even the slightest question about me knowing the king was so ill and saying nothing, and even worse, that I had anything to do with it. You were his valet in Tabriz, which is why you were chosen to accompany him to the States. Right, Emery? He suddenly let go of my hand, seemed to toss it at me as he pulled away and stood glaring at me. If anyone would know how he got poisoned by someone he trusted, it would be you, right? What are you saying, Castor? Violet shouted as my stomach fell. Both hands went to my middle, and I huffed out a breath as though he'd just slammed a fist into my belly. I'd never felt so sick in all my life. For my mate, the man I adored more than life itself, to question me so thoroughly about something like this made me heartsick beyond all belief. I, I, I stuttered, not knowing how to even respond to the accusation. The very thought of it hurt me to my core. I shook my head as I stared at him. My eyes went suddenly blurry with tears. I stood up on shaky legs, curling my hands into fists as I tried not to throw up. I swallowed hard, feeling bile churning in my stomach. My once worried mood of just a few minutes before suddenly morphed into something I couldn't recognize. I felt absolutely sick to my stomach. I loved this man so dearly, and for him to even question my loyalty to the king or my love for my father-in-law made my knees weak. I knew I was shaking all over, and somewhere in the background I could hear Violet protesting at her brother even as my gaze was held captive by my mate's hard stare. I thought I'd seen him angry before, but the hurt and betrayal and accusations I saw in his eyes were too much to take. I could feel tears burning behind my eyes, and without thinking, I reached out to Castor telepathically. When I came up against the block he'd put on his thoughts, my stomach rolled again. He wasn't going to let me in. Where has the trust and love he felt for me just moments ago suddenly gone? I began to feel faint and knew that I was going to lose it if I didn't get out of that room in a matter of seconds. I stumbled backward, feeling the couch hit the back of my calves as I broke eye contact with him. I couldn't look at him anymore. Seeing the pain and hurt and abject anger in his eyes was almost more than I could take. I stumbled as I turned and looked about the room, locating the door to the suite, as I felt my knees giving out. Instead, I forced one foot in front of the other as I made my way toward it, ignoring Violet's pleas for me to wait. Castor said nothing, and as I turned the knob and yanked the door open, letting in a burst of air from the hall, all I could think was that I had to go. He doesn't believe me. He thinks I did it. He thinks I've been poisoning the king. I have to leave this place and never come back. I stumbled away from the door, feeling it slam behind me as I headed down the hall, anxious to get out of the house and run as far away as I possibly could. Castor. What are you doing, you bloody idiot? Violet raged at me. I almost couldn't hear her, even though I was pretty sure the entire inn and all its residents could. I pointedly ignored her as I stared at the closed door to my father's suite and then turned toward the doctor. I'm sorry. You were saying something. The small doctor looked utterly uncomfortable, and if I had to guess, he was. I'm certain it wasn't every day that he witnessed me practically accusing my mate of being the person who'd been poisoning my father. I was saying that your father's liver is failing, but I won't know how badly until I do more tests. He reached down and tucked the tubes of blood inside the black leather doctor's suitcase he had brought with him to the suite. I'm going back to my office to get the tests started on these, and once I have the results, I'll be back. It'll take me about twenty-four hours. Until then, sire. He bowed to me, and I watched him scoot away from the couch as quickly as his short legs would take him toward the door. Violet followed, seeing him to the door and shutting it tight before she turned and looked at the two bodyguards who'd come with him from Tabriz. Leave us, 
she ordered, and the two guards looked toward me nervously. When I nodded, they both scrambled for the door, practically tripping over each other to see who could get out the door faster. It closed with a snick, and I turned toward Violet, only to note the twin daggers she was throwing me from her seething eyes. What on earth was that, you utter wanker? I bit my lip, trying not to smile. She slipped into British English, something I hadn't heard coming from her since we were children and our nanny had spoken to us in the same vernacular. Our tutors had practically beaten our knuckles bloody with a ruler to make us stop talking like we had just flown over from Liverpool. If I had to be honest, I'd missed hearing the old bat swear at us as though she were at a football match. Have you turned into Paul Hollywood? I drooled. Shut the fuck up, Caster. What was that total shit show all about? What shit show? I asked, knowing full well what she meant, and only glad a couch stood between us so she couldn't launch herself at me and punch me in the nose. You know exactly what I mean, Caster, she said, stomping around the couch and shaking her finger in my face. You practically accused Emery of poisoning Papa. What in the hell are you thinking? I lifted my chin and glared at her, trying to stare down my nose at her, but failing, since we were nearly the same height. I was thinking that no one had better opportunity to be close to him since he's been here, not to mention having been his senior valet when they were in Iran. Haven't you wondered why he hasn't given up being his valet, even though there are two others here in Prosper Woods? No, I haven't. He's mentioned the fact that he adores our father and loves serving him. He told us both that at dinner, when you were whining about it one night. And yet there are two others. Two others who are practically children, Caster. She fired back at me. In this is not to mention the fact that your mate wasn't his senior valet when he was in Iran. That was a man named Horace. Emery was his protege, you idiot. My certainty for having a reason to doubt my mate suddenly faltered. I didn't know that. But you do know that Emery reveres our father, and that he is madly, passionately in love with you, Castor. You do know that he is utterly and totally loyal to him and to you, although you don't deserve him in this moment. She looked at me with such a pain-filled gaze, it took my breath away. She stepped closer and took my hands, staring at me with a plea in her eyes. You can't believe that sweet, sweet man is actually capable of any harm at all to our father. You can't believe him capable. Right, Castor? I dragged my gaze away from hers, lowering it to our clasped hands as I felt my stomach do a turn. The very idea that I'd been completely fooled by Emery was one I simply couldn't get out of my mind for some reason. All those old memories I'd had about servants and the way most of them acted around the nobility at court back home in Iran came rushing back. They were such a poisonous bunch of salacious bastards who wanted one thing and one thing only, to simply collect as much gold as they could by worming their way into the lives of the aristocracy. I still found it fascinating that Emery hadn't been just like all the others, but then again, I remembered how he'd come to my bed as a virgin in both body and heart. I wondered if he'd somehow been able to fake that, and then I wanted to kick myself in the ass for believing something so horrible about my mate. I sighed loudly, dropping her hands and turning my back on her. Caster, you don't believe Emery capable of hurting our father, do you? He killed Teo to save your life. I whirled around and stared at her. He might have done that to stay in my good graces. Violet's jaw dropped open, and she stared at me. What? I waved her off, blocking her as she reached into my mind telepathically. Stop trying to read my mind, I shouted at her. Then stop being a fucking asshole, Caster, and tell me how you could possibly think that sweet man could hurt our father. And for fuck's sake, why would he do such a thing? What could it possibly gain him? 
You surely can't believe that he's somehow working for our enemies. The doctor said he's showing signs of having been poisoned for months. That means he started getting sick before you ever broke your engagement with Penelope McCurdy. And as far as I know, he's the only enemy Papa has at the moment. Damn. She had a good point. You're right. Of course, as always, you're completely right, Violet. I blew out a long breath and dropped back down onto the couch, knowing I was going to have to eat a lot of crow. I do hope you're hungry. I shot her a sideways glance, smirking just a little. Stop reading my fucking brain. She crossed both arms over her chest. Stop using it to think up stupid shit, Dean. I watched her turn and walk out, feeling terrible for having ever doubted my beloved mate. Son? I looked up to see the door opening, and my father is standing unsteadily just inside his bedroom. I sprang from the couch and ran over to him, taking hold of his arm as he swayed. Father, you must come and get back in bed. You're not well. He looked up at me with sad yellow eyes. Up this close, I got a strong whiff of the garlic smell Dr. Baker had mentioned. My stomach rolled as he swayed again. I lifted his arm and draped it gently over my shoulder before wrapping the other around his waist. Come now, and lie back down. I heard raised voices, and even if I hadn't, I'm still a werewolf, Caster. I know when something is being talked or thought about. I turned him and gently prodded him to walk toward the bed. His pajamas were drenched with sweat, and as we got to the bed, I saw the damp ring where he'd been lying. There was no scent of urine on the air, but the smell of sweat was pungent in the room. It perspired right down to the mattress. I aborted the walk to the bed and moved him over to an upholstered chair, easing him down into it and making sure he didn't need to be propped before telling him to stay put. I rushed out of the room and into the hallway, where I found the two bodyguards Violet had sent packing a few minutes before. Go get a couple of maids and tell them to grab some clean bedsheets and blankets, I said to one of them. You could just ring for them, sire, the guard called Bobbock said. There's a bell on the wall. I frowned. Or you could do as I asked. I turned on my heel and slammed the door as the insolent guard bowed, storming back into the room and locating the bell of which he spoke. I ran over and pulled the damn thing anyway. When someone came, I'd tell them to have Mrs. Douglas send someone up with tea. I wasn't used to navigating this proper etiquette bullshit. When I was hungry between meals and needed something, I usually saw to it myself. Before my father came, I preferred not to remember I was direwolf royalty at all. It was probably why I'd never explained who I was to my acquaintances in town. I hadn't wanted to boast that I was anything other than a normal werewolf when I'd first met Vincent, Roman, Greg. Looking back on it now, made me almost ashamed to say that I was the one intimidated. I hadn't wanted anyone to know in case they'd treated me differently. Once they'd become friends, I thought it too late to follow my sword and just admit the truth. But they had already worked it out without me saying anything. And when they'd all gathered in my parlor and pledged to support us in our war with the McCurdys, I'd truly felt the weight of my earlier omissions. I resolved that here in my own home, things would remain a constant. I wasn't going to treat the staff any differently than I always had. The last thing I wanted to deal with was having bowing and scraping going on when it was only Violet and I in the house. But ever since this whole betrothal mess began, things had become exponentially more complicated. I went back into the bedroom and poured a glass of water from the pitcher beside the bed, bringing it over to my father. He reached out with a shaking hand and took it from me as I squatted in front of him, looking up into his jaundiced face. Someone is coming to change your bed sheets, father. Do you want a bath? I'll help you. My father reached out and patted my cheek. Don't be silly, Caster. I'll have Violet help when she returns. He held up a bony hand when I opened my mouth to protest. Now, now, I will not have my son waiting on me like a common servant. We don't call them servants in America, Papa. 
We call them staff. He waved his hand in front of my face. Don't be silly. Now tell me what in the hell everyone was yelling about in here. Do I understand that you somehow doubt Emery's love for me? My eyes widened. When put like that, I felt like a complete asshole, just like Violet had said. I shook my head and stood to my full height, pacing away from him as I reached up and ran my fingers through my hair. I stopped my pacing and stood with my back to him for a minute before blowing out a long breath, pivoting and walking back to stand in front of him. I suddenly felt like a little boy again, called on the carpet to explain why I wasn't behaving as I was taught to do. No, I said finally. The word sounded lame even to me. I started again. The doctor said that you've been... that you... I trailed off, not knowing what, if anything, Doc Baker had told my father about him being poisoned. Assuming Emery was totally innocent, I wouldn't want the king doubting my mate. The moment the thought crossed my mind, all my concerns came to a sudden, screeching halt. I didn't want my father to think less of my mate. So why was I even contemplating the possibility that my sweet man could somehow be involved in such a horrible thing. That I've been poisoned? Yes, he told me, my father said, interrupting my thoughts. I had to stop and try to pull myself back into our conversation. But you don't think your beloved mate had anything to do with it, do you? No, Papa. I... Well, the doctor said you got sick about three months before you came so that means someone had to have access to your food and drink in Iran. He tucked his chin. Well, he said weakly, I always had my meals prepared, especially by my cook. Like your Mrs. Douglas, she's been with me for a couple of decades. I had tea brought up when I bathed, and it was presented to me by my valets. He waved his hand. I had twelve of them back home in Tabriz, you know. I didn't know, though I think I remembered Emery telling me he was only one of many who served my father as valet back home. But if it was my valet, then it would have been Horace who got the closest to me. Still, there's no way that man had a reason to poison me. He served me loyally for nearly sixty years. And he trained your young man, Castor. Besides that, Emery loves me and he loves you, so that should be enough for you. You're right. I scrubbed both hands over my face. I'm a horrible person. I looked back at my father. Absolute faith in Emery was present right there in his gaze. I sighed. I don't know what I'd been thinking if I had to be honest. He reached out and took hold of my hand, looking deeply into my eyes. You're not horrible. You're concerned, Castor, but please, don't be. We'll work out who's responsible for this. I trust that the truth will come out in due time. Meanwhile, Emery is the very last person you need to worry about. That boy loves me, as I've said. Yes, father. There was a knock at the door. I smiled at him as he let go of my hand. Let me get the maids in here to change your bed and get you some tea. He smiled at me. You're a good son, Castor. You're a very good boy. McCurdy's spy. I stayed in the shadows of the trees, waiting for the prince's mate to emerge. I kept my eyes on the back door of the inn, breathing slowly and as quietly as possible. I'd been waiting for the word that I was needed to come down the ranks for weeks. Little did the king know that our master had positioned several spies within his ranks here at the bed and breakfast, which had become his base of operations. Besides myself, loosely referred to as the assassin in McCurdy's ranks. There was one of us in the king's own contingent of bodyguards, one in the kitchens to make sure the king's tea was delivered to the proper valet, 
one among the maids, and more than likely, others I wasn't aware of. I didn't know all of them. That I'd been assured of the day I'd been sent to watch and wait for my chance to do what I did best. Unfortunately, Prince Cyrus, Castor they called him here in America, had surrounded his father with the best from his own ranks. Even the bodyguard McCurdy had on payroll hadn't yet been able to get the king alone long enough to finish him off. I wondered how Lord McCurdy planned on accomplishing the takeover of the first house with the king still alive and kicking, and Prince Castor healthy and hardy. I did know one thing. McCurdy had no plans on invading Prosper Woods and taking things to a battlefield. The Scottish lord had vowed to go to war to fight for the honor of the first house when Prince Castor had rejected Lady Penelope, but he had absolutely no intentions of doing so. My brother was on staff to the exchequer of the Grand Lord. Based on what he'd shared with me in confidence, McCurdy hadn't paid his armies in months. I knew for a fact that, though he boasted having a massive army at his beck and call, most of that was a complete lie. He had troops, but they were surly and undisciplined with low morale and worse morals. They were known to rampage through Edinburgh, taking what they wanted, including whatever females they desired. More than fifty accounts of assaults, including rape allegations, had been filed against them by the human authorities. Some were known to have revealed themselves as werewolves and drunken fits, breaking the cardinal rule of the supernatural not exposing our true nature to humans. They were generally out of their superior's control, and as a result, I'd heard that McCurdy was desperate to resolve this war in any other way than to have his reckless army fight. All of this made my mission more important. If I accomplished it, McCurdy would be vaulted into power, and the First House would be saved from destruction by a king who no longer looked after his own people, keeping the aristocracy pure. Instead, the McCurdy clan would see to it that our honor was restored, rescued from a weak king, his unsuitable gay heir, and the freakish chromosomal nightmare who he'd fathered. We were all convinced Lady Penelope would have been an answer to prayer, and yet Prince Castor had rejected her. Most of us still seethed at that terrible insult and the way her disgrace had reverberated across our clan. If not the entire werewolf kingdom. I remained hunkered down and out of sight until I was rewarded with what I'd come for. Prince Castor's mate stepped out of the house and nodded at the bodyguards who stood on either side of the back door. I watched him hug another werewolf and then turn and have a conversation with one of the guards. My hearing was sharp, but even I couldn't make out what was being said from this distance. Only a moment later, I watched Castor's mate take the other wolf's arm and stride toward the trees, several hundred yards off in the other direction, clearly headed out for a run. Good. I fought better in animal form. My wolf was big when shifted, and the prince's mate was small and slight. I hadn't seen him as a werewolf, but I knew he'd be small as he was in human form. I didn't know where they were headed, but I sprang into action, turning and running back into the woods, making my way in a circuitous route through the trees where I knew my path would intersect with the smaller werewolves. I had no doubt the two wouldn't be expecting me. The bodyguard faithful to McCurdy had been right to call me. The opportunity I'd been waiting for was here. It was time to grab Emery and put an end to Howard Sade's reign forever. Chapter 5 Prosper Woods Chronicle All the Advice Fit to Print Dear Crabby, As I was standing in line waiting to pick up my elderly mother's medication from the pharmacist, I wondered why we let them live so long. I mean, there should be a discard date on them when they get to a certain age. All of these new-fangled medications that let them live longer than ever before should mean that there's a time when we can legally put them out to pasture. Signed, Endlessly Caring for the Aged Dear Endlessly Caring for the Aged, Krabby is ashamed to admit that, yes, I believe there comes a time when we must put those suckers down. 
I suppose there are legal things to take into consideration, including how their families and co-workers would feel about losing one of their own, especially since some of the less obnoxious ones seem to be named Employee of the Month regularly. But yes, in theory, I think many pharmacists live way past their sell-by date, and there should be something we can legally do to address this. Respectfully, Krabby. Emery. The crushing reality of what Castor had said to me hadn't really sunk in for a few seconds. All I'd done was stare at my mate with my mouth agape as I was rendered speechless. I knew one thing. I needed to get out of the king's suite before I threw up the contents of my stomach. Even now, as I stood outside the back door of the house, gulping in great breaths of the fresh pine-scented air, I felt faint. Back inside, Castor had blocked his thoughts, making sure I didn't know exactly what he was thinking about me. It was hard to know if he'd only been asking me a rhetorical question or honestly wanted to know if I'd gotten close enough to the king just so I could kill him. I remembered one thing of the last several minutes. I'd looked up at my mate, the man I loved more than anyone on earth, and blinked, needing to get away from him, an emotion I hadn't felt since the morning after he'd rolled me onto his sheets in a drunken haze. I lifted my face to the air and took another deep breath, trying to pick up a scent on the wind, one I'd shamefully ignored too often since falling into bed with my mate. I hadn't seen Claudio today, or yesterday for that matter. Before coming to Prosper Woods, we'd been practically inseparable, having labored side by side in Tabriz from the time we'd both come to work in the King's service. Since coming here and finding my mate, we'd lived very different lifestyles. Claudio had stayed on with the king's entourage, while various others returned to Iran to help pack up his things and prepare to move his household to the States on a permanent basis. Claudio's status had been elevated to the top tier of servants, and he was now second only to Mrs. Holmes in the king's service. The old housekeeper had taken his elevation in stride. She'd said nothing and made her subtle displeasure known only by giving him a long list of those he now oversaw, and impressing upon him that it would only be good form to get to know them all on a first-name basis. I remember secretly laughing at her artful revenge, thinking how perfect it was, since it was his insistence that he retain his servant status rather than accept the cottage and allowance which Castor had offered him. He always was a stubborn one. I hadn't expected anything less from my best friend. He was a hard worker, but his reasoning that he'd become fat from under use of his impressive muscles if he gave up his daily routine of servitude was laughable. Secretly, I believed he'd stayed in his position to remain close to me to make sure things worked out with Castor. Well, I thought he might just earn high points for those fears after what happened today. My heart skipped a beat when I suddenly heard my name called. I let out a gasp as I clamped my hand to my chest to calm the rapid tattoo of my heart. Turning my head, I spotted him strolling across the lawn as I picked up his scent at the same time. Claudia was dressed in casual jeans, a t-shirt, and running shoes. It was only at that moment that I realized it had to be his day off. Not being on the same schedule anymore or housed in tightly packed servants' quarters, I hadn't kept track of when he was on or off duty. Clearly, he wasn't working today. I blew out a relieved breath as he walked up to me, frowning darkly. What's wrong? I ran down the back porch steps and launched myself at him, hugging him tightly as I felt a sob rise in my chest. He hugged me back before setting me back on my heels and staring into my eyes, still holding onto my biceps. His dark eyes were swirling with worry, and I couldn't blame him. We'd always been able to sense each other's emotions, and I knew my pain leaked from every pore in my body. Let's run, I said. I need to run, Claudio. Of course. I turned to look at Owen, one of the bodyguards who had accompanied us with the king's entourage from Tabriz. He'd been on the king's security staff for ages, longer than I'd been at the castle. We're going for a run, Owen, and we need privacy. Privacy, Emery? You know how Prince Castor feels about that. His mandate is that at least one bodyguard remain with you, even on runs. I looked at him with pleading eyes. Please, Owen, I need to talk to Claudio alone, and you know how it is in this place. If we didn't have such sharp hearing, the two of us could sit on that bench over there and not worry about being overheard. At least in our wolf forms, we'll be able to communicate with each other and block out all others. 
I looked up at the sky, noting the way the sun hadn't completely vanished for the day. It was just the side of late afternoon. Owen took a deep breath and blew it out slowly. Fine, you can go, but let me come too. I'll hang back and give you as much privacy as you need, Emery. I wasn't going to dissuade him from this. I knew my request was futile. There were rules for times like this when I and others might put ourselves in danger, so I supposed I had to be grateful that at least he promised to hang back. I could have a relatively safe conversation with Claudio, even with Owen following. Besides, I wasn't going to confess state secrets or battle plans, since I knew none of those. I didn't feel the least bit slighted in that regard. From the time we knew we were going to war, Castor had insisted upon keeping me in the dark. It wasn't because he didn't trust me or think me any less of a partner. I knew he wanted me out of political affairs for my own good. He had a thing about courtly ways and gossip and keeping our personal lives out of the public forum. Conversely, he wanted me out of political affairs and war planning. I'd secretly thought that, though he trusted me completely, he didn't want me worried. He was always kind and considerate of my feelings, wanting to keep me innocent and insulated from the violence McCurdy had sworn to bring to Prosper Woods. I trusted him completely, but it seems that was no longer returned to me from him. So my purpose for this run was to pour my heart out to my best friend and probably listen to him tell me I was overreacting for being this upset by the questions Castor had asked. Fine, Owen, you can come, but you must stay back. I really need to have a few private words with Claudio. Noted, Owen said, smiling. He held out a hand. Go on, I'll follow. Thank you. I stepped off the porch with Claudio at my side and headed toward the forest. We jogged deep inside the tree line, at least three hundred yards. When we did shift, the last thing we wanted to do was expose ourselves to any humans on staff at the bed and breakfast, aside from the fact that my mate would be furious if I was somehow inadvertently responsible for exposing my true nature. The last thing I wanted to do was antagonize him any more than he already was this afternoon. We stopped deep into the forest and took off our clothes, shifting to our wolf forms before saying a word to each other. What happened? I heard one of the guards saying the Prince Castor was angry with you, Claudio said telepathically. I glanced at him and then behind us, spotting Owen standing at least a hundred yards off, already in his werewolf form, before looking back at Claudio. I wasn't sure if Owen would be able to hear us speaking telepathically or not. I didn't want him overhearing personal exchanges with my best friend. I canted my head to indicate my intended direction, saying nothing telepathically, and began running. The dappled sunshine coming through the trees seemed to light up the forest, though darker than it was in full daylight, the way the muted rays fell on a multitude of leaves and the path before us was like seeing our route sprinkled with fairy dust as the sunshine cast flickering light on the forest floor. The first time I'd run in these woods, I'd marveled at their beauty. From that first night, stumbling on to the midnight game of Twister played by men I now called friends, to the way Claudio and I had discovered the waterfall, which was more beautiful than I could put into words. I'd loved this place. We were more than five hundred yards deeper in the woods before I finally slowed down and glanced over at my best friend who'd been loping a pace beside me. You must have the best place spies in the inn, I said telepathically, for the word to get out that Castor was upset with me so soon after our argument transpired must mean you have the ear of everyone in the place. Claudio opened his mouth and let his tongue loll out of his grinning jaws. I do have the dick of everyone in the place. I barked in laughter. The first time I'd laughed all day, come to think of it. So you've managed to fuck them all? Even the straight ones? Claudio laughed in my head. Have you forgotten we are werewolves and how great my arse smells, Emery? I rolled my eyes, slowing down to a stop. Honestly, the last thing I'm thinking about is the smell of your bottom. Still, I must hand it to you. The way you end up with a network of men ready and willing to pass on gossip is damned impressive. I suppose I should be jealous. Right. Be jealous, he sobered. Now get serious, he said. What happened? Do I have to kill him for you? I frowned at him and looked over my shoulder where Owen had stopped a hundred yards back. He was sitting back on his haunches, waiting for us to continue our run. I stood up and started walking briskly, and Claudio ran to catch up, shoulder-checking me as he came up beside me. I glanced over at him. 
don't say things like that, even telepathically. You never know who might be listening. Then tell me what happened and don't leave out any of the details, Em. I sighed, continuing at my pace as I told him everything that had happened with the king, the doctor's exam, and what Castor had asked me afterward, including the way he had practically accused me of poisoning the king due to how close I was to him all the time. In the retelling, even telepathically, I still felt sick. I didn't know what to do with the look he threw me when I'd finally finished and stopped walking. It was filled with so much outrage, as was his sin. I was floored by it. How can he think that of you, Emery? Claudia was shaking with fury as he paced in a circle around me. I watched him stop in front of me and look up at the sky, which had gone very dark with twilight as the sun had finally set. I followed his gaze up to the moon. It was early May, and it was beautiful. As werewolves, we were always drawn to the moon, but May had a special meaning to me. Legend called May the month of the flower moon because of the many wildflowers which bloomed in the northern hemisphere. Many kinds of bluebells, sundrops, indigo, wild garlic, anemone, violets, and lupine, often called the wolf flower and named after our race, bloomed in May. The moon had never looked any different to me. I just always loved the legend which had lived up to reality when winter had passed, ushering in the spring months shortly after my arrival in Prosper Woods. Claudio, I said, glancing back up at him, noting the furred lines of his beautiful throat. He was a gorgeous wolf, almost as pretty in werewolf form as he was as a human. No wonder everyone and their brother wanted to sink inside his beautiful body. I sincerely hoped he'd find his own mate some day, regardless of the fact that he'd professed happiness in being a bachelor forever. He glanced back down at me as I continued. Castor had every right to ask those questions of me. He wanted to know how things worked, and his questions came out blunter than he meant. That didn't mean they hadn't hurt like hell. I honestly think he wasn't prepared for the doctor to tell him his father had been poisoned. I just wish I knew who would be evil enough to do that to him. And still you defend him, Emery, Claudio practically growled. Doesn't he deserve my loyalty? He is my love, Claudio, my destiny. Mother Nature made me just for him, and I know he loves me. He just asked his questions in the wrong way. He was shocked, and I know he's in pain. It was all over his scent when Doc Baker gave him the news, Claudio. He's simply casting about for answers. Any answers. I don't think he actually believes I'm responsible for poisoning the king, not for one minute. I looked back up, noting the dark sky through the trees and the moon, which was invisible now due to the dark clouds drifting across it. I looked back at Owen, who hadn't strayed from the spot where he'd most likely grown roots. We need to get back. I hadn't meant to stay out this long, and if Castor had come looking for me, the hairs suddenly stood up on my back as an unfamiliar scent drifted toward me on the breeze. I looked at Claudio, who was glaring at me with bright yellow werewolf eyes in the darkness of the forest. He lifted his muzzle to the air and suddenly stood, clearly picking up the scent as well. Who's there? I called out telepathically. I was answered only a second later, when a huge black wolf tore through a break in the trees and hit me, slamming me to the ground and knocking the wind right out of me. Before I could catch my breath, I heard a loud yelp, which cut off abruptly as Claudio's body landed on top of me. Claudio! I screamed telepathically. When there was no response, I called out for Owen and heard him call back. Coming, Master Emery. His reply was too late, because Claudio's body was just as suddenly ripped off me and tossed ten feet into the air as massive jaws clamped down on my shoulder. I howled in pain and went suddenly limp as I was tossed into the air by my much larger and stronger attacker, coming down close beside Claudio's body in a heap. I felt the breath whoosh out of my lungs as snarls rose from close beside me. I blinked, grappling with sanity for a brief second before realizing that Owen was close beside us, rolling on the ground with an enormous black werewolf. The two were a snarling blur and even though it would be dangerous to try to intervene and break the pair apart, I knew I had to do something. I stood up, preparing to jump in, when I felt my world suddenly tilt to the side as dizziness slammed into me. I fought to stay conscious, listening to the snarls of werewolves involved in a fight to the death, and cursed myself as I lost my grip on all conscious thought, 
drifting away as if in a dream, a second before my eyes rolled back in my head. Castor. I sensed something was wrong the minute I stepped out the door at the back of the inn. Emery's scent was strong here. I knew the moment I left my father's suite. He'd probably gone out to run off the pain written all over his features when I'd said what I'd said to him. I was still kicking myself for insinuating something so ridiculous. I should have known better, and honestly, I don't know why I'd ask the questions at all. Thomas, one of our bodyguards, bowed to me the moment the screen door slammed behind me. Have you seen my mate? Yes, sire. He went for a run about forty minutes ago. My heart rate sped up. Not alone, right? No, Highness, he was accompanied by the servant Claudio, as well as Owen. I let out a breath of relief, knowing that at least Emery had obeyed my most important rule about his safety. He'd taken a guard with him. Until he was in my arms, though, I wouldn't be comfortable. Bring another, and follow me. We're going to catch up to them. I glanced up at the night sky, noting the way the clouds passed by the moon darkening the sky even more, and felt a deep dread, even as I heard Thomas calling for a second bodyguard. The two of them followed me, as we set off toward the trees in the direction he indicated, and within moments we were shedding clothes and shifting. Bones popped and muscles stretched as I shifted, something I'd done a million times before. I put my nose to the ground and picked up Emery's scent and began running, the others following close at my heels. Thomas and James were both large like me, and though they weren't dire wolves, they'd been selected for their speed, agility, and fighting prowess. Both had been hand-picked and well-trained by Nima Shirazi, so I knew I was in good company with the bodyguards at my side. We ran deep into the woods, coming to a cautious halt only when I picked up a scent that sent a ripple of terror down my spine. Blood. I took only a second to glance at the two wolves with me before taking off in a headlong run toward the smell, coming to a skidding halt when I spotted a bloody lump straight ahead. My sharp werewolf senses immediately identified the man as Owen, one of our bodyguards, and the very sight of him lying dead, shifted back into his human form on the forest floor in a puddle of his own blood, made me panic. Claudio, in werewolf form, lay fifteen feet from him, and I ran to him, dropping my muzzle and inhaling deeply, grateful as hell to hear his breathing. I lifted my head and looked all around, heart-sick as I realized that Emery was nowhere nearby. I dropped my muzzle to Claudio's face and prodded him, reaching out to lick him until he moaned and opened one yellow eye. It widened in surprise the moment he recognized me. I watched him lift his head, and I stepped back as he let out a low, keening growl, as if he was in pain. I took another deep breath and caught the copper scent of Claudio's blood as he rolled over and pushed himself up to all four poles. He turned his head to look back at his side, and I noticed an area where deep gouges had been carved into his flank. Dead leaves clung to the blood which congealed over the rapidly closing wound. It was a sickening sight. I shifted and got down on one knee in an instant, putting out both hands to turn his head toward me. Shift and shift back. It'll speed your healing, Claudio. I ordered, sounding like a sovereign, not prepared to accept no for an answer. Claudio shifted, and I frowned as I saw the four deep claw marks that had been dragged across his muscled hip. They were bright red and oozing blood. Again! He did as I commanded, shifting back to his werewolf form. As a common wolf, his shift wasn't as rapid as mine or even Emery's, but I watched him do as he was told two more times before he finally stood healed before me in human form. What happened? I demanded, not wanting to waste a single second with spare words. Where's Emery? Claudio bowed his head, staring at the ground. We'd come out for a run with Owen following. He turned to look at my dead bodyguard, and I reached out, grabbing him by both shoulders. His head instantly swiveled back to look at me as I shook him. Pay attention. I'm sorry, Prince Castor. We were attacked by a huge wolf, and not a dire wolf, Highness, but he was huge, like your guards. He canted his head at Thomas and James, who towered over him in werewolf form. He was all black. 
I've never smelled his scent before, Highness. I know he isn't one of ours. I knew Claudio was well known to the men around the inn. Emery joked more than once that if he hadn't gotten to me first, Claudio would have worked his way into my bed eventually. He was well known as a player. Even in werewolf circles the man had been around. There was no doubt in my mind that Emery had been taken by one of McCurdy's men. I also knew the only way he could have kidnapped him meant he was much, much larger. Unless Emery was dead, he would still be in wolf form, and whoever had him was dragging a fully grown werewolf away all alone. Emity was strong. I looked for signs of their path and spotted drag marks on the ground. Emery's attacker would be much slower than I'd be, but he also had a huge head start on me. I turned to Claudio. Go back and tell my guards what happened here. I want every one you can gather out looking for Emery. Have Clyde start to search on a grid pattern from where this trail ends. I have a feeling his attacker has a vehicle somewhere out here, maybe an ATV or something small within a few miles. When Claudio went to move away, I stopped him, tightening my hand on his bicep. Have someone contact Greg Brown. I need any Frederick Pack wolves he can spare. They know these woods better than any of us. Understand? Yes, sire. Claudio bowed deeply and then changed right before my eyes, spinning around and tearing off back toward the bed and breakfast as fast as all four legs would take him. I watched only a second before turning my attention back to the trail the strange wolf left behind, a trail marred by the bloody scent of my most beloved and helpless mate. Emery I came slowly awake, swaying to the unmistakable rhythm of water. The motion only served to make my stomach lurch. Before I was fully conscious, the urge to throw up was nearly overwhelming. I blinked, trying to focus my eyes several times before I realized I was blindfolded. Someone had tied something around my head. I was in human form and shackled at the feet and ankles. When I tried to move my hands, I realized with a hiss of pain that the shackles rubbed against my naked skin and I was burning. Silver! The bastard had chained me using silver! Even in human form, silver burnt a werewolf's flesh, and as I dropped my hands back to the bottom of the boat where they'd been lying when I first came awake, the lightest rub of the shackles against my raw flesh simply took my breath away. The scent of my burnt flesh only exacerbated the nausea which was now a part of me. The urge to throw up was so strong I was forced to roll over to all fours and pant. You disgusting animal, if you throw up in my boat, I'll kill you right now. I ain't cleaning up no dog barf. I grunted in agony as a sharp boot connected with my naked flesh. I gagged. A moment later, strong hands had taken both my arms, and I was being dragged across the bottom of what I realized had to be a barge of some sort. There was no sound of a motor, and I could hear someone pulling something out of the water and then pushing it back in. Someone was more than likely rowing or propelling the barge using a pole if the water was shallow enough. I wondered immediately where I was, but before I could form a coherent thought, I was half-dropped over the side of the boat. The smooth wood slammed into my midsection, forcing a flood of vomit out of me as I retched pitifully over the side. I'd no sooner emptied the contents of my stomach than I was yanked back by both arms. Only then did I realize there were two men one on either side of me, each holding me by one arm and dragging me back along the boat's floorboards before being summarily tossed onto the bottom of the boat, where I landed on my back with a grunt. I let out an involuntary whimper and lay there looking upward, unable to see the moon, anxious to see anything beyond the confines of the blindfold. Only a moment later, I sucked in a ragged breath, coming fully awake when my tormentor's boot returned and connected with the opposite side of my ribcage. I yanked my hands sideways and upward in an attempt to bat the boot away and protect my face, only to realize that both wrist shackles were connected by a short length of chain to a matching pair on my ankles. They rattled, and my flesh hissed, sending lancing pain up both arms and leaving the scent of hissing burnt flesh. Caster, Caster, I called out telepathically, only to get no response back. In my mind, I knew he couldn't hear me. The silver prevented it, and yet my instinct to reach out to my mate had never been stronger. I felt 
anguish wash over me, not knowing what these men wanted from me, and at the same time knowing what the inevitable outcome of this abuse would lead to, I only prayed that they'd leave enough of me for Castor to find. I prayed my mate would find a way to move on after he mourned, and not become an all-too-common statistic, a wolf who chose to die rather than live without his fated love. I bit my lower lip, chastising myself for letting such morbid thoughts consume me. I realized I had to be smarter than these men. I knew the only way I was going to survive this ordeal was to remain cooperative. My werewolf strength, normally more potent than the strongest humans, had been depleted by the silver, the beating, and the loss of blood from my shoulder wound inflicted by my earlier werewolf attacker. I wondered where he'd disappeared to. The werewolf wasn't with these three distinct humans, and I wondered why. Had he simply finished his part of the task? I began to think he had delivered me to them so they could take me somewhere to kill me in private. Now that seems stupid. The werewolf could have just as easily killed me the way he probably killed Owen and Claudio. My heart twisted in my chest and tears sprang to my eyes, wetting the blindfold as I thought of my beloved best friend lying unconscious, broken, and bleeding on the ground. The two men moved to the bow of the boat, joining their companion fifteen feet away or so from me, judging from their voices. I wondered where we were. I knew there was a large lake in Prosper Woods, different from the pond where we'd found the waterfall the first time I'd ever seen Oliver. I hadn't seen the lake which people talked about, even though I'd been here three months. I'd been busy with Castor, adjusting to my new life far from the only home I'd ever known. There was a river as well as what the locals call a stream, a much smaller version of any river I'd ever seen. I wanted to ask my captors where we were headed, but getting another boot in the side wasn't my idea of fun. Man, I had a pretty good idea that these guys liked handing them out liberally. There's Dutchie's Bridge, I heard one of the humans say. Shh, he'll hear you. McCurdy told me he pays us to keep our mouths shut. Don't matter, the first man said. We don't have to worry about him opening his mouth. He's one dead animal at the end of this. <laughs> All three men laughed. See the dock hidden by those trees? We'll tie up over there. Can't be seen by no cars going across the bridge. Okay. I swallowed hard. The fact that I'd been right in thinking these men worked for McCurdy didn't give me any comfort at all. I couldn't discount the words these humans said. I knew whatever Alistair McCurdy planned for me would eventually end with my death. I just hoped and prayed Castor wouldn't put his own life at risk trying to rescue me. I had a sinking feeling McCurdy's reason for having these men take me had everything to do with drawing my mate out into the open where he was completely vulnerable. I also knew that was exactly what Castor would do if he thought there was even the slightest chance of saving me. I felt the boat slow as they pulled up to what had to be the dock one of the humans mentioned. As soon as the motion stopped, I heard the gentle lap of waves on a nearby riverbank. The boat dipped once, and then I heard booted feet hitting wood. I knew one of my captors had climbed out. I cursed the fact that I was chained with silver. Clearly these humans had been schooled by whoever hired them, breaking every rule in the book. Humans were never to be told about the paranormal, much less about werewolves. But these men knew exactly what I was. They also knew the only way to keep me from shifting and tearing their heads off was to keep me restrained this way. A second later, the boots returned, and I was once again being dragged across the bottom of the boat by the other two men. When we got to the bow, a filthy, stinking sack was pulled over my head before they hauled me out of the boat. My wrists were raw. They hissed and smoked with every movement I was forced to endure. I gasped in pain when I was dropped onto the dock on my side. A groan rolled out of me before I could stop it. When the pointed toe of a boot landed in my solar plexus, all the wind was knocked out of me. Just a moment passed before one of them spoke. You keep doing that and he's going to bleed internally. McCurdy needs him alive, so knock it the fuck off. I heard a tussle and knew my abuser had stumbled backward. I heard a long litany of curses under his breath. Clearly the man was a coward and subservient to the stronger male. I didn't care. I wanted to get away. But the silver completely ended any possibility of that. I was going to die at the hands of these men. 
and I'd never see my beloved Castor ever again. Chapter 6 Prosper Woods Chronicle All the Advice Fit to Print Dear Krabby, I went to get my teeth cleaned, and, though I love my dentist, his dental hygienist is a terror. My dentist insists that she stand on the other side of me to take dictation while he does his exam. The thing I've noticed, along with her high-pitched voice, is the way her breath smells. It's awful. Personally, I think a dental hygienist should have the best breath in town simply by virtue of her job. What should I do? I don't want to go to a new dentist. This one does a great job. Sign, Her Mouth Smells Like Butthole. Dear Her Mouth Smells Like Butthole, I must start off by saying that there is nothing worse than sitting back in a chair and smelling bad breath directed in your face. That said, I am not surprised that Her Mouth Smells Like Butthole, especially since he's making her take dictation right over a patient, even though I find it impressive that the man is clearly limber enough to dictate while giving you a dental exam. I think that should be done in private. Besides being completely unsanitary, he's opening himself up to all sorts of sexual harassment charges. Still, her breath probably can't be helped, especially if he's going hard at the dictation. I'd get a new dentist. Respectfully, Krabby. Castor. James Thomas and I put our muzzles to the ground and picked up Emery's scent. We ran through the forest for a mile and a half before coming to a halt when we suddenly picked up the scent of three humans. The smell of motor oil hung in the air, mixed with exhaust, and I focused on what I was seeing on the ground, turning in circles as I put pieces together. Three sets of footprints, then five, two sets of pole prints, and two sets of tire tracks, one heavier than the other, were easy enough to see with eyes made to see in the dark. I felt a lump form in the back of my throat as I realized I'd been right. Emery had been taken away from me with an ATV, transportation which was a favorite of poachers in these woods. Greg told me that he and the Frederick Pack had dealt with poachers many times before, bringing Rome on board to help chase them away from the young wolves who roamed Prosper Woods and were favorite targets of bad men. I'd expected the werewolf who took my mate to have an all-terrain vehicle of some sort— but I hadn't anticipated the involvement of humans. They'd most likely be armed to the teeth with silver bullets, and the very thought of it terrified me. I looked hard at both of my companions and spoke to them telepathically. I'm going to follow these ATV tracks, but we're dealing with humans. Sheriff Rome Harmon isn't going to like me killing humans, which I fully intend to do when I catch up to them. I want you to know you're welcome to follow me, but you have the option of stopping here and now. The last thing I want is for you to feel the sheriff's wrath or the repercussions of killing humans. I won't think any less of you if you decide to turn around and go back. Both wolves bowed their heads, nearly touching the ground before looking back up at me. I'm with you, sire, James said. All the way to hell and back. I felt my heart twist. I swallowed hard. Immediately after, my other bodyguard replied, nodding his huge brown head. My feelings are the same, Prince Castor. Nothing would make me happier than killing men who would take the mate of our sovereign lord. Gratitude flooded me. I nodded, feeling the lump in my throat as it prevented me from saying anything. Let's go, I whispered. I turned and took off in the direction the tracks went. We ran for several miles before I picked up the scent of water running freely. A moment later... We burst out of the trees to a sandy beach with a wide river in front of us. Two ATVs were parked at the bank of the river closest to us, and I looked side to side, checking to make sure we were alone as I walked toward the ATVs. I could make out the tracks of a massive wolf and recognized his scent as the same one who'd attacked Emery, Claudio, and Owen. I swallowed again as another scent assaulted my nostrils, stronger than all the others. The smell of Emery's blood made my stomach turn. Fortunately, I couldn't detect a large quantity of it. I walked over and located the rust-colored smear on one of the ATV seats, then let the scene in front of me tell the story of what happened here. My mate had been tossed over the seat while in human form, and then somehow restrained. 
The only thing I could think was that silver chains had to be restraining my beloved. Nothing else would have forced him to shift to human and kept him weak, unable to call out to me telepathically. Emery, I called out telepathically. I'd done the same thing a hundred times as I'd chased him and his attackers through the forest. I thought he might be unconscious, which is why he hadn't answered. But I suddenly realized there might be another reason. I remembered Greg recounting how he'd called out to Sam when his leg had been caught in a silver-laced trap. Clearly there hadn't been enough silver to mute his telepathy entirely. What Emery was being made to endure had to be worse. I could only imagine the pain he must be in if silver chains were rubbing against his bare flesh. It'd be burning holes in my mate's body. I forced myself not to think the worst, even though it was very possible Emery was already dead. I glanced up at the river itself, noting how it moved slowly and silently, calculating how quickly someone would have been able to take Emery away on a boat. The way moonlight reflected off the water made flickering light dance over the waves in bright star-like bursts. Any other time I would have stopped to marvel at the beauty of the moon on the waves, the way they rippled as the water hit rocks causing eddies on the surface. It was truly breathtaking. I looked up across the water and noted the presence of a paved two-lane bridge. I was familiar with it. The bridge connected Frederick, which bordered Prosper Woods, to the town called Silver Springs Village, outside of Pack Territory. Violet and I had once participated in a battle with a rogue werewolf pack, as well as evil vampires, on the banks of this very river in support of Vincent Lasco and his mate, Rome Harmon. As I stood there, staring at the bridge, my sharp ears perked up, and I whipped my head around at the same time my two men did. Several werewolves suddenly bounded out of the trees and onto the banks of the river. Thomas and James lowered their heads and bared their fangs, letting out low growls. I stayed perfectly still, feeling my racing pulse skip a beat, and then slow down as I recognized the wolves. Greg. Sam. I said telepathically. I glanced to my men, who lifted their eyes to me as they straightened and quieted. It's okay. They're friends. This is a Frederick Pack Alpha and his mate, I told my men. Their growling stopped instantly, and I broke eye contact with them, turning back to Greg. He had brought six wolves in addition to his mate. Thank you for coming. Emery's been taken. Greg narrowed his yellow eyes as he seemed to take in the scene on the beach. I watched his nostrils flare as mine had when he picked up the scent of humans and motor oil from the ATVs, standing silent and still radiating warmth nearby. They've taken Emery. But why? Greg asked. I couldn't answer that accurately, but I was willing to venture a guess. I think they're working for McCurdy. I believe they kidnapped him to get leverage in this coming war. There was at least one wolf who attacked Emery, one of my guards, and one of the wolves who's loyal to my father. He's a friend of Emery's, and thankfully his life was spared for some reason. My guard was killed, though. Some wolf tore his throat out. I bared my fangs, furious that someone good and loyal to us had been taken so senselessly. I silently vowed to honor Owen with a ceremonial pyre, and prayed that I wouldn't be forced to erect many more of those in the near future. He'd no doubt sacrificed his own life to save Emery's, but his loss still stung terribly. None of us recognized his attacker's scent, so he has to be a spy, I concluded. And he was working with these humans, the humans who drove the ATVs? Sam asked. Yes, I swallowed hard. I can smell Emery's blood. I believe the wolf who attacked them turned Emery over to the humans who took him away by boat in silver chains. Silver chains, huh? Greg said, turning to exchange a glance with Sam, clearly remembering the day he'd been running in the forest and stumbled into a bear trap laced with liquid silver. He would have died had Vincent not been there to bleed into his wound and speed Greg's own rapid healing. Where does the river go? I asked still not as familiar with Prosper Woods and its surroundings as I should be. Provided Emery and I will survive this fucking war, I promise myself to get to know everything I could about the town. I swallowed again, turning all my attention to Greg. 
It's pretty long, he said. Sam coughed, glancing at his mate. I noticed that Greg gave him a barely noticeable nod before Sam continued telepathically. Running southwest, it'll dump out into several small tributaries and streams that collect in the San Joaquin River Delta and eventually dump into the ocean downstate via the California Aqueduct, he explained. I nodded. If you were to guess, where would they have taken Emery, and why use the river? I thought I knew the answer to that, but I wanted it confirmed. They'd use the river so you and your men would lose their scent, of course, Greg told me telepathically. He coughed a little the way Sam had. Your Highness. Castor, I ordered him as I began to pace. I felt bereft. If I lost Emery, and he got into McCurdy's clutches, the Scot would have no reason to keep my mate alive after he finished getting whatever concessions he wanted from me. At this point I'd do anything to save my mate, and I was pretty sure everyone knew it. Emery wasn't just my fated mate, he was my love— and I'd give away my father's and my entire kingdom to get him back. I thought of my poor dear father, lying in his sweating bed back at the inn. He'd been so frail, looking weak with a failing liver, barely more than skin and bones, ravaged by the poison someone had been dosing him with for months. I lifted my muzzle to the moon, opened my jaws, and howled. Almost instantly, my two companions also began to howl out their rage, picking up on my pain and frustration, though I hadn't said a thing. Greg, Sam, and his Frederick Pack wolves also howled. When I'd finally finished my demonstration of temper, I lowered my head and looked at Greg and Sam. Their yellow eyes blazed in the darkness, and I suddenly felt so grateful they were standing here with me, comforted to know... They were here to help, even if none of us knew how to find Emery. My eyes turned to the forest when I picked up a scent I didn't recognize. Instantly on guard, I noted the way Greg and Sam didn't flinch when a huge black wolf came charging out of the forest. His eyes blazed in the darkness. I watched him stop and put out a huge front paw, bowing all the way to the ground and touching his forehead to the sand before lifting up again. I acknowledged his reverence for my station with a tiny bow of my head. I had no idea who he was, but apparently he knew me. This is Terry Freeman, sire, Greg spoke into my brain. He's one of Rome Harmon's champions. Champions? I had to think for a few seconds. As I realized what he was talking about, I frowned, staring at the enormous stranger. You're a werewolf. How is it possible that you work for the Unicorn King? I accepted the post after the head of King Harmon's champions was killed in the final battle. A huge black wolf told me telepathically. Rome had lost the head of his champions, a supernatural version of unicorn protectors similar to Prince Hannibal's guardians, during the final battle between good and evil, months before my betrothal to Lady Penelope. I remembered my surprise at the revelation that there even were unicorns, a form of supernatural shifter I'd thought to be a myth before meeting Rome Harmon. But more than that, some mutant form of them called a champion also existed. The seven remaining champions were massive midnight blue eunuchs in human form. The first time I'd ever seen them, I'd thought back to depictions of Anubis, the black Egyptian god of death. In human form, they carried thick staffs with battle-axes on top and wore loincloths to cover, I wasn't sure what, since part of them was missing. In shifted form, they were black-winged unicorns with nightmarish glowing orange eyes that had freaked me out the first time I'd seen them. They were not only capable of flight, but also blue fire like dragons. I hadn't realized a werewolf had become one of their number, though he clearly had. I certainly wasn't about to ask how seriously he'd taken to his new job or check to see if he was still in possession of his bowls. His presence here said volumes. What are you doing here, Wolf? I asked. Freeman bowed again. I understand you might need help in locating your mate who has been taken by humans, sire, the large black wolf replied. The champions can help you with that. How did you know? It had to be the alarm Claudio sounded, but I needed to be certain. Claudio sent for him at the same time he called for us, Greg answered. 
I thought since the champions are airborne, <laughs> they can help. He pointed up. I craned my neck looking up and was shocked to my poles to see seven black unicorns flying in a lazy circle two hundred yards above us. One blew fire, and I realized how fortunate I was to have these magnificent creatures on my side. I'd never seen anything like them before, and had I been in human form I might have crossed myself simply for dramatic effect. Sheet, I said, looking back down at Terry. Can you... can you ask them to land? I'd like to talk to them. The werewolf nodded and shifted. His shift from werewolf to human was one of the fastest I'd ever witnessed, and my mouth gaped open as I drank in the features of the man now standing before me. He was very tall in human form, flawlessly muscled with deep, dark skin, which was as smooth as butter. He wore a brown silken cord around his neck that I hadn't noticed when it had been embedded in his black fur. He reached over her shoulder, grasping something, and bringing it around to hang on the cord in front of his chest. I realized I was looking at a twisted semicircular horn of some sort as he lifted it to his lips. When he blew it long and loud, the sound came out as a deep bass note which echoed in the night. I wasn't surprised to see the champions stop their slow circular turning and head downward, using their wings to slowly propel their heavy bodies. They settled on the bank of the river with the flap of their powerful wings. I shifted, as did my men, Greg, Sam, and the other werewolves from their pack. Moments later, we all stood there as men. Terry held out his hand as he spoke to the huge indigo men. Uh, King Rome wishes me to tell you that he wants us to give Prince Castor whatever help we can offer to bring his mate home. Terry began. Emery was kidnapped by humans and taken down river by boat. One of the men stepped forward. I noted with some surprise they all looked like cookie-cutters of the other. Not a freckle on their bald heads was different between the seven dark men. He nodded to Terry and then turned in my direction before lifting his free arm and crossing it over his chest. He took a deep bow, and when he rose, his orange eyes blazed bright in the darkness. It looked almost like his insides were filled with fire, and I shivered just a little bit, not knowing how much damage this creature was capable of inflicting. I smiled inwardly, imagining how the humans were going to react to him and his brothers. We'll help find the mate of Prince Castor. Thank you, I told them. It'll take too long for me to get a boat to follow, but I believe you'll be able to spot them if they're still on the river. If they've docked somewhere, you'll no doubt be able to tell me where, so I can send men to find my mate. But you must hurry. They have close to an hour's head start. The eunuch bowed again. We'll find them. What do you wish us to do with them, sire? I didn't think the humans would have helped McCurdy or his werewolf spy out of some misplaced fealty to his clan but I couldn't be sure. Humans who worked for evil supernatural creatures couldn't be trusted. If I had to guess, fear was part of what motivated these humans to do what they did for McCurdy. The other motivation? Well, that was simple enough. Their overwhelming master had to be what drove most bad men. Money. Bring me one of the humans along with my mate. Do what you wish with the others. Just make sure they will never be a threat to Emery again. The man bowed. Consider it done, Prince Castor. He turned away and spoke to the others. Make haste. In a moment, the seven men were unicorns again, and I watched in awe as their wings unfurled. The way the moon gleamed off the individual midnight blue feathers was breathtaking. They rose into the air with a grace I hadn't seen in any large bird before and as I watched their back legs bicycle as if they were running and not flying up into the sky, I marveled at how on earth such magnificent creatures could exist at all. I watched them until they were high above the trees, racing across the moon and then out of sight, before looking back over at Terry, who still stood staring up into the sky. When he glanced back in my direction, I watched him drop the horn so that it hung between his sculpted peck muscles. He smiled at me. I reached out a hand to him and he grasped it. Thank you so much, Terry. We'll head back to the inn to wait for some word. I don't want to leave my father without my personal protection, even though he has many bodyguards. Do you know where the bed and breakfast is? We'll show him, Greg said. 
What else can we do for you, Prince Castor? I looked at Thomas and James before, glancing back at the Alpha. I don't know how badly my security has been compromised. I'm going to assume if McCurdy has one spy hidden among my men, there are others. I'd like you to lend me your pack for security, at least for the time being, Alpha. That would be more helpful than anything else while I get my security team together to root out the traitors in my own camp. Greg looked at Sam and then held out a hand to me with a nod. We're happy to do anything we can to help. I don't know how to thank you, I said. We're friends, that's what we do, Sam said. I looked at him, the man I'd once wanted to share so much with. My attraction to Sam seemed like it had happened a lifetime ago. He was happily mated with Greg, and now I had Emery, my own fated mate. He was a good man and would remain loyal to Greg for the rest of his life. I felt overwhelming gratitude when I looked at these two men, both whom I could now call friends. I took the Alpha's hand, shaking it, and then Sam's before turning to Terry. I'll see you back at the inn, Terry. Be careful out here. Whoever killed my guard and kidnapped Emery to give to those humans is still at large. Terry smiled, showing up bright white teeth in straight rows as he shook my hand. The small gap between his two front teeth was as charming as hell. I was happy to know this man, and once again filled with gratitude. It took twenty minutes of running at full speed to get back to the inn. When I arrived with Thomas and James and the six werewolves Greg and Sam had sent along with us, Violet was waiting outside at the rear of our property. The grounds were now surrounded by numerous guards on patrol, and I silently thanked Violet for being proactive about everyone's safety. She was pacing in front of a comfortable couch someone had dragged out to the back deck. My father reclined on it, drinking tea, no doubt personally made by my sister, and looking better than he had only hours before. Before he left to set up the MRI and bring back more equipment, including an oxygen bay, Doc Baker had prescribed some sort of liquid medication intended to help detoxify my father's body. Clearly, though, the king had been anxious to learn what happened to Emery after getting Claudio's report. The moment we were returned, I shifted and climbed the stairs, gratefully accepting the clothes one of my bodyguards handed me. What happened, Castor? Did you find him? Violet asked, watching me yank on a pair of sweatpants and a t-shirt. Well, you know most of it if Claudio told you everything, I said. I did, sire, Claudio said, calling my attention to where he was standing in the shadows with one of my other bodyguards. He stepped forward and handed me a bottle of water. For you, Highness. I took the water from him and drained it. Thank you, Claudio. I clapped the smaller man on the shoulder, catching the blush on his face. What happened? Violet asked impatiently. Since he's not here, I don't suppose you caught up with him, brother. I shook my head. We got there too late, I said, wrapping my arm around Violet's shoulders and giving them a squeeze. The wolf who attacked Owen, Emery, and Claudio dragged Emery to a pair of ATVs, which I can only assume were waiting for him out in the woods along with three humans. At some point the ATVs drove him to the river, and then they took Emery away by boat, leaving their transportation behind. Thomas James and I followed their tracks to the river, but there was no sign of them there. Who are they? Violet asked, wringing her hands. I shook my head. I have no doubt the humans were working for McCurdy, along with the wolf, who's probably one of his spies. Father! I looked up and saw Oliver coming out of the house, followed by two of his bodyguards. I let go of Violet and squatted, holding out my arms so my son could run into them. I scooped him up and buried my nose in the crook of his neck, inhaling the clean scent of him. In all the trouble with my father and Emery, I hadn't thought much about my son, other than to make sure his guards were doubled for his protection before leaving in search of my mate— at least I'd had a clear enough head after my fight with my mate to do that. Son, how are you? I squeezed my eyes tightly shut and hugged him. I missed you, father. Oliver wiggled, and I tried to let him go. He stopped me, tightening his arms around my neck, framing my cheeks as he stared into my eyes. 
He's going to be okay. Emery is going to be okay, father. I picked him up as I stood, and he clung harder to my neck, circling my waist with his legs like a little limpet. In my arms he felt sturdy and solid. It was a mess of comfort having him here. At least I knew he was safe, and surrounded by werewolves who'd fight to the death to keep him that way. The pit in my stomach returned as I looked toward my father and sister. I wanted to keep all of them safe, and if it wasn't for the bone-crushing loss of my mate, I would probably feel okay. Just knowing that Emery was out there at the mercy of my enemies made me sick inside. He's going to be okay, father, Oliver repeated. I looked at him, letting my gaze trace my young son's features, which so closely resembled my own. He would have been the spitting image of me as a child had it not been for the fact that his eyes were set a little wider apart. He might look slightly strange to other werewolves, not because of his chromosomal abnormality, but because of the brilliance in his eyes, which served to surprise me whenever I caught sight of it. He was a perfectly lovely child through and through, but there was something very special about him. I knew he was magical, and this sparkle in his intelligent eyes swirled was something I couldn't describe. He was one of the loveliest people I'd ever met, and I felt honored to know him. I hope you're right, Oliver. The doorbell suddenly rang, chiming deep within the house. I glanced at Violet and watched her pluck a necklace from the inside of her blouse. She always wore a watch pendant on a chain around her neck. As wolves, we weren't in the habit of wearing watches, in case we had to make an instantaneous shift. Shredding clothing in an emergency was one thing. Wearing jewelry was another entirely. It's nearly nine o'clock. Who could that be? Violet asked. Vincent Roman Hannibal? Oliver said, kicking his feet until I stooped to set him on the ground. How do you know that? I asked. I must do, father. Oliver tore off before I could stop him, and I ran into the house after him. When I got to the front door, Clyde was opening it, flanked by two others on my security detail. Sure enough, standing on my porch in the lawn in front of the house was a whole host of people, including Vincent, Rome, their son Hannibal, his two guardians, the town witch, an older man called Sid, and several others. One of them I recognized as Sally Winters, Rome's deputy, who was also a hedgehog shifter. Another was the town medium, a man by the name of Scott Templeton. Coming up the drive to join those already on the lawn were a large group of werewolves, most of whom I recognized from Greg's back. Sure enough, he'd done exactly as promised, sent every wolf he could spare to help provide security for us. Lumbering up the road, I spotted an oversized bus labeled San Joaquin General Hospital MRI. The gratitude that filled my heart in a sudden rush was so overwhelming it nearly took my breath away. All of these people were here to support me, my sister, my father, and our people. I didn't know what to say. How could I convey my thanks to all of these people when Violet and I made a point of setting ourselves apart from the community? Along with my appreciation came the shame I now felt in how I'd behaved toward these men and women who'd only always reached out to us in warmth. Caster, we know Emery is missing, Rome began. The champions, I acknowledged, stepping out onto the porch and clasping the sheriff's outstretched hand. Without blinking, he turned and held out his hand. And do you know Scott Templeton? I glanced at the older man standing beside Vincent, I had to admire the human. He was surrounded by every single variation of supernatural, including his vampire boss from the antique store where he had worked with Vincent, to an entire pack of werewolves, as well as the most powerful witch I'd ever met, and a bunch of shifters. He didn't flinch, and I was impressed, something I'd never been when it came to interactions with humans. I nodded to the older, bespectacled man. I've seen you around, I stated simply, it was the truth. I'd never had any interactions with Templeton except peripherally, knowing that he'd been responsible for a seance where Vincent, Rome, and a few others had learned of several human children who'd been abducted and murdered in Prosper Woods. It had taken the ghost of one of them to come back and connect with Templeton to lay him and the others to rest. Templeton bowed to me, and that surprised me. Normally I'd 
try to stay out of any interaction with humans other than the most necessary. On closer observation, I realized I tried to stay out of interactions with everyone, supernatural and human alike, though Emery was beginning to change that about me. Since our mating, we dined in town several times, even doing something I thought I'd never do. Grocery shopping. I shuddered at the very thought of the activity. I remembered that day with fondness now. I'd driven Emery to town in the Mercedes with a long list of items Mrs. Douglas desperately needed for the kitchen, only to learn that Sid's Country Market was only the first stop in a long list of something my mate had called running errands. Preposterous. As horrifying as it had been going into places where I'd been forced to have contact with others, Emery's sunny spirit had made the day-long outing a memory that made my heart hurt now that he was gone. I looked at the town medium and shook myself out of my brief daydream. If he was here, maybe he knew something. Do you know who or where anyone may have taken Emery? Yes, sir, Templeton replied. I watched him swallow and knew he was holding back. I'm grateful that you're here, Mr. Templeton. Please, if you know anything about what's happening to Emery, please tell me. Templeton nodded slowly. Forgive me, your highness. Uh, I've seen visions of what's happening. I know your mate has been taken by evil men. But he's still alive, and if we work fast, I believe he'll survive this abduction. Tell me anything. Please. The world spun away as I held my breath, desperate to hear that Emery wasn't being subjected to torture. He's been taken downriver through the small town of Silver Springs Village to Clevesville, he said. He stepped forward and reached out for me. I clasped both of his hands in mine. The instant we touched, something akin to lightning sparked through me and lit me up inside. I knew, without a shadow of a doubt, this man, this human medium, was the answer to who my Emery was with and where he was. His destination will be Los Angeles, where Alistair McCurdy is planning on amassing troops. We need to get to your mate quickly to stop his captors from taking him down south. My heart skipped a beat. I didn't know Los Angeles, but I did know this. If Emery ended up somewhere in the maze that was one of the nation's largest cities, finding him would be much more difficult than I could imagine. Chapter 7 Prosper Woods Chronicle All the Advice Fit to Print Dear Krabby, I have a problem I hope you can solve. I'm an avid reader and I buy paperbacks, arranging them on shelves by series and favorite author. My eight-year-old daughter has begun reading my erotic romances, but she likes to have several going at once. I've told her and told her when she takes a book out she needs to put it back in the proper place— she won't listen, and my shelves are all messed up. What do I do? Signed, Anally Retentive Dear Anally Retentive, I'm sure I don't have to tell you how impressive it is that your eight-year-old is reading romances at her age. For that matter, the kid reads it all. I always had a hard time trying to get my kids and grandkids to read, so you're lucky. Perhaps I should have done as you did and chuck conventional wisdom that says kids should be reading age-appropriate material. Maybe Krabby shouldn't have worried that an eight-year-old is too young to read and retains anal romance. So my advice is stop bugging the kid to put the books back in order and be grateful she's learning an important lesson about anal. At least you won't end up with unexpected grandkids from that girl. Respectfully, Krabby. Emery. I most likely passed out from pain because the next thing I knew I was waking up and trying desperately to breathe inside the bag I still wore, the bag that smelled like vomit. I was pretty sure the last person who'd been forced to wear this had left traces of their stomach contents behind. I was more confused by the fact that they'd bothered to put my head in a bag at all. I was already blindfolded and still shackled. I lay on my side with my legs pulled up to my chest, no doubt trying to protect my midsection in this fetal position from more kicking boots, even in my unconscious state. 
I tried to straighten and let out a whimper of pain as the shackles twisted on my wrists and ankles. I gasped when I tried to roll over to my back as something akin to a stabbing pain shot through my chest. I knew I had broken ribs. Normally werewolves heal quickly, but I was afraid my metabolism and healing processes weren't kicking in because of the silver. If I was going to heal, it wasn't going to happen until my shackles were removed. If they were removed... I rolled back to my side, holding my breath as my ribs screamed again. I swallowed hard, trying not to vomit from the smell of the filthy sack as I stared sightlessly upward. I concentrated on my hearing, trying to sense what was around me. I lay on something hard and cold, a wood or tile floor if I had to guess. I couldn't pick out smells with the bag over my head, but I could listen. What I heard didn't make me feel the least bit better. How long until he comes to get him? A scratchy voice drawled. He sounded like he'd been drinking. One of the humans. Aw, oh, keep your shirt on. He'll be here when he gets here. Orders are, we stay here with the animal until he comes. That's all you need to know. A different human. Yeah? Well, who the fuck does he think he is Tell me what to do? He's nothing but a filthy animal himself. Correction. An uneducated human. He's the one who's paying us to so keep your damn trap shut. All you do is complain, complain, complain. The third human. So they're all here. Yeah, well, fuck you. Hey, you think it's true that they can read minds? That's what they say. The sound of chair legs scraped back on the floor and then footsteps came over. I was still unprepared when a kick landed in my back. My kidney screamed at the same time I did. Hey, what did I tell you about kicking him? You kill him and we won't get paid. Besides, I don't want to answer to that fucker. You. Hey, you. Werewolf. I grunted. Can you really read minds? I could, but I wasn't about to answer this human. Besides, my telepathic abilities were much diminished with the amount of silver they had on me. Not with the silver, I told him honestly. I held up my shackled hands, gritting my teeth at the pain and trying to ignore the agony caused by the silver currently burning holes in my body. But if you want to take it off, I'm happy to demonstrate. Laughter boomed from one of the humans across the room. <laughs> Y'all making fun of me. Fuck you. The human looming over me said right before kicking me again. I screamed as the toe of his boot landed on an already broken rib. Something inside me snapped, and I passed out into merciful unconsciousness once again. The next time I opened my eyes, I was gasping, fighting to breathe. I struggled to sit up, anxious to get air into my lungs, terrified if I didn't I was going to die. I ignored the agony in my wrists as I pushed myself up onto all fours, gasping and gagging, trying to draw in air with short pants. Footsteps came toward me, and a moment later, the stinking bag was ripped from my face. I squeezed my eyes shut, expecting light to come rushing in at me, only to realize that I still wore the blindfold. I completely forgotten it was there. I gasped again as a hand landed on my back between my shoulder blades. I flinched, expecting pain or another kick. Instead, I was surprised as the palm stroked almost gently down my naked spine all the way to my arse. There, there now. What have those filthy humans done to you? I opened my mouth, taking quick, panting breaths. The man tisked, and I gasped again, finally drawing in a full breath. My ribs screamed. I was in more trouble than I'd realized. The silver preventing me from healing my wrists and ankles was also stopping the healing of whatever internal damage I'd suffered. I wasn't a big guy, and after several kicks to my midsection back and ribcage, I had not only fractured bones, but things were just as I feared. I was bleeding internally. I can't breathe, I said, coughing. Fluid ran down my chin, and I had no doubt what it was. The copper smell of blood filled the air. Oh, dear. Look at that, the werewolf said, tisking again. The blindfold was torn away from my eyes, and I rolled to my ass, blinking several times as a very handsome older man came into focus. He was squatting beside me, and there was no one else in the room. I'd known that even with the blindfold and hood. 
I only heard one heartbeat, one set of lungs expanding and contracting. I knew the two of us were alone. He had to be the one who'd orchestrated my kidnapping, or at the very least, the one who'd come to collect me and take me to McCurdy. I looked into his eyes and reached for his forearm as he squatted beside me. My nails dug into his sleeve. For the first time, I noticed the man was dressed in a three-piece suit, necktie and all. His black dress shoes were buffed to a bright finish. The fucker looked like he'd stepped out of the pages of Gentleman's Quarterly Magazine. Help me. I knew how pitiful I sounded, but getting air into my lungs was the only thing I was concerned with at the moment. Without it, I was sure I'd perish. Please? He cocked his head to the side, seeming to study me. I'm afraid that your healing is being prevented by these. He grasped the chains that connected my wrist shackles, and when his own flesh hissed, he dropped them. Ooh, that does sting, doesn't it? He shook his hand and examined the red welts on his palm. I watched the red fade to pink and then vanish as he healed instantly. He looked up at me and smiled, cocking his head again. I coughed again, bringing up more blood and spitting it on the ground as I gasped, trying desperately to take a full breath. I was beginning to see spots as they formed in a circle around my pupils. I was going to pass out again, and this time, I was pretty sure I was going to die. There wasn't a doubt in my mind now. I was bleeding internally. Clearly my lungs were filling with blood, most likely punctured by a jagged broken rib. Every time I breathed in or out, I could feel the fractures on both sides, not to mention the way my breath sounded utterly ragged. I'm dying. Please, please take off the shackles. I promise not to run away, but if I don't shift and heal myself, I'm going to die. I held out both wrists. The shackles rattled, pulling at the chain that connected them to my ankles. My skin smoked, and the deep grooves that had been cut into my flesh sizzled. My stomach rolled at the stench that rose from my crackling flesh. If this guy didn't remove my restraints, I promised myself to make sure and vomit all over his starched white dress shirt before I died. The bastard sighed. I guess I can't have you die on me before I turn you over. That asshole McCurdy might not look too kindly on the fact that I failed in my duty. Besides, I have a reputation. I always keep my promises. The king knew that about me. His face began to blur as my eyelids drooped. I dropped my hands into my lap, too weak to hold them out to him any longer. As desperately as I wanted to know all about how he was aware of what the king knew about him, things weren't looking too good for me. The spots before my eyes increased as I watched him reach into his pocket and produce a silver key. He caught my eye before slapping the side of my face. Don't pass out on me. I'm going to undo your shackles so you can shift, but I'll have this pointed at your head, so don't try anything. For the first time, I noticed how he patted the gun he had tucked into his belt. It was no doubt loaded with silver bullets. He stood up and tossed the keys to me as he pulled the weapon and pointed it at my head. Open the shackles, but don't try anything. That'll be your only warning. I scrambled for the keys, snatching them up from the floor as I gasped again. It took some near gymnastic twisting, but I was finally able to get the first shackle undone. I let out a relieved breath as it swung from the chain still attached to the second shackle. I deftly inserted the key and undid the second one before freeing my ankles and sitting back to catch my breath as the agonizing silver fell away. Shift and heal yourself, the man commanded. I stared up at him, looking into the barrel of the gun. I was unbearably weak, but I knew he was right. If I didn't heal myself, I would continue to bleed into my lungs and surely drown. I thought of Castor and how devastated he'd be, summoning every bit of strength I could possibly muster, and shifted, screaming in anguish as pain tore my muscles and broke my bones. My wolf reformed much slower than it ever had before, my shift had always been fast and relatively painless. This metamorphosis was agonizing. I panted, staring at the ground as my large wolf's head hung down from where I stood on all fours. Shift back, Emery. The man shouted, and I looked up, staring at him through my yellow werewolf eyes. 
The urge to leap at him and tear his throat out was almost overwhelming. I coughed again, and then did as he ordered. My shift was slightly faster, and when I ended up on all fours in human form, I was able to take my first full breath. The air rushing into my lungs felt life-sustaining, even in this small, cramped room. I glanced around, noting my surroundings for the first time. A small wooden table was pushed up against one wall with three chairs. Empty beer cans littered the table and floor, along with wads of trash thrown into corners and left out on the table. The humans had been beyond vile. They'd been filthy pigs as well. Once again, Emery, the man said. I looked back at him, noting how he waved the gun at my face. I wondered whether I could get to him faster than it would take for a bullet fired from that gun to go through my brain. The man laughed, and I instantly regretted not blocking or even attempting to mask my thoughts. <laughs> you can't. Now shift once more. I sighed and shifted to my wolf form, landing on all fours at mostly normal speed. I stretched my neck muscles and lifted my face, noting the peeling plaster of the walls and stained acoustic coating on the ceiling. The room had to be the bedroom of an ancient house, one with only one door and one small single-paned window. Outside, the moon was low in the sky, and the first light colors of the coming dawn stained the sky. Every time I looked at the moon, I thought of Castor, and I wondered how he was doing, knowing my beloved had to be out of his mind with worry. He may have been unsure about me the last time we spoke, but in my heart, I knew how much he loved me. Shift back, and we'll have a talk, the man said. He stood and walked over to a grocery sack near the door, keeping the gun trained on me. I shifted and stood to my full height, filthy and bloody and quite naked. You're still healing, and you get cold. Besides... He raked his eyes over me in a lascivious, insulting way. You're much too distracting to be standing there naked. Put these on. He kicked the bag across the floor at me, and I bent, picking it up. Inside was a pair of sweatpants and a long-sleeved sweatshirt. I pulled them on, grateful for the softness on my skin. I gingerly lifted the elastic up over my ankles, since the deep grooves from the silver burns were still healing, and then held out my hands, palm up. Now what? Now we have a talk while I wait for our escort. The man waved the gun at one of the three chairs and I moved across the room, pulled it out and sat down. He sat across from me, keeping the gun chest level as he opened a button on his pristine suit. He leaned back in the chair, crossing one ankle over his knee, looking dapper and handsome as hell in the bleak room. If I had to guess, I'd say he was probably in his mid-forties, with gray hair at his temples. He looked polished all the way from his groomed hair and trimmed goatee to his buffed fingernails. The way he held the gun was practiced. Who are you? Morteza. I blinked. I knew the singular name, but I'd never seen the man some called the Ghost. He was rumored to be an assassin whose kills had numbered in the hundreds. He didn't work for any particular clan. He was what the humans would call a mercenary, who took money from anyone willing to pay for his elite services. I was pretty sure his clients included King Howard Zaday, since I'd heard his name bandied around the castle back home as the servants spoke about his visits there in hushed whispers. Most of the time, servants were more than willing to spread rumors loudly to any ears willing to hear, and parade themselves in front of attractive visitors. This wasn't the case with Morteza. He was given a wide berth when he visited. You're the assassin? The man laughed, letting his gaze wander over my face. The deep brown color of his eyes held no warmth whatsoever. I saw only a hard edge and an empty soul. <laughs> you are a treasure, Emery. No wonder Cyrus fell for you. I gritted my teeth. Castor. My mate's name is Castor. Morteza waved the gun. Whatever. He shook his head, sobering as his smile died. I couldn't believe it when I heard he'd made it. He never struck me as one who'd confine his desires to <laughs> one man. 
He lifted his hand and coughed behind it. Or two men. <laughs> he winked, and I felt my stomach turn as his words sunk in. What would you know about it? I cringed, wanting to take back the words even as they slid off my tongue. Ah, uh, little wolf. You just had to ask, didn't you? His dead eyes twinkled with carnality. I glowered at him. Cyrus, ah, uh, Castor, is a smoking hot lay. His cock tastes like, you're a fucking liar. He waved the gun, and I noted the sudden flare of what had to be anger behind the cruelty in his gaze. He was having fun at my expense. Were you under the impression your mate was some sort of priest before he met you? <laughs> he let out that fucking anoint tisking sound he'd been doing since I'd first laid eyes on him. He leaned forward and lowered his voice to a near whisper. Castor had the sweetest arse I've ever had, Emery. But then again, you already know that, don't you? I lunged at him, and he quickly scooted back, laughing as he stood up. A moment later, he stopped any further forward momentum as he leveled the gun at my face. Sit the fuck down, he growled, frowning deeply. I glared at him for several seconds, holding his gaze and letting my hatred for him show. I couldn't remember ever feeling such rage at another person, with the exception of Teo when he was killing Castor. I blew out a breath and resumed my seat, realizing only too late that Morteza had goaded me into this exchange. For a few seconds, I wondered why I was susceptible to this man's suggestion that my mate had been with many others before me, when I already knew it on an intellectual level. Castor and I had never discussed it because it hadn't mattered. I knew how much my mate loved me. I was confident in that. His past partner shouldn't matter. Hell, he'd been with at least one woman before. The result was our son, Oliver. For a tiny second, I let Oliver sweep face replaced the leering one of this assassin, and I felt better. I had a life, a very good life, with a man and a son who adored me. Whatever Castor's past was shouldn't matter. That's right. Think of that deformed kid of yours. Whatever it takes to make you feel better, Emery. I glowered at him, telepathically blocking him, angry that I hadn't done it before. What do you want? What could your purpose possibly be in taking me? Don't want to talk about the way Castor, Teo, and I fucked? <laughs> Fine. Teo? No, I wasn't going to let him goad me any more. Tell me why you had that wolf kidnap me, I demanded. He weighed the gun in my face. I don't get it, really. I don't understand what he sees in you. I mean, you're a tight little piece of arse, I'm sure, but the whole... Love thing? He continued as if I wasn't even in the room. We're fated mates. Love is only part of it, I told him. If he wanted to talk, I'd talk. I knew Castor was out there somewhere looking for me, and if I could delay Morteza for even a few minutes, it would be a few minutes more than my mate would have to find me. I never understood the whole fated mates thing. Tell me, did you convulse the first time he fucked you? Did he not inside your arse? He smiled salaciously. How does it feel to come for fifteen minutes? Oh, yeah, that's him coming, he said. Not you. He cocked his head, waving the gun. Or is your orgasm drawn out while he spills inside you? He bit his lower lip. Come on, tell me all the details. This should be good. You're disgusting, I said, honestly feeling my stomach roll. I'd never share that with you. I felt the tendrils of his telepathy reaching out to me and strengthened my block. His attempt cut off with a suddenness that surprised me. <sighs> Fine, block me. I guess I'll just have to find out how good you are when I taste you myself. That'll never happen, I told him. I'll die first. He stuck out his lower lip. I thought you might say that. He waved the gun again. It's your choice, Emery. You wouldn't be the first cold one I ever cracked open. He stood up as my mouth gaped. 
I watched him look around the room. Speaking of which, these fuckers didn't even save me a beer. Where are they? I asked, trying desperately to steer the subject to anything other than this vile piece of crap and the way he had probably violated dead bodies. He spun to look at me. The humans. He lifted his face and took a big sniff before looking back at me. You can't smell them. Your head really was in that bag too long. He began pacing around the room, keeping far enough away from me to chance me shifting and attacking him before he could squeeze off a silver bullet. I took a deep breath and caught the overwhelming scent of human blood. I hadn't even noticed it before now. I looked around the room again. There were a few droplets of human blood near the door, but not enough to create this smell. You killed them? He lifted the hand not holding the gun and blew on his nails. Ripped them limb from limb. Literally. Why? Didn't they do what they were told to do? He dropped his hand and returned to the table where he resumed his seat across from me. They did an adequate job, I suppose. I just didn't like them. He looked down at his nails again and huffed out a breath on them before looking up at me as he polished them on his coat. I've never met a human I liked, come to think of it. I'd kill the whole inferior race if I could. I shuddered. This werewolf was the wickedest creature I'd ever met, and after Teo, that was saying a lot. It made me wonder what kind of blinders Castor had been wearing when he'd bedded these men. When I was back in front of my mate and King Howard's a day, I was going to tell them exactly who Morteza really was. They had to understand the depths of his depravity, so they'd never be tempted to employ his services or men like him again. Why am I here? Why did that wolf take me? I asked, repeating the question. Morteza made a big deal out of pretending to yawn. It's so boring. Basic, really. He sighed before going on. McCurdy wants you for leverage. He has no intention of fighting a war. He hasn't paid his troops in months, and there's rampant disloyalty among his ranks. I was sure my eyebrows rose almost to my hairline. What? You were actually under the impression he intended on attacking? Morteza laughed, catching my reaction. <laughs> Fuck no. I don't understand. I said, still trying to wrap my head around what he was saying to me. What? Are you a bit thick? He tapped the side of his head. He's never had the intention of starting a war with Castor. McCurdy is as much of a windbag as a set of his own bagpipes. He was pissed off that his plans to take over the kingdom failed, so he threatened war. Take over the kingdom? How was he planning on doing that? I asked, knowing I sounded incredulous. Even if Castor had gone along with McCurdy's planned marriage to Lady Penelope, their child would have inherited the throne, not McCurdy. He pointed at me. And that right there is why he'll win this war, and why I picked his side for the win. None of you, our souls, have the ability to think outside the box like the Scot. He smiled evilly. You see, he'd already orchestrated the king's death. As soon as he and that old Prune matchmaker Arla set the king up, having him agree that McCurdy's bitch was to be the future queen, he began the poisoning of the king. His plan was to have Penelope bear Castor a son and then do away with him right after his father. Once the two of them were dead, it would pave the way for Penelope's son to inherit. My mind was reeling. But how would he inherit if he was only an infant? He frowned at me. You really don't have any imagination, do you? What? I was confused. Morteza rolled his eyes. With Castor and his father dead, McCurdy would have had to step in to help run the kingdom as the child's guardian. Clearly, Penelope would be out of her mind with grief and look to her father for his wisdom and the steadiness of his big, fat hand. All it took was a healthy bribe to the shriveled raisin of a matchmaker, and it was a done deal, as the Americans say. Well, Almost a done deal. He shook his finger at me. You fucked all that up for McCurdy, and he holds you responsible for the loss of his power to take what he feels is rightfully his. I was stunned, unable to even fathom how McCurdy had this rotten plan all worked out. 
At a loss for words, I wondered if Castor expected any of this. He honestly thought he'd get away with this? The assassin smiled, and not for the first time I noticed that the glint in his eye had nothing to do with genuine joy. Morteza shrugged. I suppose things would have worked out just the way he'd planned them, if it hadn't been for the whole faded mating, he said, using air quotes. I ground my teeth together to keep from saying exactly what he needed to learn about pairs who were designed by Mother Nature to find each other. Besides, no one knew how faded mates worked, but other pairs of faded mates. If we'd never found each other, it would have been one thing. But now that we had, there was no way Castor could ever turn his back on me. He couldn't even take another to his bed without it causing him tremendous physical pain, nor could his heart ever survive my death. I almost felt sorry for this assassin. He was way out of his depth. No one could understand us or our bond, but another who had it. So now what? Now that Castor has me, why won't McCurdy go to war? He smiled evilly at me again, and I felt myself shudder. Don't you worry about that. I told you. I picked McCurdy's side. And I plan on making sure he comes out the winner and gets what he wants. What is that? The fucking kingdom, of course. What do you think we've been talking about all this time? Jesus, you're stupid. You're going to fail, I told him confidently. <laughs> Not bloody likely, he said, sneering. You're going to die when McCurdy's finished with you. Castor will rescue me. You're the one who's going to die, I spat right back at him. Really? Well, his strategy isn't working terribly well now, is it? What are you talking about? He sighed and reached for a lint ball on his sleeve, plucking it and flicking it away. <sighs> right before I came in, I got word that those winged freaks were headed toward Dutchie's Bridge to try and find you. They're not going to. What winged freaks? I asked more curious than I wanted to let on. I really had no idea what he was talking about. I knew Lyra, one of Prince Hannibal's guardians, could shift into any animal she wanted. One of her favorite creatures was a massive blackbird. I'd seen her do it, and I prayed it was her. She could use telepathy as a guardian, or at least that's what they said about those magnificent shifters often referred to as shifters on steroids. The assassin narrowed his eyes at me. Oh, interesting. You really don't know, do you? Know what? Interesting. He repeated, I thought Castor would have given you a better education about everything that transpired in this fucking back of beyond neck of the woods before you arrived. Why don't you just spit it out? What are you trying to say, assassin? His lips spread in a wide grin. The Unicorn King has champions who are apparently some sort of fire-breathing winged unicorns. They were spotted by one of McCurdy's spies. The champions didn't see where you were taken before you were spirited away by those puddles of goo out in the hall. <laughs> he chuckled and hooked a thumb at the door, shaking his head. Oh, I love myself sometimes. I glared at him. Anyway, it looks like you'll be stuck with me until I have confirmation the king and your beloved mate are dead. Then, well, McCurdy has plans for you. He's on his way here as we speak. He blew on his fingernails again. I wanted to slap the smug look right off his face. Castor will find me, and when he does, you're dead. He looked up and tisked again. It's really sweet the way you love him. You have so much faith in him, that's clear. He stuck out his lower lip and gave me a fake, sad expression before it hardened into the evil mask I'd seen him wear much too much today. What a great shame. He won't live long enough to rescue you, Emery. He leered again, raking me up and down, though his view was limited by the table in front of him. I must say, though, I am looking forward to the time we're going to have together. Perhaps McCurdy will let me keep you when all this nastiness is said and done. I think we can have a lot of fun together, provided you last long enough. I concentrated on reading his mind, using my telepathy to fill in the blanks from the words he hadn't spoken. He had plans, all right. 
filthy plans filled with pain, humiliation, and finally an excruciating death. It's never gonna happen, assassin. He chuckled. <laughs> Time will tell, Emery. Time will tell. Chapter 8 Prosper Woods Chronicle, All the Advice Fit to Print Dear Krabby, I have a bone to pick with my optometrist, but I thought I'd get your advice first. He says I have cataracts, and insists I see an ophthalmologist to have the surgery done, yet he says I'll always need glasses even afterward. I don't know what to do. I don't think it's fair that I must do both. What do you say? Sign, Not Taking Things on Blind Faith Dear Not Taking Things on Blind Faith, I think whatever you decide about your eyes should be a thorough process. If, heaven forbid, you should lose your sight, you'll never be able to forgive yourself. I think asking a lot of questions and doing your research is the intelligent and thoughtful thing to do. Frankly, buying a luxury car while you're deciding about surgery isn't the best choice, and I've heard models like the cataract are expensive to insure. I also don't think your optometrist is very smart by sending you someone who studies birds, unless he's taken bird's eye at face value. Anyway, I never liked their frozen peas, so there is that. I hope this helps. Respectfully, Crabby. Castor. I gathered all the werewolves Greg and Sam brought with them and asked them to head to Silver Springs Village to search for Emery. Getting across the river seemed to be the greatest challenge since they would have to be taken in small groups by small boats. At this late date, it was difficult to bring in larger craft from the nearby Prosper Woods Lake, because they'd have to be transferred over land and launched from small boat ramps onto the river. I knew asking the wolves to swim the length of the river from one side to the other would take time, but with the help of the Alpha and his mate, all available werewolves would do just that. After they'd gone, I paced around the inn's large parlor, trying to calm down as I waited for the champions to return or send word that they'd located my mate. If they reached them before they docked whatever boat they'd taken Emery away on, there might be a chance of stopping them before they could hide themselves from the airborne creatures in the forest. I wasn't exactly holding my breath. Every so often, I'd stop pacing and look around the room to gauge everyone's level of optimism. I knew mine wasn't high that we'd find Emery unharmed, and the longer it took to hear something, anything, the worse I felt. I constantly reached out with telepathy, trying desperately to pick up on something, anything, that Emery needed to convey to me. I also stared at the medium, Scott Templeton, and the witch, Sid Farrell, who sat on hard chairs Violet had asked to be brought in from the dining room to accompany the sofas already in the room. Greg and Sam had gone to help their pack get across the river— after that, they planned on going to Frederick to see if they could call in werewolves from nearby counties to help protect us all when the time came. If we were about to be attacked by forces, I wanted a fighting chance to get my father, sister, and son, as well as the rest of my household, to safety before we faced attack. As much as I appreciated the help Scott Templeton provided us through his psychic abilities, having a backup plan was critical. Violet had accompanied my father, Doc Baker, and Vincent to the MRI bus parked in front of the bed and breakfast, just as he'd promised, having a vampire as an ally and friend turned out to be a blessing. He'd compelled the mobile MRI staff to ignore the werewolf physiology, which looked similar to a canine's on the screen, then come back inside to wait with Rome for word about Emery. Doc Baker left with the MRI bus and two confused technicians, which I'm pretty sure were missing time as well as part of their memory. After all was said and done, Violet had seen my father up to bed to make sure he was comfortable and insulated by an extra layer of bodyguards. I'd also set Clyde to double-checking that everyone we had on our security staff was vetted and double-checked, once more running updated background checks on them. None of us wanted to face an internal spy again, and the last thing I needed was a coup from within. The safety of my immediate family, even as the search for Emery went on, was of paramount importance to me. Meanwhile, Mrs. Douglas had been asked to discard every single bite of food in the house, 
and Sid, who owned the town market, had tasked a few of the local kids he trusted to open up his store and fill boxes of food of every sort to be brought back to the inn. Watching my expensive collection of alcohol be poured down the drain was utterly painful, even though I hadn't had much desire for it since being drunk the night I took my beloved's virginity. I didn't ask, but is there a reason why you came out here tonight? I looked directly at Sid when he'd settled in his chair after a conversation with Ricky, the local rabbit shifter town mechanic, who apparently had plenty of young bunnykin boxing up food for us. The elderly witch had been a huge help to Vincent and Rome, who sat on the couch opposite him. I mean, I'm grateful you're here, and I know you helped my friends, but how can you help us? I assume that's why you're here. The old man smirked, leaning back on the chair, which was groaning just a little from the weight of his substantial form. In one hand he cradled a long wooden staff, which at times swirled with red lightning. I realized it was much more than simply a tree branch when I'd first seen him use it on an evil werewolf whom he blasted with a bolt of hot red lightning that shot out of the end during the last battle we'd fought at the lake together. The other weapon in the room— I hadn't seen until I'd invited the group into the house. This one was a six-foot-long broadsword that gleamed in the moonlight when Vincent had pulled it from the scabbard he wore hanging down his back. Vincent had been born over seven hundred years ago, and had his human life ended by a vampire when he'd been fighting one of the final crusades in the Holy Land. Vincent was a literal knight of the realm, and breathtakingly beautiful, with thick, shoulder-length mahogany hair. Before meeting him, my experiences with vampires had been less than friendly, and it had taken me a long time to warm up to him. It turned out Vincent was one of the best men I knew, and I was happy to have him standing with me. Between the vampire and his sheriff mate, who had his own magic, I knew we were safer than we would be if they weren't here. Rome and Vincent stayed to offer their sympathy and stand vigil over me and my family— while Rome's deputy, Sally Winters, the town hedgehog, had gone to rally other shifters to my cause. I wasn't sure how a town full of the world's oddest shifters were going to help us either, but I wouldn't question it. I'd seen cobras, a white stag, a pack of hyenas, a multitude of bunnies, and even a puffy pink poodle come to the aid of our friends, absolutely fearless in battle. I stayed because I thought you might need my help, Castor. Sid replied, dragging my wandering thoughts back into the room. He hadn't addressed me formally like the others had, now that they all knew who I was and what my station was. I'd never felt more grateful for the simplicity of someone just using my name. It was the primary reason I'd never told anyone of my royal blood before my father and his entourage arrived. I didn't want to be set above or apart from the rest of the supernaturals in this town. Besides, with Rome— king of the unicorns, and Vincent, king of the vampires. The town was lousy with royalty anyway. The last thing we all needed was a bunch of folks constantly bowing, scraping, and genuflecting in front of us. Considering the quantity of royalty around these parts, people would never get anything done with all the bowing. Thank you, Weech, I said, honestly feeling the sentiment. Well, I don't see anyone else here capable of doing what I do with magic besides your boy, and I wasn't sure you wanted him jumping into the fray and getting his hands dirty. I frowned. He was on point. Oh, you're absolutely right about that. I'm happy to accept whatever help you have to offer, Sid. Thank you. I'd never seen a more focused or powerful witch, either here or back home in Tabriz, when McCurdy brought this war to my doorstep, I didn't want him anywhere near Oliver. For that matter, I was upset that I'd revealed Oliver's power to McCurdy at all. I had no doubt someone would try and hit me where I was vulnerable. They'd already gone after my elderly father, and now my beloved mate. If anyone tried to go after my son, I don't know how I'd deal with trying to protect everyone I loved at the same time. Every time I thought of how— Foolish, I'd been not placing more guards on Emery. I wanted to kick myself. I'd practically offered him up on a silver platter to my enemies. I felt sick to my stomach. I stopped pacing and walked over to the wall, grabbing the ribbon there and pulling it. I needed tea and something for my stomach before I threw up. I was sure I probably needed the distraction more, but 
After all, I did have guests. With Violet seen to my father, I thought I should be hospitable. The doorbell rang, and I paced to the doorway between the parlor, looking toward the foyer, where one of my guards was opening the door. Terry was ushered into the house, and I met him halfway between the front door and the parlor. The look on his dark face wasn't comforting. Any moment I let my telepathy read what news he'd come with, I felt a stab of pain. He shook his head as he stared into my eyes. Oh, we weren't successful, sire. I'm so sorry. We were too late. He bowed at the waist, and I instantly scented his regret. I'd put a lot of hope in the fact that the champions might be able to locate Emery in the river before he was taken off somewhere. Please tell me what your men found, I said quietly, hearing the others coming up behind me. In moments I was surrounded by my sympathetic friends. The champions found a flat bottom barge tied up at a dock on the far side of the river, not far from Duchess Bridge. They can't follow since like we can, sire. If you have anyone who can look for Master Emery in Silver Springs Village, that might be where they were headed. At the very least, it is the closest town to where they tied up. Yes, that's where I saw them, Scott Templeton said. Like I said, the humans took him through Silver Springs, headed to Cleesville, and from there to Los Angeles. Wait, you saw them? Terry asked, looking confused. I'm a medium with psychic abilities as well. I saw three humans take him in the direction of Silver Springs Village, Templeton told him. I had hopes your champions would be able to spot them from the air while they were still on the river. I guess they made it to the shelter of trees before your men got there, I said, reaching out and squeezing Terry's shoulder. I could feel how upset he was. He felt as though he had failed me. It's okay. Greg sent his back to Silver Springs Village already. They may have some luck. I gave him the tiniest smile, even though I was feeling utterly hopeless. At this point, all I could do was pray someone would get to Emery. I turned to the others, who all stood behind me in the room. I can't stay. I have to go looking for him. Then you're taking us, Rome said, nodding toward Vincent. And me, Sid said. I'm so grateful to you all, but... I need someone I trust to stay and watch over Violet and Oliver. If anything happens to them... Rome reached out and squeezed my bicep. He stared at me for a few seconds and glanced at Vincent before looking back. I understand. Vincent and I will stay and protect your family, Caster. He glanced over at Sid. I think you should stay too. Put a bubble of protection over the inn the way you did when Greg was fighting Floyd for the spot as Alpha. I assumed the bubble of protection was similar to the one Sid and his witches had used in the fight against the Conclave of Eight, and gratitude swept through me. I'd been aware of the fight that Greg had with the former Alpha of the Frederick Pack. I knew Floyd Reardon before Greg beat him and took his place at the head of the pack. Reardon had been a terrible man and an evil werewolf before Greg put him into his reign. He not only terrorized his own pack, but many innocents in the town— he died after teaming up with evil vampires who'd come to Prosper Woods to kill Vincent, and the world was better without him. I'll stay and do what I can, Sid said. I felt instant gratitude again to the old witch. I knew the combination of his magic and power, Rome's strange ability to lift an enemy and move them elsewhere magically, and Vincent's speed and fighting ability will go a long way in protecting my family. I'd seen Rome change size from a normal-sized unicorn to one that was thirty feet tall, with hooves capable of crushing an enemy. I'd watched Vincent wield his broadsword with determination, removing heads and cleaving the enemy in two during the battles we'd fought together. Vampire or no vampire, I knew he was more than capable of keeping my loved ones safe. The front door opened and I looked up to see Clyde walking in with three people I'd never expected to see. Father! Papa! Hannibal yelled, running at Rome and Vincent. He threw his arms around Rome's waist, and the sheriff laughed as he lifted him into the air, spinning the little boy in a circle before handing him off to Vincent, who was grinning from ear to ear. Hannibal hugged his second father's neck, and Vincent gave him a big hug as Hannibal's two guardians walked into the room. Jacob and Lyra, 
were ever present fixtures in the little boy's life and could always be counted on to watch out for him and have his back. I breathed out a sigh of relief. Having the guardians here made me feel even more relieved. I'd personally seen Lyra change from a ninety-five-pound woman with long black braids into a twenty-five-foot-tall fire-breathing dragon. I didn't care how many werewolves McCurdy sent now. With the guardians on guard duty, my family was indeed safe. Fifteen minutes later, I left the inn, accompanied by four of my most trusted guards. I'd selected large werewolves, none of the direwolves, but all men who'd come over to America with my father's entourage on the recommendation of Nima Shirazi, who'd trained them. Clyde assured me that they were trustworthy, and that was all I needed to know to ease my mind. Emery At some point during my conversation with the assassin, Morteza, I'm pretty sure I gave in to despair, wondering how I'd ever get away from him. After he'd made all the threats he could possibly think of, he left, closing and locking the door. I walked around, thankful that he'd left the chains off me. I was pretty sure he'd feared I was so damaged by the humans who'd nearly beaten me to death I was weaker than I appeared. I'd heal quickly once the silver had come off, but I was still nauseous. He'd not left behind any food or water. I was sure of it since I'd checked each and every bag and beer can, finding everything empty. I located a bottle opener which had been discarded in the corner, but it was completely useless to me as a tool of any kind. I set it on the table and continued around the room, tamping down my rising panic. I was trying not to feel hopeless, but I knew I had to eat and hydrate. Aside from needing to get free to make sure Castor knew I was alive, if I didn't get some sustenance in me, I would die. As werewolves, our bodies burned calories three times faster than humans did— that meant we needed to eat three times as much as they did. It wasn't an uncommon thing for me to eat four or five large meals a day and drink a gallon of water. When I was under stress or expending undue calories doing hard work, I ate even more. By my calculation, I hadn't eaten in almost eighteen hours since the noon meal the day before. The assassin had to know that, so the only thing I could think was that he had deliberately denied me food and water to keep me weak, quiet, and compliant. I honestly believed he'd either underestimated how much damage I'd sustained from my prolonged wearing of silver, or he was a full-on sadist. One or the other, I wasn't sure and didn't care. I was simply single-minded in my determination to find a way out of here. I gave up searching the room and walked to the door, squatting down and putting my face on the cold tile. The scent of human blood in the room outside was overwhelming. I shouldn't have had to squat at the crack under the door to have smelled that, and for the first time in my life I realized that not only was I not in peak physical shape and feeling weak, but that my senses were beginning to leave me. That meant I was in more trouble than I thought. My body was beginning to shut down— I realized I hadn't urinated since the day before, which only made sense because I hadn't had anything to drink. Shit, I'm in big trouble here. I listened as hard as I could to the world around me, but couldn't detect the sound of any heartbeats in the house but my own. Normally, if there was another animal anywhere within a hundred feet of me, I could scent it or pick up on a heartbeat, no matter how small the creature. Growing up, I remembered my mother teaching me how to differentiate between the heartbeat of a mouse and a rat and I'd been able to hear the subtle differences even though their size hadn't been that vastly different. I tested the doorknob, noting that it was a regular bedroom doorknob which had been locked from the outside. I turned it, and it took very little force to break, but I found the door wouldn't open because of what had to be several locks on the outside of it. I sat down with my back leaning against it, feeling hopeless. I glanced around the room again, noting the single window sitting high in the far wall, I couldn't see out of it at my height. The sun had risen and light poured into the room, showing off a rusted grating of twisted bars that some homeowner had installed in a past life. I walked over, taking one of the wooden chairs with me. Climbing up on it, I reached over and checked the lock on the window. It appeared to be jammed. I examined it closely. Breaking it wouldn't be that difficult, but it might also cause the glass to break. I craned my neck, trying to see any guards walking around the outside of the house. I didn't see any, 
and yet decided that any breaking of glass might bring attention and unwanted company. The last thing I needed was Morteza's return. I jumped down from the chair with another idea in mind. Crossing the room quickly, I grabbed the bottle opener before returning to my task. In just a few moments, I'd managed to pry open the lock from the inside before sliding the window open with some difficulty. I listened carefully, expecting guards to run over the moment the ancient glass barrier scraped open. Instead, the forest beyond the bars was silent. I wondered what kind of guards Morteza had assigned to watch me and then judged them to be not very good at what they were supposed to be doing. I knew all too well that he wouldn't have left me here without someone watching. I was much too valuable as a bargaining chip to McCurdy. In a sudden panic, I wondered whether that's what had taken the assassin from my side. Morteza said the Scot was coming for me. Maybe he'd gone to pick up the clan leader from the airport. Whatever the case, I knew there was a short window of time in which to escape. Without the window glass in the way, I began to examine the rusty bars, noting that they were made of nothing more than reinforced steel rebar. It was the kind used in construction projects to lay out grid patterns and cement so that it had a lower chance of cracking when poured over large areas. I knew it was also used in the construction of walls and in commercial buildings as a tension device for reinforced concrete. I lifted both hands and curled my fingers around the bars, testing their strength— they didn't give, but I knew they just might move if I repeated this in my werewolf form. I shifted and kicked the chair aside before standing on my hind legs, reaching up to stick my paws through the bars. Since I had no fingers or opposable thumbs, my frustration grew as I tugged as hard as I could. Had I been at full strength, I think I might have been able to rip the bars out of the concrete they were embedded in. Instead, I used my claws— curling them around the rebar and doing my best to pull them apart. I felt my pectoral muscles bunch as the bars began to move. Suddenly, I had hope again. I let go and reached up to brush sweat away from my eyes before trying again. I was still much weaker than I should have been. The longer I went without food and water, the weaker I got. After fifteen minutes, I'd only managed to move the bars two inches— exhaustion washed over me and I realized I was completely out of gas. Tears of frustration leaked from my eyes and I brushed them away with a big paw. I dropped back down onto all fours and shifted, sitting on the floor and looking up at the afternoon sky with only one plea in my head. Where are you, Castor? I need you. Castor. Where are you, Castor? I need you. My racing thoughts came to an abrupt stop as Emery's words crashed into my brain. Oh, thank God, I said out loud. I was in a small boat with my four guards approaching the far side of the river bank where I could see a flat-bottomed barge tied up. No one was around, but the scent of the three humans I'd smelled earlier was strong on the air. The moment I'd seen the barge, I cursed myself for not having found a way to cross the river hours ago. Until now, I feared I'd waited too long. If I'd just kept going when I found him missing at the river's edge, I might have been able to rescue him before now. Emery, I shouted at him telepathically. I'm coming to you. Castor, oh, thank God. Where are you? His voice sounded weak, even in telepathic form. I immediately sensed that he was hurt— and I tamped down panic at not already being on shore where I could get to him faster. I'm on a boat with four of my guards. We're nearing Duchy's Bridge. Where are you, my love? I don't know. There's a very bad wolf here. He has me locked in a room in a house. I don't know where it is, but it's surrounded by forest. I can't get out. I don't know who else is around. I know there have to be some wolves out there guarding the house, but I don't hear heartbeats. Where are the humans? Dead. Morteza killed them. My stomach did a flip-flop. I wasn't exactly sure which Morteza he was talking about, but I could take an educated guess, and the very idea of it terrified me more than anything that had happened in the last few days. Morteza is with you. Baby, tell me. It's the assassin, Morteza, right? Yes, that's him. And no, he's not here right now. He was here, but he left. I'm... I'm alone, Castor. I mean, I think I am. I don't understand it. 
I mean, after the beating and he took off the silver, I was able to heal, so I don't understand why he just left me with no one to guard me. The locks are strong, but still, I mean, he went to a lot of trouble to catch me. Baby, you're rambling just a little. When was the last time you ate? Ate? Yes, when did you eat last, Emery? I guess it was when I was with you. I blinked watching the shoreline approaching as Thomas steered the small boat toward the dock. The last meal we'd eaten together had been yesterday's breakfast. Since then, I'd eaten more than one meal. I hadn't had much of an appetite, but I'd known I had to keep my strength up if I was going to be of any help to Emery. My mate hadn't eaten at all. How he'd been able to heal himself from some sort of silver restraints without eating was a mystery to me. Normal wolves couldn't heal properly when their bodies weren't nourished or hydrated— I replayed the last thing he said to me, trying my best not to lose focus. I know he needed me strong more than anything else right now. Did you say you were beaten? I didn't want to hear his answer. Yes. The humans beat me. If Morteza hadn't showed up to kill them... Well, anyway, I, I've healed, but I'm nowhere near my normal strength. I squeezed my eyes shut, reaching out with all my senses. I knew he wasn't. I felt his weakness and fear of dying. He wasn't as healed as he said, but I knew the deception was only to save me from the pain he knew I'd feel. We were going to have a talk about honesty, once he'd come through all this. Still, I knew I needed to get to him as soon as I could. Greg's pack was ahead of me, already making their way toward him. They might get to him before I could. I wouldn't know until I got to shore and was able to pick up his scent. I'm coming, baby. I won't know how long it'll take me, but we're docking now, and then we'll pick up your scent. Just know I'm coming, Emery, and I'm so sorry. Oh, honey, none of that is important now. Just be careful, Castor. Mortes is out there somewhere, and he's a mean son of a bitch. It's occurred to me that leaving me here as bait might be his way of setting a trap for you. Maybe that's why I can't hear or sense any wolves around the house. That possibility had already crossed my mind. I know, love. I promise to be careful. They both scraped along the bottom of the river and came to an abrupt halt. We're here. We'll get to you as soon as we can, Em. I love you. I love you, my mate. See you soon, Castor. See you soon. Chapter 9 Prosper Woods Chronicle all the advice fit to print. Dear Krabby, let me start off by saying my wife and I love our pets. In fact, we spoil them all rotten. The problem lies in that I can't stop her from getting one cat tree after another. My living room is so full of them I can't see the TV anymore. I love my cats, but the trees are too much. What do I do? Signed, a long-suffering, crazy cat daddy who only wants to watch football. Dear a long-suffering, crazy cat daddy who only wants to watch football, I'd say you do indeed have a problem, but it's not with your wife. It sounds like she is the only one in the family who's not being selfish here. Providing cat trees for your animals is a wonderful thing, and is surely more entertaining viewing than any old football game. My best advice is to suck up your complaints and help her rake up those leaves. The carpet must be covered with them in the fall. Respectfully, Crabby. Castor. The moment I climbed out of the boat, I smelled Emery. His scent was strong here, but more than the odor of the human filth who kidnapped my mate, I also picked up the smell of a multitude of wolves— Several of them I was sure I'd scented before, and with a great deal of relief recognized them as Greg's pack members. I shifted, and the four werewolves I had with me did the same. We put our muzzles to the ground and walked in a circle until I worked out the direction Emery had been taken. Separating his scent from the others was as easy as it was heartbreaking for me. We took off running through the woods with determination, heading for Silver Springs Village, a small town on the opposite side of the river from Frederick, which Scott Templeton had described from his vision. He said Emery had been taken through the town headed to Clevesville. My nose told me we were going in the right direction. 
I'd never in my life been more single-minded in anything I'd ever done. Silver Springs Village was even smaller than what I'd seen of Frederick, where Greg's pack lived. Back before Greg took over the pack, Frederick had been a run-down mess of a town filled with ramshackle buildings, poverty-stricken residents, and the very least of small-town comforts. The drive into town had been little more than a rutted, muddy strip of tire-popping roadway, dividing crumbling buildings on either side of Main Street. Most residents didn't have indoor plumbing, and even Jedediah Eubanks, the postman, showed up only three times a week to deliver mail to a mail center filled with boxes— the entire town was undertaking renovations now that Floyd had stopped stripping its residents of taxes and its future looked brighter than ever. I'd never been to Silver Springs Village before, and the moment the five of us got within sight of the town in the late afternoon, I could see that, though smaller, it was clean and neat with flower boxes under the windows and a raised boardwalk which looked new, even at a distance. Brightly colored signs hung over businesses boasting of a dress shop, dry cleaners, corner market, and a country restaurant. If I wasn't dealing with the kidnapping of the man who was half my world, an upcoming war, and a dying father, I might have taken more time to linger. I pictured myself strolling hand in hand down Main Street with Emery, stealing kisses and sharing a piece of the homemade banana cream pie the restaurant boasted of on their signboard. As it was, my wolves and I skirted the town keeping to the woods to hide ourselves as much as possible as we passed through. Five huge wolves would have made a spectacle and possibly drawn gunfire had we been seen rolling down Main Street. Sire, there's a creek about a half mile from here. If we follow that, there's little chance the wolves who kidnapped your mate will pick up our scents, Reza told me telepathically. I glanced over at the wolf. He was big, one of the wolves who'd come over with my father's entourage. He, along with his companion, Farzad, had been unknown to me before deciding to stay and provide an extra layer of protection. Most of my father's party had returned to Tabriz to pack up the kingdom and return with all his goods, and anyone left in the castle complex's household who wished to return. I hadn't known these wolves until recently, but had been assured by both Clyde here in the States and Nima back home that they were trustworthy. That's a good idea. I agreed as long as we don't lose Emery's scent. If we do, we'll have to pick it up again, and time is of the essence. There's not much chance of losing the trail of those stinking humans, Thomas said. I looked at the wolf who walked beside James and nodded. I couldn't imagine how filthy these humans were. In my humble opinion, most of them stunk to high heaven, but the three who'd taken my mate had to be some of the vilest of creatures— they stank of sweat, ground in dirt, grease, and, worst of all, feces. I wondered if they'd been rolling around in the same clothes, unwashed for months, and suddenly had even more sympathy for Emery, who'd had to endure their presence ad nauseum. We headed away from the town, deeper into the Silver Springs forest, searching for the scent of water. Sure enough, in less than half a mile from the town we found it. I was awed by the picturesque setting of the mountains in the background as the sun set behind them, casting a rainbow of glittering colors which bounced off the creek's water. We ran to the shore and stepped into the water when, suddenly, my senses were assaulted as the breeze changed direction. On either side of the creek, wolves emerged from the cover of the thick sequoias and pine trees. I stopped in my tracks, with all four of my wolves flanking me on either side— as Morteza suddenly appeared in front of me. I couldn't believe my eyes, as the big black wolf I knew in the most carnal of ways smiled at me, letting his long pink tongue loll from his open mouth. He was beautiful as a wolf, huge with midnight black fur, almost as dark as his hair when he was human. I noticed gray whiskers sprouting from his muzzle a clear sign of age, the gray hadn't been there when I'd last seen him over ten years before. He was still gorgeous, but the glint in his black eyes was as dead as it had ever been. How I hadn't known what he was the moment I'd met him still surprised me. Knowing that he'd most likely had his hands on my beloved mate made me sick inside, and the urge to charge forward and kill him was nearly overwhelming. I breathed in deeply trying to not only calm my own nerves, but to try to pick up any scent of emery on him. 
If he'd so much as harmed one hair on my baby's head, I was going to rip him limb from limb or die trying. What are you doing here, Morteza? Where is my mate? I know you have him. The assassin shifted, and I noted with some chagrin that he was just as beautifully made in human form as he'd always been. Standing almost six foot four, he was covered with tawny skin and ropey muscles layered one on top of the other. Power radiated off him in waves, even in his inferior human form. As expected, his hair was shot through with a few strands of gray. He had white at the temples, and his longish goatee was graying as well. The overall look, without an ounce of fat on him where it didn't belong, made his form as mouth-watering to me as it had ever been. I still remembered the taste of him, and how willing he and Teo had been to take turns fucking me. The multitude of nights we'd spent sweating in my big bed had been eye-opening for a young and impressionable wolf like I'd been then. Even now, I realized those experiences and the way they'd been able to distance themselves from me emotionally, even though I'd tried desperately for more, had shaped the cold and distant man I'd been when I'd met Emery. That distancing had molded my very psyche, cutting me off from almost everyone emotionally. I'd been able to walk away from my father, my young son, and very nearly lost my beloved sister in the process. Seeing Morteza here and now brought up feelings and emotions I desperately wanted to forget, because I knew they'd serve no purpose here, only make me weaker when Emery needed me at my strongest. I shifted to face him like a man, while all the wolves that accompanied us both stayed in their animal forms to provide protection. I noted the five of us were greatly outnumbered by Morteza's werewolves, but felt only a momentary twinge of concern for it. I don't have your gorgeous Emery here, Cyrus. I, I mean, Castor. Strange name, that. He looked around, holding out his hands toward the ten or so wolves he had with him. As you can very well see, he's not with me. But you have seen him. I can smell him. He smiled evilly before crossing his arms over his broad chest. His long cock hung down between his legs, but I ignored it. The very sight which used to make my mouth water now only served to make me feel sick. I should have known the McCurdy would hire the assassin to kidnap my mate. The fact that I could smell Emery on his fur made me crazy. I prayed he hadn't raped my much smaller mate. I haven't raped him, Morteza said, reading me telepathically. He licked his lips and reached down to palm his big dick. Not that he wasn't tempting as hell. You do know how to pick the tightest and best arses. He chuckled, and I felt the hair on the back of my neck go up. If I'd been in wolf form, I would have flattened my ears to my head. You're disgusting. You used to like it when I talked dirty. Where is my mate, Morteza? His eyebrows climbed. You didn't really think you had any chance of winning this bullshit war with McCurdy, did you? We have sweet little Emery... Your father is dying, still being poisoned as we speak, and you are literally surrounded by some of the best fighters I have. There's no way out for you, Castor. Come with me now if you ever want to see Emery alive again. I stared at the assassin, loathing the very sight of him, hating the fact that he'd somehow gotten within ten miles of my mate and wanting nothing more than revenge. I assure you, these four wolves are trained fighters. I promise you the five of us will wipe the forest floor with you, and the ten wolves with you. You're the ones who stand no chance, Morteza. Give up now if you want us to spare your lives. Instead of showing any fear or backing down, he threw his head back and let out a belly laugh. Only a split second passed before Reza and Farzad suddenly turned and attacked Thomas and James, taking them to the ground in a blur of twisted limbs and grunts of pain. They never stood a chance as their windpipes were crushed in the rogue wolves' jaws. I was barely through my own shift when Morteza crashed into me in wolf form, rolling us both back into the water as he landed all four paws on my belly, ripping deeply into my abdominal muscles right through my heavy fur coat. 
I let out a yelp of pain as I tried to fight him off. My own claws dug into his shoulders in an attempt to get him to let go. We were well matched in size, but he had the advantage of surprise. The scent of my own blood filled my nostrils as pain lanced through me. I rolled until we were both on our sides, fighting to gain the upper ground. I managed to get close enough to bite him, and he wrenched away, howling as my incisors met inside his shoulder muscles. Blood filled my mouth, and for a few seconds I felt like all was not lost. When he managed to somehow maneuver me onto my back again, dunking me under and holding me there, I struggled to get free. I wanted to howl, feeling desperate as I realized I was holding my breath and rolled us, twisting until my head popped out of the water. Morteza was forced to let go, as I got to all fours and watched as he stepped back. I had no time to check the condition of my wolves, so I had only the gurgling whimpers to go by. With that as my only clue, I knew we were done for. Morteza's fighters were going at us from all sides. We were completely outnumbered, and with terrible resignation, I realized I wouldn't be able to hold out more than a few minutes at most. My bleeding wounds ran freely, and I felt myself weakening from the loss of blood. When the sound of howls suddenly erupted from the forest around us, my heart pounded wildly. My head shot around to look at the trees, and Morteza took that moment of distraction to leap at me, tackling me back into the creek once again. I struggled to fight him off, but out of the corner of my eye I caught a glimpse of wolves racing out from between the trees. My heart nearly shut down in terror. There was no way out of this. Suddenly, the scent hit me. These were allies. From Greg and Sam's pack. Their presence gave me new energy, and I fought with all my might, wrestling with Morteza, dodging his vicious fangs as he went for my throat, and finally getting onto all fours again. He leapt at me, attacking again. I slashed at him with my claws, catching the side of his jaw with one massive paw, and dragging my razor-sharp claws down his muzzle, opening the flesh there as he flinched back, howling in pain. Only a second passed before I caught the look of sheer terror in his eyes as he realized he and his warriors had been overrun by Greg's best fighters. Before I could process what was happening, Morteza made the first move, turning and running for the trees as fast as he could go. I took a deep breath, dragging air into my lungs as I assessed my wounds. I didn't know where the assassin was headed, but I knew it wouldn't be back to Clevesville or wherever he was keeping Emery. He'd known that's where I was headed as soon as I worked out who would be going with me. I looked around, ready to leap at whoever thought themselves brave enough to take on a wounded werewolf filled with rage and protective instincts for their mate, and was surprised to find no one. There weren't many, but every wolf standing was one of Greg's. I blew out a relieved breath and called out to Emery. I'm coming, love. Hold on. I'm almost there. Emery. I stood up and shifted into my wolf form the moment I caught a familiar scent on the air. My heart began racing as I realized both Greg and Sam were outside the house. With them were some other wolves, most likely from their pack. I didn't recognize any of their scents, but if they were with our friends, I knew things were going to be okay. When the sounds of fighting ensued, I was taken completely by surprise. My body really must have been shutting down if I hadn't been able to pick up the sense of the werewolves Morteza had left behind to guard me. I moved to the window and tried to get up on my hind legs so I could see out. The moment I did, my knees gave out, and I found myself in the middle of the floor, sitting on my arse looking up at the window. I shifted into human form, thinking I'd be able to heal faster. Having no control over my body was a freakish thing, and it had never happened before. I didn't even know how it could happen— and having thoughts I couldn't explain never boded well. I knew how my body was supposed to work in human and werewolf form. I read all the time. I'd powered through more than one werewolf anatomy book during my free time. I'd read that werewolves would die faster than humans if starved. They didn't carry a lot of fat reserves on their muscled frames. They'd die without food or water in a matter of days. Conversely, humans could live weeks without food wasting away as their body ate up their fat reserves as long as they had water. It seemed water was everything to every species. My brain seemed to be rambling, I observed from a detached distance. 
All I knew was I could feel my body shutting down. Living through this experience surely taught me one thing. Reading something and knowing it abstractly was much different than undergoing it in real life. The fighting outside the window continued for several minutes, and I prayed Greg and Sam could defeat whomever they were facing out there, together because they were fated mates, and maybe because Greg was the strongest alpha I'd ever met, they stood a better than average chance of coming out on top. When a strange wolf suddenly gave a final yelp, I knew it was all over. I stood and scrambled to the window, dragging the chair along with me. As soon as I looked out, I spotted my two friends running toward me in wolf form. They shifted to human the moment they saw my face in the window. Greg grinned at me. Uh, it's sure good to see you, Emery. Are you okay? I stuck one hand between the bars and squeezed his shoulder. I'm very weak. I haven't eaten anything since yesterday morning. Your eyes are all sunken in, Sam said, frowning at me as he took my hand and squeezed it. Let's get you out of there. I grinned. Thank you so much. I dropped down from the window as they ran out of my line of sight. Moments later, I heard them in the house. Someone was opening and closing what sounded like cabinet doors in a room down the hall. A moment later, I heard two sets of footsteps padding down the hall and realized they weren't wearing clothes and had no shoes. I glanced around the room as I heard them start to work on the locks outside the bedroom door. When my gaze landed on my clothes that had been tossed in the corner, I walked over and picked them up, shoving them into an empty grocery sack. I thought we'd be in wolf form when we left the house, since it was a much faster way to travel than in human form with no shoes. In a matter of minutes, the cursed door opened and Greg and Sam stood there smiling at me. I was overwhelmed with emotion and felt the tears coming on without warning. I launched myself at Greg, swept up in his big, warm embrace and felt like the weight of the world had been lifted off me. When he finally let me go, Sam took his turn. His body was stockier and shorter, and I fitted better in his arms than Greg's. The moment I thought it, I realized... There was only one man I needed to see. God, thank you so much, I said as soon as Sam turned me loose. I was too weak to move those bars even in wolf form. I pointed to the window behind me. We found granola bars and here, drink this. It was in the kitchen cabinet. Greg said, handing me two granola bars and a bottle of water. Wow, thanks. I... My sentence cut off in the middle as I cracked the bottle open and raised it to my mouth. The second the cool, clear water hit my tongue, I began to feel better. I drank greedily until I drained the bottle. I pulled it away from my mouth with a loud, <sighs> Both of them smiled, and Sam handed me a second bottle. Take this one, but drink it slower. There aren't any more, and you don't want to throw it up, he warned. I nodded and cracked the seal, taking a few sips before putting the lid back on. I tucked it into the sack with my clothes and opened one of the granola bars, after I, literally, wolfed it and the second one down, I turned to them. I need to get to Castor right away. If Morteza comes back with his wolves, we're going to be in trouble. I'm really in no condition to fight. I agree. <laughs> Let's go, Emery, Greg said. He turned, swinging a long arm around Sam's shoulders, and led me out of the house the way they'd apparently come in. The moment we got to the end of the hall, the putrid scent of decaying human flesh hit my nostrils. I almost gagged and threw up right then and there. Sure enough, the remains of what looked to be my three human kidnappers were scattered in literal pieces all over the front room of the house. The walls and ceiling were splashed with so much blood it looked like someone had thrown buckets of red paint at them. The floors literally ran with blood which pulled toward the center where apparently there was a low point in the floor. It was the most horrifying sight I've probably ever seen. Greg and Sam hurried to the front door, and I followed right behind, anxious to get away from not only the smell, but the sight of fresh corpses torn to shreds, just as the assassin had promised they would be. We stepped outside into the cool night air, and I spotted two wolves which I recognized as members of Greg's pack. I acknowledged them with a tiny wave, and they nodded, smiling back at me. I lifted my face, looking up at the gorgeous, nearly full flower moon. In two days it would be completely round, and I was looking forward to running in Prosper Woods with my beloved mate. I realized how desperate I was to see him, 
It felt like someone had hollowed out my chest. I needed my heart back, and I wouldn't be okay until I was back in his arms. Greg stopped and turned my way. We should take the long way home. I nodded. I need to talk to Castor first. I know he came after me, but I don't know where he is. Do what you gotta do, Emery, Sam said. Greg and I are gonna check the immediate area, and we'll meet you back here in a minute or so. Before I could reply, he and Greg shifted and ran off into the forest with their two packmates following. Castor? I'm free. Greg and Sam arrived and got me out. Where are you? Thank God, Im. How old are you? I could hear the hesitancy in his question, and it was heartbreaking to hear. They found water. I'm going to be okay as long as we don't run into trouble on the way home. Wait for me, Emery. I'll be there in a few minutes. Something was wrong. I sensed it. How many guards are with you, Castor? He hesitated just a moment. Castor? Three. They're all from Greg's pack. Where are the guards you brought with you? This time there was no hesitation. Did. Morteza and his wolves jumped us. Two of the four guards I brought with me turned out to be spies for McCurdy. They turned on Thomas and James and killed them before they even knew what was happening. My heart was in my throat. So there's only three of you and Morteza is still out there? No one else is protecting you? I felt panic beginning to rise in my chest as I spotted Greg and Sam returning. I waved them over and they came running. Sam and Greg are here. We'll wait for you, Castor. I have three of Greg's pack with me. They know exactly where you are. We'll be there soon. Stay with the Alpha and his mate and their pack mates. They're trustworthy and they'll protect you, love. Hurry, Castor. Hang in there. I'm coming, Emery. I glanced at Sam and Greg. He's with three of your pack. They're on the way here, and he wants us to wait for him. I told them. They both nodded. Fair enough, Greg said. We picked up the sense of more wolves out in the forest. If I had to make an <laughs> educated guess, I'd say they're more of Morteza's. I know they're not from my pack. It's best we wait for reinforcements anyway. I nodded, looking around and noticing the three dead men in the yard for the first time. I hadn't even bothered to look until now. They must have been the werewolves Sam Gregg and their guards dispatched. I turned and glanced at my two larger friends, ever so grateful that they were here helping out. I felt those pesky tears burning behind my eyes and deliberately sucked them back. The last thing I wanted was for these brave wolves to see me crying like a little girl. I turned away, walking over to the line of trees where Greg and Sam had said Morteza's wolves were. As much as I didn't want anything to do with that psychopath or any of his traitorous wolves, I felt the overwhelming urge to scream into the trees and taunt him, daring them to come and get me now that I had allies. I knew it was foolish, but I hated the assassin with every fiber of my being, and I wanted to show him I was strong. I wanted to show all of them that I wasn't the cowardly, weak little maid of Prince Castor. Morteza made me feel like less of a person and that very fact made me madder than anything else. I paced. Where the hell is Castor? I could feel Greg and Sam watching out for me, even though I deliberately didn't look at them. I wondered what they thought of me. Did they think I was weak? It doesn't matter what they think, Castor said. I looked up, seeing him walking toward me, naked and covered in sweat. The expression on his face and his beautiful eyes... I ran to him, and he caught me, folding me into his embrace against the broad chest that I adored. In an instant, he was there, my man, my wolf. I thought of no one else in my darkest hours with Morteza. Emory, my mate, my love. He crooned into my hair. I shivered at the growl in his words. I hugged him tightly as his hands roamed over my skin. I absolutely knew he might be checking me for wounds, but I didn't care. I didn't care one little bit. I love you, I love you, I love you. I whispered against his chest. He held on to me until I lifted my face, and then he stared down into my eyes. His were filled with tears. He framed my face with both hands and leaned down to kiss my nose. 
I thought I'd lost you. Never. I'm right here, Castor. He stared at me for a few seconds before letting me go and looking me up and down as if checking every inch of skin he might have missed with his hands. When he was satisfied, he pulled me back into his arms and kissed me soundly. I melted against his frame, not caring that Greg, Sam, and the other wolves were all standing nearby. I'm so sorry for saying all that crap to you back at the house, he said, leaning back so he could stare into my eyes. The look in his own eyes was devastating. I didn't mean any of it. I lifted a hand and covered his soft lips with one finger, shaking my head. Don't, don't say that. It's already forgotten, sweetheart. He stared at me for a second and then leaned down, sweeping my mouth into another devastating kiss. My heart was racing as he ravaged my mouth. The world spun away as the two of us stood in the middle of the forest with dead bodies and the possibility of more danger. I didn't think about any of it. With Castor's tongue in my mouth teasing me, tasting me, the fact that there were other wolves here watching every single thing we were doing didn't seem to matter. Only we did at this moment. The fact that my love was here stealing my very breath with his devastating kisses was all that mattered. When we finally broke apart this time, we were both panting, panting and hard. I looked around, anxious for some immediate alone time. None of the wolves Castor said he brought with him were around, and neither were Sam or Greg or their wolves. With great relief, I realized that they'd probably found a way to stay nearby and yet still give us a little privacy. I grabbed his hand and pulled him toward the far side of the house, where there was a gated area enclosing a patch of clover I could smell in what might have once been a small garden. Castor chuckled. <laughs> where are you going? I looked up at him. Where do you think? I need my man. He laughed. Only you would think of fucking me out in the open where anyone can see us. I smirked. I'm not going to be the one doing the fucking. I pulled open the gate. It squealed on rusted hinges. I ignored it and stepped into the walled-off area. Just as I had hoped, the spot beside the house had a carpet of grass and clover. I smiled, looking around. Now... What are we going to use as lube? Chapter 10 Prosper Woods Chronicle All the Advice Fit to Print Dear Krabby, I need your sound advice. Now, don't get me wrong. I don't hate holidays. I just hate it when my whole family gets together. Seeing all the little children is always nice, but let me tell you, some of their parents are a horror. My Aunt Edna, for example, she's a lush of the highest caliber, and she gets mean when she drinks. What subtle way would you suggest uninviting her to family gatherings next time? Sign, Holidays Are Hell Dear Holidays Are Hell, I can tell you are a nice person just for asking this question. In Krabby's mind, there is no problem here. If someone misbehaves at one of my holiday dinners, I'd have show them the door. Then again, if you think she's a lush of the highest caliber, I'd tell you to go to the gun store immediately. Surely there must be something of a higher caliber there. If a Mac-10 or an Uzi won't suffice, try a shoulder-mounted grenade. Those are always fun on the 4th of July. Remember this, keep your hands at 10 and 2 and aim high and steering. Respectfully, Crabby. Emery. Castor let out a low growl. Get over to that wall and brace yourself. When I get finished with you, you won't need any lube. I instantly complied, grinning as I assumed the position, widening my stance and holding my arms against the wall of the house as if I was a suspect about to be frisked. I glanced over my shoulder as he dropped to his knees behind me. As I expected, only a moment passed before he was pulling my arse cheeks apart, I wanted to howl for joy. The first swipe of his tongue made me gasp. I lowered my face and rested my forehead on the cold clapboard wall of the house. When it's 
peeling paint scraped my skin? I rethought that, and folded my arms, cradling my head against them as I readied myself. All I could think was that if Castor was going to rim me out here where everyone could see, I was going to lose my mind. Sure enough, he moaned and stabbed his tongue into my bottom, sucking and laving until I was making mewling noises into my crossed arms. Thought I'd missed this. It felt like weeks had gone by since he'd had me in his arms, but it had really been only a couple of days. I panted as he sucked and poked, licking and laving my hole until my knees were ready to go out from under me. I could smell my pre-cum and knew it was sliding out of the tip of my cock. I reached down, circling my throbbing shaft. It was slick. I stroked it slowly, squeezing the slick head and pushing a fingernail into the slit. I hissed as I felt my entire body shudder with pleasure. The way Castor played in my hole, endlessly licking and sucking, turning me inside out, had me so close to orgasm I began to shake. When he finally pulled back and stood behind me, running his hands over my abdomen and pressing me back against his own massive erection, I was thrumming with need and desire. I need to be inside you, Emery. He growled at my ear. But I can't take the chance of being locked up with you if the assassin comes back. I hadn't even thought of that. Oh, that's okay, baby. I'm creative. Lie on your back. I smiled and turned in his arms, taking the lips he offered in a quick, hot kiss before sinking to the ground and pulling him down with me. In seconds, I was flat on my back, lying on a bed of soft grass, and he had reversed himself, straddling me so that his cock bobbed in front of my face. I liked this plan. I immediately reached up and took him in hand, guiding him into my mouth as he did the same to me. Castor's cock was beautiful, large and thick with a ruddy tip that begged for my mouth. The bead of pre-cum which leaked from the slit made my mouth water. I licked my lips a second before reaching around and taking both of his muscled arse cheeks into my hands and bringing him down even closer. He sucked the head of my cock into his mouth. At the same moment, I did exactly the same to him. My mate's taste exploded on my tongue. I groaned as I swallowed around the big head, tasting his pre-cum. This position was raw and nasty. Just knowing that the other wolves might come by and see us this way turned me on even more. I loved the very idea of being caught in the act. When this threat to our lives was said and done, I was going to ask Castor to help me explore this fantasy. Right now, though, damn, he tasted amazing, and that was all that mattered. He groaned, and the way it felt to be so open and vulnerable to him was as sexy as hell. I sucked hard as he pushed in deep, so deep his cock gagged me, bringing tears to my eyes. I didn't care. I wanted him to fuck my mouth. I groaned around his big cock, loving the way it felt as solid as steel in my mouth. Castor began pushing in and pulling out in short, deliberate thrusts. I mirrored his motions, lifting my bottom from the ground and doing the same to him as his head bobbed above my groin. I swallowed again, milking out his pre-cum, readying myself for his big load. We usually made love once or twice a day, sometimes more. He had been saving it up for two days. I couldn't wait to drink all of him down. I heard him groan again, and I squeezed his arse muscles hard, holding him close to my face, opening my throat to take as much of his length as I dared. When he suddenly began jerky thrusts, I knew it was only a matter of time. The time came only moments later when he let out a loud whine around my dick and filled my mouth with cum. His climax triggered my own. Then I came, emptying myself into his mouth, filling him up even as I was convinced he was trying to drown me. Castor pulled out after the initial wave of his climax, letting my cock go, and reversed himself, drawing me back into his arms and kissing me soundly. I took him in hand, jacking him and staring deeply into his eyes as his orgasm continued. The way he smiled at me, looking like he wanted to eat me up, made my heart melt. It took several minutes for him to finish his climax, even though he hadn't nodded. He never did when I was sucking him off, but that didn't make his release any less intense or shorter in duration, or less sexy as hell. 
When he finally leaned back, looking up at the moon and panting, I let go of his cock. I couldn't believe how much I adored the wolf who adored me right back. safe here. Castor said, I just had to have you. I chuckled. I know. I'm not complaining. We got up and shifted to our wolf forms before leaving the garden. I made a mental note of where the house was so that I could drag him back here and repeat the last half hour at some future time when we weren't being hunted. Right now, I couldn't think of anything but getting home to the king, Violet, and our sweet Little Oliver. Castor. It felt like an endless journey home, when in reality taking the long way through the forest to avoid running into Morteza and his wolves put the timeline closer to a couple of hours. The most difficult part of the trek was finding a boat to carry all of us back across the river. When we located the flat-bottomed barge the humans had used to take Emery across, we were thrilled, since we didn't have to split up. I really wasn't all that surprised to find what I did when we finally returned. The Prosper Woods bed and breakfast was completely enveloped by a glowing, red, pulsating bubble. From its foundation to the top of the tallest roof with a weather vane on top, the bubble encompassed the building. I'd seen Sid do this before, when we were about to be attacked by Floyd Reardon's mercenary wolf pack. Still, the old witch had a power I almost couldn't describe or even fathom— the bubble itself seemed to be made of some sort of glowing, red, spiderweb-like threads with one long strand leading to the front porch, where Sid stood holding up his staff. Red lightning sparked and swirled along the length of the rod, and the very magic of it astounded me. Wow, that's just... wow, Emery said telepathically. I turned to look at my mate who'd stopped beside me, flanked by Greg, Sam, and the wolves we brought with us. It's cool, right? Sam asked. I looked over Emery's shoulder to the brown werewolf with the white stripe running from the center of his forehead down his neck and continuing for the length of his body to his tail. In human form, Sam had the same skunk stripe in his hair. There was a time when I'd wanted to sleep with him more than anything. He'd always been in love with Greg, though. 
They'd grown up as best friends in the same pack, and were surprised when they'd finally realized they were meant to be together as men. I can understand how strange it must have been when they worked out they were actually true mates fated by Mother Nature, two halves of the same coin. I glanced over at my love and smiled at him. Emery was mine, and every way a mate could be, and I thanked God every day for bringing him to me. Cool, Emery agreed. I laughed. Emery had been raised in Tabriz, but after coming to the U.S. he'd quickly learned American idioms and slang. I loved that he was so smart and found myself incredibly anxious for this conflict to end so I could bring his mother over. I really wanted to meet her. I knew it would make Emery incandescently happy to have her here with us, and keeping him that way was my ultimate goal in life. His other great love was our library of ancient and sacred documents pertaining to the werewolf world. Since the Howardsaday clan had stayed in the royal seat for centuries, we'd become accustomed to being the custodians of the books and documents which were technically supposed to be kept under authority of whichever king sat on the throne— Another reason for me wanting to win this war was the knowledge that placing our history and our legacy as members of the First House in the hands of Alistair McCurdy would be devastating. I'd never taken any interest in knowing what the tomes, scrolls, and dusty old parchment maps contained, but if they were anything like the books Vincent had in his care, the possession of them could be used for good or evil. The rogue vampires who came to Prosper Woods to destroy Vincent to get their hands on those tomes had known the secrets they contained, secrets like the key to immortality. If McCurdy had knowledge of something that powerful, all bets would be off. I couldn't let that happen on my watch. How do we get in, Prince Caster? I looked over to the Alpha who'd asked the question. Before approaching the inn, we'd taken great pains to make sure that Morteza's forces weren't anywhere around the inn or hiding close by in the nearby forest— I had to admit, I was just happy to be home. The past forty-eight hours had been terrible. Finding out that my father was being poisoned, and then realizing I'd driven the one man I loved more than anyone into the arms of an assassin, had nearly brought me to my knees. If it hadn't been for the fact that I had good people standing with me like Greg in his pack, I don't know what I would have done. I'd most certainly have died at Morteza's fangs if it hadn't been for the Alpha's reinforcements showing up just in the nick of time. My poor Emery would have possibly been raped after my death. Worse, he might have been turned over to McCurdy, or kept prisoner for Morteza in the filthy plans my mate told me he'd read in the assassin's thoughts. Sid, I shouted. The old man turned my way. We're clear. Let us in. With a nod, I watched the lightning cut off from around his staff, and the bubble became slowly darker until it vanished entirely. I nodded to Greg and Sam and put my arm around Emery before leading him and the rest of our entourage up the stairs into the inn. I wasn't surprised to find Clyde on his knees, genuflecting with his face to the ground when we all filled the foyer. I looked up and noticed Lyra, Jacob, Vincent, and Rome all coming out of the parlor. Oliver and Hannibal weren't with them, but I picked up the boys' sins from the room beyond, along with the steady heartbeat of children sleeping. They must have bedded down in the parlor for safety with their adult guards all around them. Sire, please, do as you wish with me, Clyde said into the thick carpet, bringing my attention back to the guard. I accept any punishment you choose with grace. I could feel the man's fear. It radiated off him in waves, and yet the quiet resolve he also felt was easy enough to pick up. I used telepathy to listen to him. He hadn't blocked me, but left the picture of how he had run background checks on all of Nima Shirazi's men when they came over. I also read how he wasn't exactly sure of Nima's innocence in all of this. Though Shirazi had been with our family for a long time— I wouldn't put it past McCurdy to find just the right thing to bribe my top security expert with. I just couldn't imagine what on earth Nima had been promised, though the betrayal ultimately lay with him. There wasn't a doubt in my mind he knew exactly who he was sending along to guard my father. McCurdy's reach among my personnel was astounding. 
I did know there was at least one last agent of his to deal with. Someone had gotten close enough to my father to poison him on a regular basis. Right now, though, I had a man who I'd considered a trusted employee, offering up his very life for letting things slip through his fingers. I looked away from Clyde to Emery, who was squeezing my hand very hard. The expression on his face was pleading. What is it? I asked, knowing I sounded irritable. I know you don't want me involved in big decisions or in the business of running your household, Caster, but I think we should both talk about this before you sentence Clyde to, I don't know, death or something, Emery said quietly. It didn't really matter how he said it. Every member of my household, with the exception of the humans, could hear him. The fact that he was even questioning my handling of this undermined whatever I decided to do now. If I sentenced Clyde to death, though I'd be justified in doing so for this crime, I'd look to some like I was overcompensating and emotional due to my father and Emery being the target of assassins. If I didn't sentence Clyde to death, I'd look weak because Emery had told me not to kill him. Yeah, he was right. He had no business in my business. If I hadn't just gotten him back, I might have strangled him myself. Instead... I ignored his plea entirely and turned to Clyde. Get up. We'll discuss your failures and how I plan on dealing with him in private. I shot Emery a withering glare before turning back to the werewolf in front of me. You might not have known about the wolves he sent over, but your background checks should have been the most important assignment you've ever undertaken. Know this. You have failed and failed me miserably, Clyde. You will not be staying on as my head of security. Of that you can be certain. Now get up and go to your room. I'll deal with you later. Yes, sire. Oh, and one more thing. I should probably tell you that I put Bobak, one of your father's bodyguards, under guard along with Carolyn, one of Lady Violet's maids. Claudio alerted me when he overheard them talking about how they were going to get a missive back to McCurdy, Clyde said, keeping his head bowed. That's very good. Where is this hero? I asked. I'm here, sire. Claudio walked out of the parlor, and I watched Emery throw his arms around his friend. Thank you, Claudio, I said, shaking the man's hand. Maybe I should put you in charge of security. I threw Clyde a withering glance. We'll discuss the terms of your demotion when this is all over. You're dismissed. Go back to your room. Now. I watched Clyde do as I commanded, getting to his feet and staying in a bow for longer than was necessary before he turned and headed out of the room, down the hall, toward the kitchen and back door. When he was gone, I looked at Emery, who was watching me with a serious, though grudgingly admiring expression on his face. He suddenly smiled and gave my hand a tighter squeeze. I blew out a long breath. Let's find my father. I turned to Greg and Sam and the wolves they had brought with them. Can you stay? I'll compensate you and the pack for all your help, Alpha. I don't trust any of my own guards now. I need your pack. Greg bowed as did Sam. We're at your service, Prince Castor, he said. The only compensation I need is knowing that my king and his heir are safe until the threat is gone. I can't tell you how much we appreciate that, Alpha, Emery said. We... Whatever he was going to say was cut off when a blood-curdling scream came from upstairs. Before I could move, a violet came charging into view on the upper landing. Her face was white. I sprinted for the stairs, taking them two at a time as several others followed me. When I got to Violet, she was visibly shaking. Is it father? I grasped her outstretched hands. No, it's Molson. Someone killed him. Who the hell is Molson? One of your father's valets, Emery said. I turned to my mate to see him shaking as well. Stay here. I looked up and gestured to Greg. Would you and Sam stay with him? Of course, Greg said, nodding quickly. As I ran down the hall, Emery grabbed my sleeve. I shook my head. Emery, stay here. He let go, and I continued down the hall with Vincent, 
and Rome following. At my father's door, I hesitated only a moment before pushing inside. My father sat on one of the couches in the suite's sitting room. When he looked up, I recognized the look of despair on his face. He was alone, and the scent of blood was thick in the room. Father, where's your valet? He lifted a shaking hand and pointed to a door which was open just a crack. Since his suite was identical to my own, I knew he was pointing to the large walk-in closet which doubled as a dressing room. I began heading toward it when Rome stopped me with two words. Hang on. When I turned to look at him, I was surprised to see that he'd pulled the gun from the holster he wore at his belt. Unless that has silver bullets. Trust me, in this town that's the only ammunition I use these days, the sheriff assured me. I nodded and let him precede me to the closet door. He cracked the door open farther, using the barrel of his gun, flipped on the light and checked the room before holstering it. It's clear. I joined him at the door and leaned in, spotting the body lying in a pool of drying blood. A young man lay on the floor, staring sightlessly at the ceiling. He couldn't have been more than sixteen or seventeen years old. I remembered Emery telling me that he was one of three valets who'd come to America with my father. This one, and another about the same age, assisted my father when Emery wasn't working. We'd had our first argument as mates when he told me that he was planning on keeping his job even after we were mated. I remembered him pushing back and telling me that he'd made my father a promise, and it was his obligation and duty— Besides, he'd argued, how would it look to the other two junior valets if he simply decided that since he was mated, he was no longer required to do his duty? Looking down at this young wolf with a gaping hole in his throat made me realize that this young boy, barely old enough to shave, could have been my Emery. It isn't me, Castor. I turned to see Emery standing in the doorway with Greg behind him. The alpha looked guilty and the expression on my mate's face was one of total devastation. Of course he had read that in my mind. I told you to wait out in the hall. I growled. I didn't know if it was safe or not. Tears filled his eyes, and the sorrow I read in my mate's thoughts made me feel like a total jerk. I walked over to him and pulled him into my arms. He hugged me tightly as the scent of his tears hit my nostrils. He was only sixteen. Who would do this? Emery said into my shirt. I don't know. We'll find out. He suddenly pulled back and looked up at my face. Where's Amir? I frowned. Who's Amir? The other valet? Emery said, pulling out of my arms. He walked back into the suite and I followed. Have you seen Amir, Highness? Emery asked my father. No, Emery, I haven't seen him since, and I guess it was before dinner. When Violet and I came up here, we, we thought this suite quite empty and, until she went into the closet to get my pajamas. Until we smelled their blood, Violet said. I looked up, spotting my sister, standing just inside the room. She looked just as white as she had when I'd seen her on the landing down the hall. You haven't seen Amir either? No. Welcome back, by the way, she said, walking over and hugging me. She turned to Emery, pulling him into her arms next. You gave us a hell of a scare. You should have seen Castor. I've never seen my brother so worried in my life. I'm just glad to be back, Violet, Emery said, hugging my sister back. When she turned him loose, he came back to stand at my side. I could feel the exhaustion on him. I knew all he'd wanted to do was take a hot bath and crawl into bed in my arms as soon as we got home. A murder under my own roof was not what either of us had planned on dealing with. He looked up at me. We have to find Amir. Do you think he's capable of doing something like this to Molson? Weren't they friends? I asked. You think Amir did this? Emery's eyebrows climbed almost into his hairline. Well, since he's missing, I think it's a good bet. We won't know anything until we find him, though. I turned to find Rome, walking toward me with Vincent by his side. The expression on the vampire's face was grave, as was the sheriff's. I don't know what to tell you. It's clear what he died from. From what I can see, nothing is disturbed in there or out of place. That tells me there wasn't a struggle. 
He was simply surprised as soon as he walked into the dressing room. Rome said, That means he had to be waiting for him when he walked in, or it was someone he knew. Does anyone else have access to the king's suite, other than the missing ballet, I mean? Vincent asked. No, Castor made sure the house guards were doubled before he left to find Emery. Violet replied, And even if a stranger got into the house somehow, we would have smelled him immediately. You can understand that, surely. Vincent nodded. Yes, vampires have a similar ability to pick up scents. I don't smell any strange scents in here, I said. I turned and looked at Emery, whose eyes were as round as saucers. I'm sorry, honey. I'm pretty sure Amir is the one who did this. I know. If it wasn't him, why isn't he here? It has to be, but I don't understand why he'd kill Molson. The doctor said someone has been poisoning father since before they even came to America. Violet said. When he looked at the MRI, he detected a severely enlarged liver, which means that he was right about his initial diagnosis. I felt somewhat terrible. I hadn't even bothered to ask Violet or my father what the outcome of that test was since I was so wrapped up in getting to Emery on time. It has to be him here, then. He has to be the one who killed Mosin. Maybe Mosin suspected him of poisoning the king, or even caught him in the act of putting it in his food or tea, Emery said. And there's something else you should know, said Violet. The girl spy regained consciousness and told us what McCurdy had planned. He was going to use Emery as a leverage, not start a war as we feared. We know, I said. Morteza told Emery. Violet gasped. Morteza, of course, she said in disgust. Who else would have morals that low? Another thing you should know in light of Molson's murder. The girl, the spy for us. I've just realized she was Molson's sister. My heart sank, and I could feel everyone else's similar reaction. The twisted piece of fate had not dealt a kind blow to this family, and their loyalty to mine would be repaid somehow. Emery turned and walked over to my father, dropping down to both knees and taking his bony hands in his as he bowed his head. I'm so sorry, Highness. I should have known somehow. My father reached out and patted the top of Emery's head, and I felt my heart in my throat. You couldn't have possibly known, Emery. You're a good boy. There, there, son. He lifted Emery's chin so he could look him in the eye. Now that we know what caused this blasted illness, it'll get better. Is that true? I asked. The damage to your liver isn't permanent. It's true, Violet said. When I looked at her, I noticed she was smiling. Doc Baker said in a human it would have been fatal, but werewolves are much stronger and exceedingly resilient. Papa should make a full recovery now that we know Amir can't get to him any more. I finally smiled, feeling calm wash over me. That's such a relief. Now I'm going to find that bastard and tear him into pieces. Sire! Someone shouted from the hall. There were running footsteps and two of my guards appeared in the doorway. You'd better come quickly, Prince Castor. What is it? Several werewolves are here, sire. Who are they? The big one told me to tell you, Alistair McCurdy is here for your head. Chapter 11 Prosper Woods Chronicle, All the Advice Fit to Print Dear Krabby, I have a problem and I hope you can help. We've been going to the same church for more than a decade and I love our pastor. The problem lies in that I can't stand our Sunday school teacher. Today, when my seven-year-old got home, he told me about the discovery of the Dead Sea Scrolls. He didn't understand how they were found and preserved. I think that teacher needs to do a better job. How do I tell my pastor to hire someone who's competent? Signed, Ready to Find Another Church Dear Ready to Find Another Church, 
My advice is this. Instead of complaining about your Sunday school teacher, jump in there and make the Sundays yourself. Crabby always says, if you don't like the way it's done, do it yourself. I will give you one piece of advice, though. Pick some delicious flavors. I'm sure none of the ladies in my church make Sundays with Dead Sea Squirrel Preserves. That sounds kind of awful. No wonder you're upset. Respectfully, Crabby. Emery. I stared at Castor in shock. Of course I'd known the probability of McCurdy showing up was high, especially after Morteza disappeared the way he had. I just hadn't expected him and his wolves to show up so soon. From what I knew, they weren't ready for a war, and I hadn't had a chance to tell Castor this. He took my hand and squeezed. We knew this was coming. Let's go and see what that bastard wants. But Castor... I could hear the fearful tremble in my voice and hated that I was so transparent. I didn't want my mate to know how scared I was for all of us or to have him feel I didn't trust him to take care of me or our people. Maybe McCurdy had decided without me as leverage he'd have to declare war anyway. It's okay. I have this. He cut me off, smiling at me, when he darted a glance at Benson and Rome, giving them the tiniest nod of the head, I was so surprised I was almost certain I'd imagined it. I immediately reached out telepathically, and to my shock, found that he'd blocked me. Let's go. Castor tugged on my hand, and I followed him dumbly through the house all the way to the front door. I could hear the others coming along behind us, and wasn't surprised when I stepped outside to find a bunch of people filling the yard in the end's parking lot. At the front stood Alastair McCurdy, matchmaker Arliss, and Morteza. I wasn't the least bit surprised. The hundred or so people with them were all large men, and I could tell from their sense I was looking at werewolves. Honestly, it was hard to imagine werewolves, regardless of the clan, turning against their king, and yet I was a witness to the traitors right here in my front yard. What an unpleasant surprise. What gives you the nerve to show up on my land with this show of force, McCurdy? Castor said. You knew I was coming? Aye, you knew this would happen the minute you chose to throw away my daughter with such disrespect. And for what? So you could lie with a fatherless cur who has no lineage, no station? You and your father have disgraced the first house, and I told you the last time I was here, you'd pay for it. This is only the beginning. McCurdy turned away and swept out an arm to the werewolves crowding the front of our house. Even now, hundreds more troops are headed to Prosper Woods. That's a lie. You haven't paid your troops in months, I shouted, ignoring Castor as he turned to look at me with an unreadable expression. Morteza himself told me that you planned on taking over the throne yourself after orchestrating not only the death of the king, but the death of my mate after he'd fathered Penelope's child who you'd control— that's what your plan has been all along. Do you deny using your daughter in furtherance of your own power? McCurdy's face grew redder than I'd ever seen it, even when he had stormed into the house to pack the night Castor announced he had found his true mate and wasn't marrying Penelope. Well, it seems Morteza has a big mouth, McCurdy said, glaring at the assassin who simply grinned in that evil way which sent a chill down my spine. He turned back to us. I'm not here to have this common cur talk to me this way, Castor. I'm here to offer you the chance to willingly surrender. If you do, I will spare your life and that of your mate. I'll make sure you're locked away, of course. That can't be helped. I will never surrender to you, McCurdy. I'm ashamed to have ever contemplated joining our two families and clans together. Castor said, That was my father's wish and I was honoring him in so doing. Fortunately for all of us, the promise of my wedding brought my father and my mate to the States in time to save me from this scheme you now admit to. He looked out at all the wolves he had with him. Some of them were looking at McCurdy with frowns on their faces, and I wondered whether Castor's words had gotten through to any of them. Now that your werewolves know your true intentions, I wonder how long they'll stay loyal to you. I especially enjoyed the part about them not getting paid for the opportunity to shed blood for you. That kind of thing always inspires men to die for a cause. Shut up! You don't know what you're talking about! McCurdy shouted. He turned to his wolves. 
It's time we take back the first house for the McCurdy clan. Aye, who's with me? The wolves on the lawn started yelling, and I watched them shift in a matter of seconds. Clothes were ripped to shreds, shoe leather split, and fur fangs and claws appeared. Howls rent the air as McCurdy's wolves didn't even stop to undress. I looked up at my mate with a feeling of complete and utter panic, but caught my breath at the expression of complete peace on his face. For a moment, I wondered whether he had gone completely mad. When the flap of wings overhead drew my attention, I looked up and was stunned to see seven midnight blue winged unicorns circling above us. One blue fire, and then another. What the fuck are those? I barely breathed the words. Those are my champions, Rome said from behind me. I turned and found the unicorn king, my friend, looking up at the creatures. Beside Rome was a black man I'd never seen before. From his scent, I knew he was a werewolf, but he wore a strange horn on a cord around his neck. Rome looked down at me and held out his hand to the man beside him. Sorry, this is Terry Freeman, leader of my champions. The dark man sketched a quick bow. He was very tall. It was so strange to see him bowing at me, but I acknowledged him with a nod of my head. As I thought about what Rome said, the meaning of the words suddenly dawned on me. My glance slid back to Morteza, who was watching the champions. He'd been the one to tell me of the winged unicorns who'd come looking for me. I hadn't seen them that night. The humans had managed to take me all the way upriver by barge before unloading my unconscious body and spiriting me off before these champions ever got a glimpse of me. Looking at them now, well, I was simply stunned to see such incredibly regal creatures. I think you have things wrong, McCurdy. You can simply order your wolves to shift back, or they will find themselves dead. And that goes for you, too, Castor said, drawing my attention back to my mate. No one threatens my home and gets away with it. McCurdy laughed. <laughs> I heard about your winged freaks. Do you really think that can stop me? Look at how outnumbered you are. With these wolves, I plan to take you a prisoner if you don't voluntarily surrender the throne tonight. And the other thousand troops I have coming in the morning? Well, I think you should just admit here and now that you don't stand a chance against me. That's where you're wrong, McCurdy, Castor said. You're the one who's miscalculated. I was surprised when a cell phone suddenly started up a persistent ringing. I looked around to see where it was coming from. Oh, shoot. That's me. Oh, sorry. I twisted to find the king himself walking out of the house supported by a cane on one side and Violet on the other. Violet, dear, would you get that for me? Of course, Papa. I watched in amusement as Violet stopped beside my father-in-law and reached into his pocket. She retrieved a phone and handed it to the king. He swiped it and answered the call, lifting it to his ear in that shaky way some elderly people do. You're here? There was a pause, and I was slightly surprised when no one, not even McCurdy, interrupted the king's call. See? Si? Molto bene. Eccellente. Ci vediamo allora. He hung up the phone. My Italian wasn't very good, but I did know a few words. Who was that, Highness? I asked. The king smiled broadly as he walked up to stand beside Castor. I hurried to get a chair and pushed it close so the king could settle into it. Thank you, Emery. That was Mario Fico, and he was just calling to tell me that he's arrived with the wedding party as well as 2,500 of his own troops. The king replied, Wedding party? Castor asked, looking as shocked as I was. I turned to the king and tried to read his thoughts, but he'd blocked them, no doubt from everyone, judging by the devilish look in his eyes. What's going on, father? Castor asked. Well, you know there are three clans existing as members of the first house. You see two of them represented here, son. He waved his hand at the yard where McCurdy's wolves stood listening. Everyone, it seems, but uh, Violet and I forgot that there is a third and very important clan in Italy. Mario Fico is the head of that clan, and his eldest son, Diego, 
has been looking for a wife for a while now. Since he came to me first, I sat down with Violet and had a nice conversation with my only and most beloved daughter. Is this true, sister? Are you getting married, and are you really happy with this man? Castor asked. Violet smiled, and I couldn't help noticing how radiant she looked. Yes, Diego is lovely. We met many years ago at a ball in Iran. It was shortly before your own engagement was announced back home. I was enchanted, and if things hadn't changed, I would have probably wed him back then. If things hadn't changed, Castor asked. Suddenly I watched something dawn on him. Wait, you mean because you followed me to the States after I fled Iran, Violet? Hearing the pain in Castor's words made me so sad. I'd known Violet had given up a lot when she'd come here, but I had no idea she'd walked away from someone she loved to be by Castor's side in his hour of grief. All of that is water under the bridge, Castor. Papa has found a way for me to be happily married to the man I wanted all along. Diego's first wife also died in childbirth, and his only heir did as well. When he put out feelers for a wife, everything came together. This marriage is one of love. It's not an arrangement only for the sake of saving the first house from Alistair McCurdy and his filthy pack of the wolf traitors you see represented on my lawn. What? McCurdy bellowed. That's right, McCurdy. When you wouldn't leave well enough alone after you left here crying about how you were so wronged, I thought I needed an ally in this war. So I called my old friend Mario. The king said, Did you know we went to school together? Probably not. Anyway, when I learned that bastard matchmaker ignored Mario's daughter and instead put forth Penelope as a viable candidate for Castor's bride only after he took a bride from you, things came together. I talked to Vi, she reconnected with Diego, and they realized they hadn't forgotten any of the old feelings they'd once had. He sighed. I made sure it was a love match this time. The last thing I wanted was to make the same mistake I'd almost made with my beloved son and heir. Wait, they're coming here. Your troops. Now? McCurdy asked. Yes. The king nodded. Well, technically, my troops as well as Mario's forces, he replied, sounding delighted. Violet and Diego are to be married on Sunday. And when we made dowry arrangements, I chose not to take any money or land. Instead, I accepted his gift of troops who will remain in Prosper Woods on a permanent retainer to the first house. They will, of course, take care of any of your scrawny, underfed, underpaid troops they find at the airport, and then come here to enjoy the biggest wedding Prosper Woods has ever seen. He looked utterly pleased with himself in an almost smug way. I didn't mind the smugness one bit, and couldn't stop grinning. McCurdy, on the other hand, looked as though his purple head was about to blow right off the top of his shoulders. I could swear there was steam coming out of his ears. You might think you're smart, King Howard's a day, but you're still outnumbered tonight. And when my wolves get finished tearing your household apart, none of you will be left standing, including your son or your daughter, McCurdy shouted. Are you stupid, McCurdy? Or has the wind in the outer Hebrides simply frozen what little brain you do possess? Castor asked, Are you really willing to admit to all these werewolves that you're planning on having the werewolf king and the royal family killed to advance yourself to the throne? Do you think all the wolves in the McCurdy clan will accept that? Or that Mario Fico and his Italian clan will accept that? Are you willing to fight his hair and hearty armed forces with your weak ones? Because that's what you're going to have to do. There is no way on God's green earth he'd let you stop what looks like a love match between Diego and Violet, and at the same time incur the wrath of the entire werewolf race for you, your pride, and... Your sad ambitions. We won't let that happen either, 
Greg said, stepping forward. He swept out an arm to the forest around them. My pack will stand with the king and his son. As will my vampires, Benson announced. He also nodded to the trees where several sets of glowing red eyes surrounded the inn and McCurdy's werewolves. In Prosper Woods, all supernatural creatures stand together. That goes for the shifters as well, Rome announced. Several townspeople stepped out of the woods, and in the blink of an eye, I was staring at everything from a giraffe to a lion, a tiger, a grizzly bear, a massive white stag, and several smaller animals, including at least fifty cottontail bunnies, who hopped around the feet of the others. It was like Noah's Ark scene right out of the Bible had just come to life, when a white standard poodle with a pink pompadour on top of her head and a neon pink gemstone collar walked into the clearing, I almost laughed. Rome had once explained that his receptionist, Precious, was a poodle shifter. And don't forget us, Lyra said, stepping out of the house with Hannibal's other guardian, Jacob, right beside her. He instantly shifted into a large black bear, which surprised me, but when Lyra walked to the bottom of the porch steps and shifted into a twenty-five-foot-tall dragon, I almost fainted. Its body was covered with iridescent black scales that looked sometimes purple, sometimes green, depending on the angle the moonlight glinted off them. The prehistoric thing bent over and breathed out a long line of fire, momentarily cutting off my line of sight from McCurdy and his wolves. I reached for Castor's hand, and he took it, turning to me with a smile on his face. He leaned down and kissed me. It's okay. Remember, that's Lyra. She won't hurt you. I nodded, too speechless for words. When the flames dissipated, I caught sight of McCurdy. All his werewolves were either seated or kowtowing toward Castor with their heads bowed in supplication. I chuckled. I think that means you and your werewolves are shit out of luck, McCurdy, Castor said. The old Scot said nothing, but I could tell by the way he was watching Morteza slowly backing up, he wasn't about to get any help from that quarter. Where are you going, you useless cur? He bellowed. For the first time, I noticed a mirror kneeling on the ground behind McCurdy with his head also bowed. I wanted to launch myself with the little traitor, but seeing how the big bad assassin planned on answering was interesting as hell. I kept a mirror in my peripheral vision as I turned back to watch Morteza. I'm leaving, of course, going back to Iran. I made a mistake in working with a clan leader so weak, the assassin said, as if everyone would just forget the fact that he'd just bet all his money on the wrong horse and killed Castor's guards while doing it. You're not going anywhere except to prison, the king ordered. You had rogue wolves attack my guards and kidnap my son-in-law, assassin. I watched Castor snap his fingers, and several of the guards standing on the porch with us rushed down to the grass and grabbed Morteza, taking hold of his arms before he could run away. I really hoped the king would throw the filthy assassin in jail for the rest of his days. A mere two. He killed a man under my roof, Castor said, pointing to the junior valet who'd risen to his feet. He was shaking and looking as white as a sheet as two of Castor's guards took him into custody. I watched them being led away and marveled at how amazing it was that King Howard Zaday had orchestrated all of this, even as ill as he was. I was so proud of him and grateful that he would soon be returned to health. Well, what say you, McCurdy? I should probably have you arrested for setting my poisoning in motion, along with the matchmaker beside you. But since my children have found happiness, I'm feeling magnanimous. I'll tell you what. I'm willing to give you one last chance. Are you ready to get back on that plane of yours along with your wolves? Will you go back to Scotland and make sure those wolves know who their king really is? Or do you wish to fight? The king asked. I'm happy to entertain either decision. McCurdy looked from him to Castor to me and sneered. You will not get away with this. Who's going to stop him? You, Castor asked. He looked to the guards and snapped his fingers. Arrest them. Nine, nine, fine. I'll do as you say. 
and go back home to Scotland, McCurdy said. Good, then get your fat arse off my land, the king said. I had to stifle a laugh as I watched McCurdy's nostrils flare in rage. He spun around, looking at the matchmaker beside him. Come on, he bellowed, shouting in matchmaker Arliss's shriveled prune of a face. The man looked like he had just sucked down several dozen lemons, and I couldn't help finding the entire outcome of today's happenings delightful. I watched Arliss hobble after McCurdy and the rest of his downtrodden wolves, looking like just kicked puppies. In a matter of moments, the front yard, parking lot, and driveway were empty. When I checked the tree line, I saw no glowing vampire or werewolf eyes. And when I turned back, the dragon and bear were gone, replaced by a small dark woman with long braids and the bearded lumberjack facade of Jacob. Oliver and Hannibal came rushing out of the house, whooping at the top of their lungs. And I turned to the king, grinning as Castor bent down to hug his son. Hannibal was being hugged in turns by first Rome, then Vincent, and everyone exchanged handshakes. I couldn't believe how this had all turned out. A war won almost without spilling a drop of anyone's precious blood. I imagine there's some hungry folks out here, Mrs. Douglas called out, standing on the porch. She wore her toque and apron and was holding a stirring spoon. Well, come on then. I turned to Castor and grinned when I saw him hugging his father and Violet. She let go of her brother and walked over to me. I threw my arms around her, hugging her tightly. When she finally turned me loose, she was smiling, and I was once again struck by just how beautiful the woman was. So someone has some explaining to do, I said with a laugh. I can't wait for you to meet him, she said, squeezing both of my hands. Diego, huh? So tell me, is he very sexy? She shrugged. Of course he is, my darling. He's a tall, dark, and handsome Italian. And best of all, he cooks. I hooked my elbow in hers and steered her toward the house, along with quite a sizable entourage of people. I wondered how on earth we'd all find a place to eat at the table. When Mrs. Douglas pointed to the double French doors leading out to the back of the property— I was surprised to find someone had set up rows and rows of long benches and laid out platters of food. The trees above the benches were strewn with fairy lights, and several children ran around them in circles with Hannibal and Oliver in the lead. Music played from a hidden sound system, but most of all, the glow on my mate's face as he caught my eye was the happiest I'd ever seen him. That was everything. Epilogue Prosper Woods Chronicle All the Advice Fit to Print Dear Krabby, I need your advice. I have eight children, and as much as I love them, I can't get them to settle down in the house. They run up and down, and every time they pound down the hardwood of our hallways, the pictures go all crooked on the walls. Sometimes they even fall off. I'm honestly thinking about taking them down altogether, but I like the way my house looks. I just have unruly children. What do you suggest? Signed, Sick of Cleaning Up After Them. Dear Sick of Cleaning Up After Them, I'm sorry your eight children are so thoughtless, but then again the question goes back to why on earth you had all of them in the first place? Surely you had a TV or some knitting, but... Who is crabby to judge? As far as your pictures go, I might just have a solution for you. First of all, I suggest removing them from the walls and setting them on a table or something. I mean, they must get heavy, especially when they're full of iced tea. If you don't want to remove them entirely, then I suggest putting them on top of the kids' heads and making them stand there so you can look at them. That way the little buggers have to stand still, and your hallways always look nice. Two birds, one stone, I always say. I am brilliant. Respectfully, Crabby. Castor. Sunday was upon us before I knew it, as Violet stood in the forest under the full moon taking her vows with Diego Fico. I couldn't take my eyes off Emery. He was dressed in his finery, and so beautiful he simply took my breath away. 
We'd gone to Stockton the day before, and had matching suits specially tailored for the occasion, as well as picking up a wedding present for my beautiful bride and her new husband. Emery looked radiant as he watched the sister we both loved and the way she beamed with happiness. She should be happy. She was getting a very good man. I'd liked Diego the moment I met him, only after shaking his hand, remembering meeting him many years before. As a member of the nobility, he'd frequented court, and he'd stood out because he wasn't one of the multiple rogues vying for Violet's attention at the time. Instead, he'd stood off to the side of the room with a couple of mates, having a quiet conversation and laughing. I remembered wondering if he was gay, because the light in his eyes and the way he smiled automatically whenever someone leaned near was engaging, and something I knew I wanted in my life. Unfortunately, Teo had managed to occupy all my time back then. I shuddered to think of it. Violet had chosen to wear our mother's wedding dress, which flowed from her neck to the earth in soft layers of lace. Her thick black braids had been woven with white satin ribbons, and piled on top of her head where a wreath of tiny pink and white roses ringed her waves. She was a breathtaking bride, blushing with the freshness of youth, which I hadn't seen on her in a very long time. Happiness radiated out of her every pore, and I was delighted she'd found love with such a good, good man. When the vows were said, we feasted. It turned out that Violet and Mrs. Douglas had been planning this party for quite some time. I was ashamed to admit that once Penelope had accepted my suit, Violet became caught up in planning the perfect wedding for me. I hadn't once thought about her happiness, or the very real fact that all the while she was making plans for me, she'd been sacrificing her own life. When Emery and I were first married, and got busy with plans to build our own lives together, I'd let Violet take care of my ailing father, not giving a thought to her happiness, but just relieved that someone who loved him was by his side. I'd failed them both miserably, and promised myself that I'd make up for my failures, even if he took the rest of my life. Emery was laughing at something Diego's younger brother Leonardo said when there was a noise at the back door. I looked over at Clyde. He'd been reinstated in a lesser position on probation, as had Nima. So far they both seemed repentant for their poor judgment in their duties, but it seemed that McCurdy had gone to great lengths as well to create very passable credentials for his spies. But it was the small woman dressed in traveling clothes who held my attention. She carried a well-worn suitcase and wore a floppy brown hat on her head. When she turned and saw the direction Clyde was offering to lead her, I immediately knew who she was. The bright eyes, which had once been amber in color, just like Emery's, were now clouded with cataracts. I turned and elbowed Emery, who stopped talking and twisted to look at me. She's here, I said, smiling at him. Emery looked at me with the tiniest bit of confusion, and then his big amber eyes went almost comically wide. He shot out of his chair and instantly darted around me, starting to run, but then turned and ran back, grabbing my hand and yanking me out of the white folding chair. I laughed as he literally dragged me across the yard to meet Clyde and the small woman clinging to my bodyguard's arm. Mama, Emery said, bending to her as she smiled and reached for him. He swept her small frame into his arms and hugged her. I noticed she looked frail, without any meat on her bones. Clearly she wasn't one of the well-fed aristocracy I'd seen prowling the castle grounds back home, but then again, I knew Emery's humble beginnings. This small woman had managed to raise her only child by herself, toiling at sewing clothes and later cleaning houses for people in my class. She'd had a hard life, but I'd promised my beloved that she would live the rest of her life in luxury. Because we'd thought we'd had an impending war coming, Emery had wanted her to be safe— and in Tabriz, we'd had the means to provide that security in her own home. But now that was over, and as soon as I knew she'd be coming, I'd arranged an appointment with Doc Baker for him to evaluate her for cataract surgery, and whatever other treatment he deemed appropriate for her eyes. He'd have the right connections for an ophthalmologist who worked on werewolves. I wanted only the best medical treatment for my family. Emery's mother was now part of that. The work on her small cottage at the back of our property was done, 
I'd overseen the construction myself, from the foundation up to the roof, installing every creature comfort I could think of, including a large tub with six jets, and a stove with six burners. The ceilings in the living room were high, the roof held up by polished beams, and though I'd left the walls white so she could add her own colors, I'd furnished the place with luxurious antiques bought from Vincent's store in town. Her shelves were filled with books, the 1950s console stereo stocked with vinyl albums, and everything was done in neutral colors so she could add her own pops of color. A knitted throw blanket here, a hand-knotted Persian rug there, and I knew she'd make this place a home where Emery and I could come and visit for many afternoon teas in the future. He said she loved to cook, so I planned on introducing her to Mrs. Douglas and adding some of Emery's favorite recipes to our kitchen— most importantly in all of this, I made a promise to myself to never again neglect those I loved. Emory, his mother said when he finally turned her loose. I watched her hold him out to arm's length and examine him, looking him up and down from head to toe and assessing something about the boy she'd given birth to as only a mother could. When she finally returned her gaze to his smiling face, she grinned at him. I was stunned by how lovely she looked— and how much she resembled my mate. You're just beaming with happiness, and that means absolutely everything to me, son. She let out a little sob, and Emery grabbed her hands. Mama, I want you to meet my love. His eyes darted to me before looking back at her. This is my caster. She turned and then dropped her gaze as she began to sink into a curtsy. Highness... She said on a quiet hiss. I bent and caught her narrow shoulders, tugging her gently back up until she stood straight, looking up at me. It's nice to meet you. I feel like we know each other and we're family now. There is no need for formalities. I leaned down and bust her cheek. The skin there was so soft, paper thin, and smelling of a clean soap and rose water I remembered as a common perfume used back home. As a child, I looked forward to visiting the small villages around the larger city of Tabriz. Those villages sold the rosewater perfume by the case at fairs, though it rarely showed up in shops, since every local village lady made it at home and had their own supplies. The fragrance wasn't coveted by the nobility, because it was much too common among the small brown wolves who made up the lower and servant classes. In my werewolf kingdom, things would change. I planned that my mating with Emery be used as a genesis of that change. When I straightened, she took my hands, letting her gaze roam my features, as she had with Emery. I'm so happy. I still can't believe my boy was lucky enough to find his fated one. What a miracle you are, Prince. Uh, Caster. She giggled, and I smiled. Sorry, that's going to take me a few minutes to get used to. Come, Mama. Have a seat and meet the rest of the family, Emery said, holding out his own chair for her. He settled into mine at my insistence while I called for another chair. She smiled and sat down as a maid cleared Emery's plate and put another of meat and potatoes in front of her. Yet another servant poured her a goblet of wine, and I introduced her to Violet and Diego. When my father walked over, leaning on his cane but not as heavily as before, she rose and bowed deeply to him. He took her hands and kissed her cheek as I'd done, welcoming her to our family. Emery simply beamed every time he looked at her. When he turned his gaze to me, I saw the glisten of tears that made my heart as full as it had ever been. I'd managed to make my mate happy, and that itself was the most important thing that happened all night. At midnight, we all shifted and ran in the woods— though Emery's mother begged off, saying that she needed to recover from her long flight to America. Besides, after seeing the cabin we'd built for her and handing her the keys, she said she was just too overwhelmed to do anything but make herself some nice warm milk and curl up with a book in her new living room, listening to the howl of the wolves, whom she now counted as family. Every full moon since coming to Prosper Woods, Emery had run with me. I felt so blessed that we'd met and fallen in love right here in God's country, convinced that Mother Nature had designed all this beauty, down to the last branch of the ancient sequoias just for us. When we completed our run near the waterfall, which was almost always where Emery and I ended up, 
we shifted, and I lay him down on a bed of soft sand. I made love to him, surrounded by beauty, the sound of the falls, the near silent swish of fish in the pond, and the heavy breathing of my mate when he came, his clock trapped between us, calling out my name. I love you, Emery, I said, brushing a glistening lock of hair away from his amber eyes. I lay on top of him, framing his face with both hands as I stared down at him, letting my gaze roam over his features so that I could drink him all in. He was absolutely the most beautiful creature I'd ever seen in my life. You take my breath away, Emery said, smiling up at me as he clung to my back with both arms and legs. I was still buried inside him, locked up with the knot, as it always happened, and my climax continued to spurt into him as I panted through it. Do you know I thank God every day for bringing us together? His face was too innocent and the question too honest to make fun of. I shook my head, leaning down to kiss the tip of his nose, and then groan as my climax continued. No, you do that. I do, Emery said emphatically. Every day, I thank God for bringing me the world's most beautiful wolf. I never dreamed I could be this happy caster. I leaned down and kissed him long and hard, letting my love for him pour out into the kiss, hopefully also pour over his soul. I wanted him to feel what I was feeling, to love the way I loved, because no one on earth could ever be this happy. Me too, baby. I kissed him again. Me too. This has been Curse of the Flower Moon. Prosper Woods Wolves, Book Two. Written by Patricia Logan. Narrated by John Solo. Copyright 2022 by Patricia Logan. Production copyright by Patricia Logan. Ta da! Audible hopes you have enjoyed this program.